Tantor Audio, a division of recorded books, presents Aspire to Die, an Oxford Murder Mystery, by M. S. Morris. Narrated by Esther Wayne. 1. Lust and ambition are the driving forces of tragedy. Discuss. Sophie Hinton tossed and turned in her narrow college bed. It was hard to sleep when your dreams were filled with bloody daggers and lustful desires. She'd been up until gone midnight finishing her essay for today's tutorial. Lust, ambition, tragedy. A heady mix. Turned out Shakespeare thought so too. She had filled twenty closely typed pages with references to the Bard's plays, where lust or ambition drove the action. She hoped she'd finally managed to nail down all the pertinent points— but as she turned out her bedside light in the early hours, she was suddenly overwhelmed by doubts. No wonder she'd had such troubled dreams. Now it was too late for sleep. Bright sunlight streamed through the thin curtains of the room, reaching warm fingers across the wooden floor. She slid out of bed, rubbing her tired eyes, and stumbled into the shower. Lust and Ambition Sophie didn't consider herself to be particularly lustful or ambitious. Timid, shy, and anxious were words she would use to describe herself, and her weekly tutorial, where she would be required to read her essay aloud in front of her tutor, Dr. Claiborne, was almost designed to induce terror in someone like her. She really would like to show her essay to someone first, and there was only one person she trusted to give her an honest opinion. Zara Hamilton before coming to Oxford, Sophie would never have imagined befriending someone like Zara. Zara was everything that Sophie wasn't. Rich, privately educated, beautiful, and confident. Yet they had formed a firm bond of friendship since starting at the university and finding themselves paired as tutorial partners. It was easy to be friends with Zara. She held no prejudices and had a ready smile for everyone. She was very different to her twin brother, Zach also at Christchurch College. Zack shared Zara's good looks, but mixed only with those he considered to be his social equals, which didn't include Sophie. Zack Hamilton was certainly a man driven by ambition. Sophie turned off the shower and rubbed herself vigorously with the towel. It was just after nine o'clock. That gave her almost three hours before the tutorial began, and conveniently Dr. Claiborne's room was on the same staircase as Zara's. She finished getting herself ready, scooped up her laptop, and sped off down the stairs. One of the college scouts, Val, was mopping the floor at the foot of Sophie's staircase in the meadow building. She looked up from her work as Sophie descended the stairs. Morning, she said cheerfully. Lovely day. Lovely, agreed Sophie, tiptoeing over the damp floor. Scout was one of those peculiar Oxford words that didn't seem to have the same meaning as it did elsewhere. At school, Sophie had understood it to mean a person sent ahead to carry out reconnaissance. Here, it meant cleaner. "'But I'm already behind my normal schedule,' complained Val. "'I've been clearing up the mess in the Dean's lodgings after the drinks party last night.' She rolled her eyes in an exaggerated way. "'Sue in the kitchen said she spent most of the day preparing trays of fancy canapes. "'I asked my husband what it was for, but he didn't know.' Val's husband was Jim Turner the head porter of the college. They were both near retirement. Sue in the kitchen was presumably one of Val's many spies operating within the college underbelly. Sophie had a sudden vision of Val as spymaster, controlling a vast network of informers threaded throughout the college, cleaning staircases, working in kitchens, eavesdropping eagerly outside closed doors. Each one glimpsed a worm's-eye view of great events— Perhaps the woman really was a scout in both senses of the word. Lust, ambition, and tragedy. Val must be privy to them all. She showed no inclination to keep her hard-won secrets to herself. Whatever it was, the drink certainly flowed freely, judging by the number of empty bottles and used glasses. She lowered her voice confidentially. I don't care much for this new dean, you know. Not that he's all that new, but when you've been around for as long as I have— I feel entitled to call him new. I've seen a few deans in my time. 
and this one reminds me of a politician. Too ambitious by half. Not like the old Dean. He was a proper gentleman. Val would talk all day long if you let her. Sophie nodded politely and made her exit. She knew secrets too, but unlike Val, she kept them close. She slowed her pace as she made her way across the great quadrangle. Tom Quad, to give it its popular name. The sixteenth-century sandstone walls gleamed golden in the morning sun. In the central pond, surrounded by water lilies, the statue of Mercury, god of financial gain and messages, balanced on one foot atop his pedestal, and on the west side, the great clock tower known affectionately as Tom Tower soared skywards. Eight muscular rowers and their skinny cocks were gathering in the lodge beneath the clock tower, all clad in matching one-piece lycra rowing suits. It was the men's first team. The tallest of the rowers was Zara's boyfriend, Adam Brady. Adam was a man filled with both lust and ambition. Sophie studied him closely. If she allowed her imagination to roam freely, she could easily feel a stirring of lust herself. Adam seemed to be staring back at her, his eyes shadowed beneath unruly black hair, his powerful arms flexing in preparation for the run to the boathouse. His gaze held hers for a moment, but she pulled away and pressed on, continuing her path across the quad to Zara's staircase. She pushed open the heavy oak door and stepped inside. The thick stone walls offered shelter from the sun which was already getting hot, and it took a second or two for her eyes to adjust to the dark after the brightness outside. Two doors opened onto the ground floor, her tutor's room and a seminar room that was being redecorated. She crept quietly past them and up the stairs. Dr. Claiborne probably wasn't around yet, but she had no desire to bump into him before the tutorial began. She went up to the first floor landing. There were two more rooms on this floor. The first was Megan's, a girl who was studying classics. Megan wouldn't be in her room this early in the morning. She'd be in bed, no doubt, but not her own. Megan was no stranger to lust. Sophie turned instead to the other entrance, the door to Zara's room. She knocked quietly, and when there was no response, knocked again louder. The room beyond stayed silent. She took hold of the brass doorknob and twisted it cautiously clockwise. It turned, and with a gentle push the door opened. Sophie peered inside. The room beyond was dim, the curtains drawn tightly shut. But even in the semi-darkness, Sophie knew that something terrible had happened. Sprawled on the floor was Zara Hamilton. Her arms and legs splayed out, unmoving. Beautiful, kind, intelligent Zara. Her head was twisted to one side, and her blue eyes stared lifelessly, her mouth hanging open. Her long, angelic hair was sticky with blood which had pooled across the carpet in a crimson stain. Sophie put her hand on the doorframe to steady herself. But all she could feel was the thudding of her heart. She approached the body cautiously, careful not to step in any blood, nor to touch any surface. She knelt down and laid two fingers on Zara's neck. She counted to thirty there was no pulse. She'd known there wouldn't be. Lust and ambition. Which was to blame for Zara's tragedy? Sophie shook her head, letting tears fall. Two. The romantic strains of Verdi's La Traviata thundered from the kitchen sound system, threatening to overwhelm the little house with pathos and drama, Detective Inspector Bridget Hart was enjoying a rare day off work, and she intended to make the most of it. First, she was going to bake a cake for her daughter Chloe's fifteenth birthday. Then she was going to go swimming. She'd worked so hard for her recent promotion to D.I. that her exercise routine had fallen by the wayside, and her work trousers were becoming ever more snug. This was, in fact, the first day of annual leave allowance that Bridget had succeeded in taking since the start of the year. This evening, when Chloe got home from school, she planned to take her out to a nice little Italian restaurant in North Oxford. Just the two of them, mother and daughter. 
It would be a real treat. And if she managed forty lengths at the pool and didn't eat too much during the day, she'd allow herself a bowl of her favourite tagliatelle with truffle cream sauce. A glass of red wine would be the perfect accompaniment. Two glasses, perhaps. Or even three. Who was counting? In a moment of Italian abandon, she joined in with one of Violetta's arias for a few bars, not caring what she sounded like. She rummaged in the kitchen cupboard, foraging for ingredients. The last cake she'd baked was for Chloe's fourteenth birthday last year. Baking, like exercise, was a great invention, but who realistically found time for it? She checked the use-by dates. The flour was a few months out of date, but it looked fine and passed the sniff test. She studied the packet of icing sugar and nearly died when she saw how many calories it contained. Still, it was just once a year, and Chloe and her friends would no doubt eat most of it. She was studying the recipe on her phone, and debating whether she could get away with milk chocolate as a topping, or if she needed to go to the shop and buy some dark chocolate, as the recipe stipulated, when the phone began to ring. Chief Superintendent Alex Grayson's name flashed up on the screen. No way. Didn't he know she'd taken the day off? She ignored it. The phone rang again. Could she safely let it go to voicemail? Grayson wasn't a man who enjoyed leaving messages. He preferred to give orders, directly, and have them obeyed. She let it ring twice more, then turned down the volume on the opera and picked up. Hello? The chief super always got straight to the point. D.I. Hart. Suspicious death reported this morning at one of the Oxford colleges. Christchurch. Student. Female. Uniform are on their way to secure the scene. I need a detective to head up the investigation. Bridget grimaced. Since finally being promoted to Detective Inspector, she'd been itching to take on a case suitable for her new rank. This was surely it. But it had come on the worst possible day. Her daughter's birthday. She saw precious little of Chloe as it was, and she hadn't taken a single day off in six months. Refusing the chief super was going to be difficult, but she took a deep breath and said, "'Actually, sir, I'm taking a day of annual leave today.' I was just about to go out. Afraid it can't be helped, said Grayson. There's no one else. I already called Davis, but he's about to make a breakthrough with the drugs case in Blackbird Lees. And Baxter's dealing with the stabbing at the train station. You're the only one left. Great. She was his third choice. The chief super was only calling her because there was no one else. And if she refused to take this case, she would drop even lower in his estimation. Her recent promotion had been a long time coming, and she was under pressure to prove that it had been justified. She had never been one of the boys. She was conscious of being the shortest D.I. in the team. Although the height requirement for joining the force had long since been removed, old attitudes took time to die. Much like Superintendent Grayson himself, who had been in the job as long as Bridget could remember. She didn't participate in the beer-swilling and adolescent joke-telling that constituted police social rituals. She didn't do drinks after work except on rare occasions, and she'd always resisted working overtime as much as possible. And the reason for all that had been simple. Chloe. Being a single parent with a young daughter to get home to had held her back professionally. But now Chloe was older, and this was her chance to finally progress her career. All right, no problem, she heard herself saying. I'll be over there right away. Keep me informed. Yes, sir. But Grayson had already ended the call. With a sigh, Bridget returned the calorie-laden baking ingredients to the cupboard. Perhaps they were safer kept in there, especially since it didn't look like she'd be getting that much-needed exercise after all. She went upstairs and changed out of her jeans into smart black trousers, pulling in her stomach as she hauled up the zip. She picked a cream blouse and a grey jacket, which she hoped had a slimming effect, although obviously not as effective as actually doing some exercise. She'd planned to wash her hair at the pool, after her swim. The just-got-out-of-bed look didn't suit her at all, but there was no time to wash it properly now. She wet her comb under the tap and ran it through her short, dark bob, in a futile effort to get both sides to lie flat. A dab of foundation and a smear of nude lipstick. She had the quickest makeup routine in Oxfordshire, 
and she was ready to go. Her red BMW Mini Convertible was parked outside the house, in front of Wolvercut Village Green. Tucked just inside the northwestern corner of the Oxford Ring Road, Wolvercott was a small community with a couple of pubs, a church, and a family-run corner shop. Bridget owned one of the small terraced cottages in the heart of the village, just big enough for herself and Chloe. Tiny, in other words. Two young mothers were pushing their children on the swings by the green, the little boy and girl screaming with delight and chattering animatedly. For Bridget, those early days with her own daughter were a distant memory. When Chloe was younger, they used to take a picnic to Port Meadow alongside the River Thames, or explore the ruins of nearby Godstow Abbey. But now Chloe was older, she preferred to spend all her time with her friends. She hardly told Bridget anything. Bridget didn't even know if Chloe had a boyfriend, and her carefully laid plans to make today special for her daughter's birthday had just been shot down in flames by the chief super. The working mother could never win. She climbed into the car and tossed her bag onto the passenger seat. The little car, with its iconic design and twin-powered turbo engines, was one of her few indulgences. A treat for herself on her thirty-fifth birthday, three years ago. Even Chloe thought it was cool, which was saying something. Bridget loved the car. She liked to think it reflected herself. Sensible and compact, but spirited, with a keen sense of fun. She turned on the ignition, and the engine thrummed into life. Chloe had already hinted that the Mini would be the perfect car to learn to drive in, but Bridget didn't want to think about that. She'd seen more than enough fatal crashes in her time with the police, too many of them involving young people on the brink of adulthood. But she'd seen worse, too. Far worse. And not only since becoming a police officer. Darker fears than traffic accidents haunted Bridget's dreams, no matter how well she was able to suppress them during daylight hours. She pushed her concerns away. She needed to focus on the task ahead. From what the chief super had told her, a young woman had lost her life today, and that woman's family would be depending on Bridget to find answers. The full weight of the responsibility removed any lingering thoughts of birthdays, cakes and dress sizes from her mind. She pulled away from the village green, crossing the bridge over Wolvercote Mill Stream before picking up the Woodstock Road that would take her into the heart of Oxford. Driving from North Oxford to Christchurch, just south of the centre, was not as easy as it should have been. Despite Oxford's main roads having a simple medieval layout, four roads leading north, south, east and west, intersecting at Carfax, the City Council had imposed a one-way system that made the journey twice as long as it needed to be. Bridget tried to stay calm as she navigated the route, silently cursing modern traffic congestion, all the time keeping an eye out for the dozens of cyclists who thronged the narrow streets, not to mention the foreign tourists, many of whom seemed surprised to discover that cars drove on the left in Britain. The rich operatic melodies of Mozart's Così fan tutte soared through the car's speakers, helping to soothe her journey, and on arrival she was pleased to note that she'd only had to honk her horn once. An ambulance and two marked police cars were parked outside the main entrance to the college on St. Aldate's, causing havoc with the double-decker buses that clogged the road in both directions. Bridget pulled up behind one of the police cars on double yellow lines. A traffic warden appeared in her side-view mirror and began to issue her with a ticket, but she rummaged in her bag and pulled out a permit that stopped the warden in his tracks. She slung the bag over her shoulder and hurried through the arched entranceway beneath the clock tower. Detective Sergeant Jake Derwent stood guard over the crime scene, his hands clasped behind his back, doing his best to look stern and intimidating in the heat of the sun. Being six foot five in his police boots helped with that. He wasn't really standing guard, however. He had a uniformed constable doing that job for him. Jake was simply standing beside him, working out his next move. It was the first time for him to be in charge of a serious crime scene, and he couldn't afford to mess up. He nodded at the constable and scratched his nose. He had strung up his crime tape to keep interlopers at bay. The student who discovered the body was safe in the care of a female constable, and had been given a hot cup of tea. The Socco team, the scene of crime officers, were already upstairs in the dead girl's room. The senior investigating officer was on her way. 
he ran checklists through his head, mentally ticking off each item. He still couldn't quite understand what he was doing assigned to a murder team. It wasn't a job he would ever have chosen. And yet somehow he had. He'd been under a lot of stress since his girlfriend walked out on him. Or had he walked out on her? He wasn't certain. It had all happened too quickly and too suddenly for him to process. The past couple of months had been a bit of a blur. But he was coping better now. The move to Oxford and the promotion to sergeant had given him something to focus on. He was starting to forget the hurt, and to put that part of his life behind him. At least he no longer saw her face every time he inspected a corpse. What would his friends from up north in Leeds say if they could see him now? According to them, the south of England was posh. The whole of the south. That was forty million people. His friends had no idea what they were talking about. Even Oxford wasn't half as posh as he'd expected. There was a large working-class population here, with deprivation and poverty on the fringes, and a significant number of homeless people and beggars in the centre. The city had never completely recovered from the closure of the old pressed steel plant in Cowley. And yet here he was, guarding a stone staircase that had apparently been built by Cardinal Wolsey in the reign of Henry VIII. In front of him stood a quadrangle of buildings resembling a scene from one of those period costume dramas his mother liked. The green squares of lawn around the fountain looked like they'd been clipped with nail scissors. The porter who greeted him on his arrival had been wearing a bowler hat. A bowler hat! Wake up, mate. It's the twenty-first century, Jake had wanted to tell him. The porter had gone now, and Jake waited patiently for the SIO to arrive, hoping he'd not forgotten to do something vital. Secure the scene. That was the most important task. The one thing he mustn't fail to do. Move along, please. Nothing to see here, he told the students billowing around the perimeter of the taped-off area. He didn't know where the words had come from. They didn't sound like his own. They weren't even true. They were a bare-faced lie. There was plenty to see, and that was precisely why he was here. Yet the words had the desired effect slowly starting to disperse the curious crowds. He was impressed by his own effectiveness, the voice of authority. He was a real policeman now, it seemed, or at least he'd fooled these students into believing it. If he carried on like this, he might even fool himself. Bridget was met at the porter's lodge by a man whose lined face was sad and drawn. He offered her his hand. Jim Turner, ma'am. Head porter of the college. I was told to expect you. His silvery grey hair was combed neatly in a side parting, but his bushy eyebrows seemed to have a will of their own, and arched upwards, reaching for the sky. Bridget was reminded uncomfortably of her own hastily tamed hair, that so often seemed to mimic her daughter's rebellious nature. Detective Inspector Bridget Hart, she said, shaking his hand. She was struck by the man's quiet dignity. He spoke with a soft country accent, marking him out as one of the Oxford locals. He'd probably devoted his working life to the college. Calm and capable, he was just what she needed. He clasped his hands behind his back. If you'd like to follow me. Bridget was no stranger to the many colleges that made up the university, and she had visited Christchurch on several occasions. Not only was it Oxford's largest and grandest college, it also housed the city's cathedral. It was hard not to be impressed by its architectural magnificence. Bridget herself had been an undergraduate at the more modestly proportioned Merton College. She preferred the smaller colleges with their more intimate quadrangles, perfect for enjoying a glass of pims after a summer concert or an alfresco performance of Shakespeare. The vast number of tourists who visited Christchurch each year, voting with their feet, and their money, clearly didn't share her opinion, however. They entered Tom Quad and turned left towards the staircases on the north side of the quadrangle. Today the architectural symmetry was rather spoiled by the crime scene tape surrounding the doorway to one of the staircases. A group of students had gathered on the opposite side of the quad, watching as the drama unfolded. It was one of the students who found her, the porter was saying. Poor girl. She was shaken up something dreadful. I can imagine. I've worked here all my life, 
You see a few things working in a place like this, but you don't expect to come across something like that. They stopped a short distance from the cordoned off area. If you need anything, I'll be in the lodge. She watched him walk, head bowed, back to the lodge, then turned to meet the young sergeant who was striding towards her. He was tall. Well, most people were compared with Bridget. She was used to that. He looked to be about late twenties, no more. His keen face was splashed with freckles and framed by ginger hair and a thick beard that reached up to his ears. He stepped easily over the crime scene tape with his long, gangling legs and held out his hand. Detective Sergeant Jake Derwent, ma'am. She noted his northern accent and wondered where he was from. She'd seen him around the office a few times but hadn't worked with him before. D.I. Bridget Hart. They shook hands. You're new to Oxford, dear Sterwent? Been here six months, ma'am. Where were you before? Leeds, West Yorkshire. He had a firm grip and answered straightforward questions with straightforward answers. Bridget had a feeling they'd get on well together. So, what have we got? Jake took a notebook out of his breast pocket. His handwriting was a spidery scrawl, but he seemed to have no problem deciphering it. A suspicious death, almost certainly a violent one. I spoke to the officer who was first on the scene when the alarm was raised. He spoke to the girl who found the body. Her name is Sophie. The dead girl is Zara Hamilton, second-year English student. She has a twin brother in the college called Zack, and according to Sophie, her boyfriend is a guy called Adam Brady. Anyone spoken to Adam yet? Jake shook his head. Sophie says she saw him about to run down to the boathouse this morning with the other rowers. They're not back yet. Okay. Well, we know where to find him if we need him. What about the parents? Have they been informed? Some officers from the Met have gone to their London home. Their London home? Does that mean they have more than one? The porter said something about a country house near Oxford, in the Cotswolds. Bridget raised her eyebrows. A home in London and a country house in the Cotswolds? She was starting to form an impression of the sort of people she was dealing with here. And where are we with the scene of crime officers? They're upstairs now, going through everything. The photographer's taken pictures. Good, then maybe we can... Their conversation was interrupted by the arrival of a man in a sharply cut suit striding across the quadrangle towards them. He had a proprietorial air, as if the college belonged to him. The new arrival looked to be in his late fifties or early sixties. His thick hair was surely too dark to be natural. Who's in charge of all this? He indicated the cordoned-off area with a wave of his hand, as if he found the matter rather distasteful. Business. He was looking at Jake, clearly making the assumption that it must be the man running the show, even though Jake was ten years Bridget's junior. It was no more than she had come to expect. She stepped forwards, making herself as tall as her five-foot two-inch frame would allow, and held out her hand. Detective Inspector Bridget Hart. She waited for the man to introduce himself. He glanced down at her, momentarily nonplussed, then accepted her hand. Dr. Francis Reed. I'm the Dean of Christchurch. That would explain the sense of ownership he exuded. Some colleges had a principal, some had a warden, some had a master, but Christchurch had a dean. It was something to do with Christchurch's special status as both a college and the cathedral. Basically, this was the man in charge and the person she would have to deal with if this turned, as she anticipated it would, into a murder investigation. My sergeant has just been filling me in on the details. The dean drew her to one side and spoke very precisely, as if communicating with a child. You must understand. This case needs to be handled with the utmost discretion. We can't possibly have the police here for longer than is absolutely necessary, and I must insist that you keep the story out of the press. He glanced in Jake's direction as if he suspected him of already selling the story to the highest bidder. The bad publicity would be disastrous for the college's reputation. I take it you know who you're dealing with here? I believe the dead girl is called Zara Hamilton. Quite, 
She's the eldest daughter of Sir Richard Hamilton. Bridget wondered for a moment who he meant. Then she remembered the media tycoon who owned the television and film companies. No wonder they had a townhouse and a country pile. He probably owned properties abroad as well. Keeping this out of the press was going to be tricky, even if she decided that she wanted to. How quickly do you think you can clear away all this tape? asked the dean. We would normally have opened the college to tourists hours ago. Visits are a major source of income for the college, and summer is our peak time for visitors. More people come to Christchurch than any other Oxford college, you know. Of course, they mostly just want to see the dining hall, since it was used in the Harry Potter films. Although, personally, I think the cathedral and art gallery are of more interest. Bridget was rapidly losing patience with this man, who seemed to find the police presence nothing more than an inconvenience. She drew herself up so that she was level with his chin. Dr. Reed, a student has died in one of your college rooms. Therefore, the splendours of Hogwarts notwithstanding, I must ask that you keep the college closed to visitors for the rest of the day, and for the foreseeable future, at least until we have completed our initial investigations. The look of surprise on the dean's face suggested that she'd make a good match for Professor Severus Snape when it came to delivering a snarky riposte. Dr. Reed blinked, then quickly recovered himself. Well, yes, of course I do understand that. So, if you'll excuse me, the sooner I can get on with my job, the sooner all this tape can be cleared away. But until then, I must ask that you allow my team unhindered access to the college, the students, and anyone else we need to speak to. The dean was momentarily lost for words. And, continued Bridget, I understand that the dead girl has a twin brother in the college. Has he been informed yet? A shadow passed across the dean's face. A twin brother, yes. I doubt Zachary is up yet. He's not known to rise before lunchtime. Bridget glanced at her watch. It was ten minutes before noon. In that case, I'll go to the victim's room now with my colleague, and then I would like to talk to Zachary straight afterwards. I'll speak to the porter and make sure there's someone to take you to him. Thank you. Things were starting to go a little more smoothly with the dean. She watched as he took his leave and headed off towards the porter's lodge. Well done, ma'am, said Jake, coming up behind her. He needed a bit of firm handling. Most men do, said Bridget. Come on, let's go upstairs. 3. Bridget donned protective clothing and stepped somewhat inelegantly over the crime scene tape, followed by Jake. The group of students gathered on the opposite side of the quad was steadily growing in number. She would have liked to restrict access to the whole quadrangle, but it was such a large area, cordoning it off would be almost impossible. As well as functioning as the main entrance to the college, Tom Quad also provided access to the dining hall, the one of Harry Potter fame, and to the cathedral. She smiled at the young uniformed police constable standing guard outside the door to the staircase as he moved aside to let her pass. Having been a student at Oxford, Bridget was familiar with the layout of these types of college buildings. A series of doors around the quadrangle, each leading to a staircase from which rooms were accessed. The staircases were usually numbered, often with a Roman numeral etched into the stone above the doorway. On each floor there were normally two rooms facing each other. This staircase looked to be no exception. By Bridget's reckoning, the cordoned-off doorway should give access to four rooms in total, two on the ground floor and two upstairs. On entering, she immediately felt the slight chill that always came from old stone buildings, even in the height of summer. On the ground floor was a seminar room on the left side and a tutor's room on the right. The door to the seminar room stood ajar, and from the strong smell of paint and the various ladders, dust sheets and paint tins, it was clear that this room was currently being redecorated. She sniffed again. The paint was masking another smell. Vomit? She peered around the door and saw that someone had been sick over the newly painted wall. The decorators were not going to be happy. The door opposite bore a brass plaque with the name Dr. Anthony Claiborne engraved on it. Any sign of Dr. Claiborne this morning? 
she asked. None, ma'am. We did knock. Most probably the room was only used during the day for tutorials. Their footsteps echoed on the hard, bare steps as they climbed the stairs. The plain walls were painted to a dull shade of magnolia. For all their external grandeur, there was a certain asceticism to these colleges, originally built for the education of the clergy, in days when people were concerned more about their souls in the afterlife than about their physical comforts in this life. Upstairs, two doors faced each other. Zara's door stood wide open, and the room beyond was a hive of activity, as the scene of crime officers went about their jobs. Bridget recognised the head of the soccer team, Vikram, from previous cases she'd worked on when she was still a detective sergeant like Jake was now. She had always found his calm, professional manner reassuring, and was glad to see him. He nodded at her to acknowledge her arrival. The door opposite, like Dr. Claiborne's on the ground floor, was closed. Do we know whose room this is? asked Bridget. I got a name from Sophie, said Jake, pulling out his notebook. He flipped efficiently through the pages. Another second-year student. Her name is Megan Jones. But she hasn't been seen this morning. Has someone been into her room to check? asked Bridget, suddenly fearful that there might be a second dead body behind that door. Yes, said Jake. I got a spare key from the porter. The room was empty. Okay, said Bridget. Let's take a look at the victim. She took a deep breath. This might well turn out to be her first murder case as a detective inspector, but years of being a single parent had taught her that she could cope with any new challenge, as long as she acted the role that people expected of her. I've got this, she thought, and stepped into Zara's room, doing her best to exude an air of confidence. Jake followed in her wake. Pretty big for a student room, he said, gazing around. Bridget thought he was trying to mask his nerves by focusing on the room, rather than the figure under the white sheet in the middle of the floor. Yes, it's one of the more spacious ones, she said. The fact was, college accommodation at Oxford ranged from the palatial to the pokey, from the charmingly historic to the utilitarian and modern. She'd seen rooms that were little better than garrets, and others that looked as if they'd been furnished for a remake of Bryce had revisited. Her own room in her first year at Merton had been practical, but nothing special. In her second year, she'd lived out of college in a shared house with five other girls, just off the Cowley Road in East Oxford. The less said about that dump, the better. For her final year, she'd been able to choose a beautiful room in college, with views over the fellow's garden. Zara had been lucky to have two rooms, in fact, a study-slash-sitting room and an adjoining bedroom, at present, both rooms were filled by the white-suited Socco team and their gear. They were busy photographing, videoing, dusting for prints, and bagging potential evidence. In the centre of the sitting room, next to a small coffee table, lay the body, discreetly covered by a white sheet. Bridget and Jake waited by the door until the head of the Socco team waved them over. "'Hello, Bridget,' said Vikram from behind his protective face mask. Or perhaps I should call you D.I. Hart now. His eyes crinkled to show that he was grinning. She couldn't see his mouth. Bridget smiled back gratefully. If all of her colleagues were as friendly and helpful as him, her job would be so much easier. Bridget will do just nicely. And this is dear Sterwent. She indicated Jake. Is it okay if I call you Jake? Yes, ma'am, he said with a quick grin. She noticed his reluctance to use her first name in return. She was getting to like the young sergeant more, the longer she spent with him. Vikram Vijaya Raghavan, said the Socko head to Jake. People call me Vic. Excuse me if I don't shake your hand. He indicated the plastic gloves he was wearing. We've nearly finished here. We'll be taking the laptop away for analysis, but we haven't found a mobile phone anywhere. Any initial thoughts, Vic? Could have been an accident, I suppose but it doesn't look likely. I'd guess someone did this to her. What about a murder weapon? Vikram shook his head. Looks like she was hit on the back of the head with a blunt object, but there's nothing matching that description here. We'll know more after the pathologist has done the post-mortem. Any other obvious signs of violence? Nothing I could see. May we take a look, please? Of course. 
Vikram stepped nimbly to the side and, with delicate fingers, pulled back the white sheet that covered the body. Zara lay on her front, her head turned to one side. She was dressed for the weather in a simple summer dress in pale yellow. A sticky trail of half-congealed blood tangled her hair and ran across her shoulders onto the carpet. That long, blonde hair must have been stunning once. The sort of hair that had a starring role in shampoo adverts. The sort of hair Bridget had dreamed of having when she was little, but which she'd never been able to grow. She crouched down next to the body for a closer look. Beneath the mass of hair and blood, Zara's eyes were closed, and her face looked almost peaceful. It reminded Bridget of Chloe when she was asleep. With corpses, it was never the physical damage that got under her skin, but the thought that this was someone's child, or partner, or parent. The question that always went through her head was, how would I feel if it was my own daughter lying there? That was why she had to find the killer. For Zara's sake, and for the sake of the dead girl's friends and family. She nodded at Vikram, and he replaced the sheet. Jake had already looked away, a slightly queasy look on his face. "'Is this the first dead body you've seen, Sergeant?' she asked. "'No, ma'am. "'It won't be the last one, either.' She wanted to tell him that it would get easier with time, but that would have been a lie. "'This body is evidence of a crime, and if you want to find the person who committed that crime, who killed Zara, you need to study the evidence. All of it.' "'Yes, ma'am. He met her gaze. You're sure it's murder, then? She softened her voice. It looks that way, but we won't know for certain until we get the post-mortem report. She turned to Vikram. When do you think that will be? The pathologist said he'd try and do the PM on Monday morning. Today was Friday. Bridget couldn't afford to wait three whole days for the autopsy. She fully expected to be working this weekend, and she didn't see why the pathologist should be any different. I'll have a word with him and see if I can hurry it along, she said. How long before you have your provisional results? First thing tomorrow. I'll make it my top priority. Excellent, said Bridget, treating him to a smile. I'll be in touch. While the corpse was zipped into a body bag in preparation for removal to the morgue, Bridget and Jake took a look around the room. In many ways, it was a typical student room filled with books, pens, pencils, sheafs of paper and other stationery. Arty posters covered the walls, black and white photos of obscure musicians jostled for space with fine art prints and political slogans in bold typefaces. "'Studying English, by the look of it,' said Bridget, examining the bookshelves. The shelves were laden with classics of English literature, Shakespeare's plays and sonnets, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, Beowulf in the original and Seamus Heaney's translation, numerous anthologies of poetry and short stories, plus a slew of nineteenth-century novelists, including Dickens, Hardy, Eliot, and the Bronte sisters. "'That's a lot of reading to get through,' said Jake. Bridget turned to the desk by the window, with its view of Tom Quad and the Mercury Fountain. Its surface was littered with handwritten papers, essays, revision notes, and carefully annotated copies of texts. Bridget read the words on the top sheet. Lust and ambition are the driving forces of tragedy. Underneath, Zara had brainstormed a list of ideas about Hamlet, Macbeth, and Julius Caesar. She certainly appeared to have been a hard-working student. Above the fireplace hung a cork notice board. Alongside a lecture timetable and a notice about opening hours at the Bodleian Library, Bridget found a ticket to the upcoming end-of-term Christchurch Ball in just over a week's time. A leaflet from Shelter, the homeless charity, and a flyer from the Oxford University Labour Club. That, together with the political posters, strongly suggested that Zara's politics were left of centre. Bridget was pretty certain that Sir Richard Hamilton was no supporter of the Labour Party. Hadn't he recently made a big donation to the Conservatives? She wondered how Zara's political leanings had gone down with the rest of the family— She'd presumably find out soon enough, when she spoke to the twin brother, Zachary. She took a quick look in the bedroom. It was smaller than the sitting room, just big enough for a single bed, a chest of drawers, 
and a minuscule ensuite bathroom that had been shoehorned into one corner. The original Tudor occupant of the room had probably had to walk across the quadrangle to reach the nearest primitive wash facilities, which certainly wouldn't have included a shower with hot running water. Even in Bridget's time, she'd shared a communal bathroom with half a dozen other students. She'd never questioned it, but young people evidently expected better these days. Clearly, a lot had changed in the twenty years since Bridget had first joined the university as a student. Twenty years? Was it really that long ago? In some ways, it felt like yesterday. But seeing Zara's beautiful, youthful face had suddenly made it seem like an eternity. What hopes and dreams had the young woman held? Very little of what the eighteen-year-old Bridget had imagined about her own future had come true. But at least she was still alive. What would she do differently if she could rewind the clock and live those twenty years again? Everything. Then Chloe's face flashed before her, and she thought, Nothing. She would live it all again, just as before. All the joy, all the pain. No regrets. I think we've seen enough here, she said. We'll see what forensics have for us later. As she and Jake made their way back down the stairs, they heard the sound of raised voices coming from the quad. She's my sister, for Christ's sake! The male voice sounded haughty and angry. It was the voice of someone used to getting their own way. I'm sorry, sir, but I must ask you to move back. Please return to the other side of the cordon. Get your hands off me or I'll have you done for police assault! What's going on here? asked Bridget as she stepped around the constable guarding the doorway. She was met by a red-faced young man who, from his wavy blonde hair and finely chiselled features, was unmistakably Zara's twin. This had to be Zachary, the brother who never surfaced before midday, but from the look of him it was impossible to tell if he'd been to sleep in his clothes of the night before, or hadn't yet gone to bed. The stink of alcohol on his breath was still strong. He was wearing a crumpled dress shirt that appeared to have blood on the collar, and his cheekbone was cut and freshly bruised. He ran a hand through his hair, and Bridget noticed a smear of magnolia-coloured paint on his palm. What's going on is that this bonehead, Zachary indicated the uniformed PC with a flick of his hand, is refusing to let me see my sister. I'm sorry, said Bridget, but you won't be able to see her. The young man staggered backwards a couple of steps, the fight gone from him momentarily. Oh, shit. So it's true, then. I'm sorry. He spun away from her and looked as if he was about to keel over. Zack, come here! A girl standing on the other side of the cordoned-off area was holding her arms out to him. He fell into her embrace and hugged her across the crime scene tape. He sobbed wildly as she stroked the back of his head. It was either genuine grief or the most over-the-top acting Bridget had seen for a long time. Go to the boathouse and find the boyfriend, Adam, said Bridget to Jake. I'll see what I can get out of the brother. See you back at headquarters in about an hour. No worries, said Jake, striding effortlessly over the tape. Bridget made her way over to Zack and his girlfriend. The boy was still weeping savagely. His face shone with real tears. Could we go and talk somewhere more private? She suggested. Four. Jake walked briskly along the edge of Christchurch Meadow on his way to find the dead girl's boyfriend, Adam. He took off his jacket, undid his top button, and loosened his tie. It was going to be another hot day. If he hadn't been on a murder investigation, he'd have been tempted to sit down under one of the many trees lining the footpath and enjoy five minutes of peace and quiet. He hadn't been living in Oxford long, and would never have guessed that the city contained what appeared to be a country meadow complete with grazing land for animals, right in its centre. But perhaps he shouldn't have been too surprised. Oxford was a strange place, stuffed full of ancient medieval colleges, with churches everywhere you cared to look, and so many dusty libraries that there was probably one for every person who lived here and all of it bunched right up against overcrowded shopping streets that were literally impossible to drive around. The college porter had given him directions, informing him that, 
The meadow is private land belonging to Christchurch, but access is granted to the public during daylight hours. Jake had got the distinct impression he was expected to show gratitude for having been granted access. Cheers, mate, he'd said to the porter. As he strode along the dusty path leading down to the river boathouses, a small herd of cud-chewing cows regarded him nonchalantly. He had no idea what a college might want with a meadow. Maybe they had plans to teach the cows Latin. Oxford was certainly a very different world to Leeds, where he had grown up, and Bradford, where he'd studied criminology. He'd never imagined himself moving to the south of England, but his long-term girlfriend had got a job in Oxford, and he transferred down here to be with her. But the relationship hadn't lasted. Towards the end, she'd done a lot of crying, and, it turned out, a lot of lying. He still missed her, but he was better off without her. So now here he was, alone in Oxford, unwilling to admit defeat and return home with his tail between his legs, and instead trying to make the best of things. His mates up north teased him about becoming a soft southerner, but in truth he was finding Oxford quite a challenging place to live. The traffic was mad. The people were strange. The house prices were insane. Even on his detective sergeant's salary, buying a place to live was out of the question. Instead, he was renting a cramped one-bedroom flat above a laundrette on the Cowley Road, sandwiched between an Indian restaurant and a Chinese. Well, at least it was convenient for doing his washing and getting takeaways. He reached the river and turned left along the bank towards the boathouses. The River Thames, for some unfathomable reason, was known in Oxford as the Isis, apparently after the Egyptian goddess. Jake shrugged. Whatever. He could handle that. A women's boat powered along the water, the cocks shouting orders to her crew. On the opposite bank a coach cycled along, also yelling commands through a loud hailer. All eight rowers in the boat were red-faced and panting. Rowing looked like hard work. Jake didn't fancy getting up extra early to do that every morning. It would be even worse in the middle of winter. The boat shot past, surprising him with its speed. The boathouses were square, flat-roofed structures, topped with viewing balconies. He walked along the bank until he spotted the Christchurch College crest above the open doorway of one of the buildings. It was the very last one at the end of the row of boathouses, and looked older than its neighbours, constructed from red brick. It wasn't as old as the college itself, though, not by a few hundred years. A boat was just coming into dock beside the floating raft in front of the boathouse. The Cox, a short, skinny guy, sprang out of the boat and started giving orders to the rest of the crew to disembark. The eight rowers executed a well-practiced manoeuvre, getting themselves, the eight oars, and the boat out of the river. They hoisted the boat upside down, and carried it at shoulder height as if it weighed practically nothing. The sleek carbon-fibre hull gleamed in the sun. It must have been getting on for twenty metres in length. Jake ducked out of the way as the rowers swung the boat around, missing him by no more than a foot. They lowered the boat onto a set of sliding rails in the boathouse, and then jogged back to the landing raft to collect their oars. Jake approached the cocks. Impressive team you've got there, mate. They're not too bad, said the cocks grudgingly. They need to work harder, pull together as a team. Can I help you with anything? I understand that one of your rowers is called Adam Brady. That's Adam over there. He's the stroke. The Cox pointed to the biggest guy in the team. None of them were midgets. The men's average height must have been over six foot. But Adam was taller and more muscular than all his teammates. He's the what? asked Jake. The stroke. The Cox sounded impatient. He's the one who sits right in front of me in the stern. The others sit behind him. They follow Adam's lead. Or at least that's what they're supposed to do. With a bit more discipline, they might yet learn to. I see. Well, thanks for your help. Jake walked over to Adam, who was chatting to one of the other rowers. From their gestures, Jake guessed they were discussing rowing technique. Sorry to interrupt, but could I have a word? The other rower slapped Adam on the back and walked off. It'll have to be quick. We're just about to run back to college. Adam interlocked his fingers and stretched his arms behind his back, tilting forward from the waist. 
Who are you, anyway? Jake drew his ID from his pocket. D.S. Jake Derwent, Thames Valley Police. Adam seemed taken aback. He unlocked his fingers and straightened up. Police? Really? What's this about? He ran a hand through his hair. Both hands were bandaged round the knuckles and palms. We can talk while we walk back to the college, if you like, said Jake. He had no intention of letting Adam run off anywhere, and he certainly wasn't going to run alongside him. The Cox was taking the rest of the team through a series of stretching exercises that looked painful. They appeared to be limbering up to start jogging. All right, said Adam grudgingly. He started walking along the riverbank, back the way Jake had just come. His long legs carried him at a fast pace, but Jake was almost as tall and had no problem matching him. I need to ask you where you were last night, and first thing this morning, said Jake. What the hell for? It's about Zara, your girlfriend. Adam stared straight ahead and didn't break his stride. She's not my girlfriend anymore. We split up yesterday afternoon. Interesting, thought Jake mentally storing this new information. Well, I'm sorry, but I have some bad news to tell you. Adam came to an abrupt halt and turned to face him. What? I'm afraid that she was found dead. Adam clenched his fist so that his biceps bulged. If this is some sort of sick joke... I'm sorry, this is no joke. She was found this morning by her tutorial partner. Despite his avert machismo, Adam seemed to crumple. His shoulders slumped, and he buried his face in his bandaged hands. Oh, God. How did it happen? We don't yet know the cause of death. The rest of the team ran past, staring at them. Come on, said Jake. Let's keep walking. After a moment, Adam seemed to recover. They continued at a slower pace, more comfortable for talking. Jake tried to keep his tone conversational. So, what were you doing last night? Drowning my sorrows in the college bar. Because you'd split up with Zara? Yes, Adam sniffed. What time did you go to the bar? Just after seven. And what time did you leave? I don't know. Perhaps about ten. Where did you go afterwards? Adam shrugged. I don't know. I wandered around for a bit. Tim, that's the cox, saw me at some point and reminded me I had to get up early for training today. He could see I was in a bit of a state. So I went to bed. I didn't want to let the team down. And did you see Zara at all last night? No. Adam shook his head. They had almost reached the top of Christchurch Meadow by now. One of the bandages had come loose and Adam tore it off angrily. "'Rowing injury?' asked Jake, nodding at the damaged hand. "'What? Oh, yes, you get blisters rowing.' "'But not cuts and bruises on your knuckles, you don't,' thought Jake, staring at the backs of Adam's hands. "'You might want to put some antiseptic on that, mate. It looks nasty.' Zack's room was in a different quadrangle. Peckwater quad. This one dating from the 18th century— that made it two hundred years newer than Tom Quad. By Oxford standards, it was a modern addition. Bridget followed Zack and his girlfriend into the neoclassical building, and up to a well-proportioned room on the second floor. Wood panelling lined the walls, and an elaborate chandelier hung from the central ceiling rose. And yet the room was squalid. Empty champagne bottles littered the floor. Dirty glasses and stained coffee mugs were strewn around. Items of female clothing hung over the backs of two armchairs and a small sofa that occupied the centre of the room. There was little evidence of much work being done. The desk was less a place of study, more a repository for glassware. Half a dozen shot glasses, a half-empty bottle of vodka, a large bottle of scotch, and a glass paperweight in want of any papers to hold down. The place looked and smelled like the aftermath of a bacchanalian feast. Zack collapsed onto the sofa, his head in his hands. "'Sorry about the clutter,' said the girl as she moved languidly around the room, picking up lacy underwear, a silk camisole, 
and a little black cocktail dress. She was startlingly pretty, with long auburn hair drawn into perfect lines that framed her face. She tossed the clothes into the adjoining bedroom and closed the door. Do you want to speak to Zack alone? Please don't go, Verity, said Zack. I can't do this without you. He reached out a hand and she went to him, wrapping her slender arms around his shoulders. It's all right, said Bridget. I'm happy for you to stay. She took a seat on one of the armchairs opposite. Tell me what happened, said Zack. His voice was barely more than a croak. Was it an accident? It wasn't suicide, was it? Please tell me it wasn't suicide. We have to wait for the post-mortem, said Bridget. But at the moment it doesn't look like an accident or suicide. What does that mean? She was murdered? We're treating the death as suspicious. Zack shook his head in disbelief. It isn't possible. It must have been an accident. No one would want to murder Zara, insisted Verity. Everyone loved her. When did either of you last see Zara? Zack bit his lower lip. I saw her briefly at lunch. Yesterday, I mean. She was just leaving Hall as I was arriving. But she wasn't at Formal Hall in the evening, was she? He looked to Verity for confirmation. No. Verity shook her head. Zara didn't often eat with us. She preferred to eat at Informal Hall at 6.20. Formal Hall is an hour later. You could try asking Sophie. That's her tutorial partner. Or Megan. She has the room opposite Zara's. I'll do that, said Bridget. She had dined once at Formal Hall in Christchurch as the guest of a guy she'd met at a student party. It had been a very grand affair with all the students and tutors dressed in academic gowns. Latin grace was said before the three-course meal, which was served by college staff wearing white shirts and black waistcoats. Informal Hall, as its name suggested, was a more relaxed self-service meal, more in keeping with the twenty-first century. "'And what did you do last night, Zack? she asked. "'Me? I went to the Oxford Union.' "'Zack's the president of the Union this term,' said Verity, with a pride that she found impossible to conceal. "'Well, that would explain the dress shirt,' thought Bridget. "'But not why he was still wearing it the morning after. "'Oxford's debating society had never really appealed to her when she was a student. "'Maybe because it had seemed to be so full of people like Zack and Verity. "'Not much had changed there, by the look of it. "'And what time did you get back from the Union?' Just after eleven, I think. I wasn't really paying much attention to the time. Verity had, though, it seemed. Yes, it was twenty past eleven when you came back to your room. I was chairing a meeting of the ball committee until eleven. You were back twenty minutes later. Aha, uh -huh, thought Bridget. Even during a police investigation into the violent death of her boyfriend's sister, the young woman hadn't been able to stop herself mentioning that Zack was president of the Oxford Union— and that she was chair of Christchurch Ball Committee. She obviously felt it was a big deal. But even Bridget had to concede that they made quite the high-powered couple. "'So you were here when Zack returned?' she asked Verity. "'Me?' said Verity. "'Sure. I was waiting for him.' "'You have a key to his room? He left it open for me.' "'And what did you do after that?' "'We both stayed here.' she said, stroking the side of Zack's face with the back of her fingers. What was the debate about at the Union, Zack? Bridget wanted to move the conversation on. Oh, just some boring debate about veganism. Get a bit violent, did it? What? The cut on your cheek. The blood on your shirt. Looks like tensions were running high. Oh, no, said Zack, touching his cheek. That was something else entirely. Care to elaborate? Zack squirmed in his seat. Not really. You look like you've been in a fight. Zack's eyes narrowed. He sat up straight and looked Bridget in the eye. For just a moment, she saw a glimpse of the powerful, overbearing media tycoon who'd fathered this privileged young man. 
I don't know what you're implying, detective. If you think I had anything to do with the death of my sister, you couldn't be more wrong. I loved Zara with all my heart. Now she's been murdered, and you're sitting here asking me questions about some stupid argument that has nothing to do with anything. I suggest you get off my back and catch whoever did it. So you think it might be murder after all, then? What? Previously you insisted that your sister's death must have been an accident. I don't know, shouted Zack. Just leave me alone. Get your people out there and find out what happened. The angry outburst was not entirely unexpected in the circumstances. Bridget let it pass. I fully intend to find out what happened, and to catch whoever did it, she said, standing up. But before I leave, I must ask you to hand over your shirt for forensic analysis. I'm sure you understand. 5. Bridget left Zack to be consoled by Verity. The girl didn't seem to need much encouragement, and set about her task with zeal. Zack was lucky to have such a devoted girlfriend who was willing to overlook his arrogant manner. She also didn't seem to mind the mess in his room, which, to be fair, was at least half hers, nor the fact that he went to sleep in his outfit of the night before and woke up smelling like an empty wine bottle. Young love. Bridget had married young, too young, and look how that had turned out. Pregnant at twenty-three and a single parent at twenty-five. None of which had helped her career, although it hadn't harmed her ex, Ben, who was now a senior detective with the Metropolitan Police in London. As she walked back across Peckwater Quad, her thoughts turned again to Chloe, and Bridget felt a fresh round of guilt. Guilty feelings seemed to be an inescapable part of motherhood, or at least Bridget's experience of motherhood. She had to face facts. That homemade birthday cake she'd planned so carefully was never going to happen. Was there somewhere she could stop off and buy a cake on her way back to police HQ? She arrived back in Tom Quad to find the PC outside Zara's staircase engaged in a heated discussion, with a man dressed in slim-fitting chinos and an open-necked blue shirt in a good-quality twill fabric. The studied, smart, casual look was offset by the slightly battered leather briefcase he carried under one arm. "'Can I help?' asked Bridget. The man regarded her through large designer glasses— I was just trying to explain to this policeman that I have a tutorial in five minutes and really must be allowed into my room. I've been in the library all morning. Bridget remembered the name she had seen on the door of the ground-floor room. Would you be Dr. Claiborne? The young tutor ran a hand through his foppish hair. Yes, I'm Dr. Claiborne. I was hoping to speak to you. The tutor raised one eyebrow. What is it that you teach? asked Bridget. English. I'm the college's English tutor. Bridget remembered the books in Zara's room, all works of English literature. So Zara Hamilton was one of your students? One of my best students. His gaze shifted nervously from Bridget to the PC and back to Bridget. Why? And why are you referring to her using the past tense? Trust an English tutor to pick up on her use of tenses, thought Bridget. I am afraid that Zara was found dead this morning in her room. Oh, God. Dr. Claiborne's briefcase fell to the ground. He took off his glasses and rubbed his eyes with one hand. Was she... I mean, how did she... We're currently investigating the circumstances of her death, said Bridget. But since you have a room on the same staircase and you were her tutor, can I ask when you last saw her? Dr. Claiborne pushed his glasses back on, and his forehead creased into a frown. I think it must have been yesterday afternoon. Yes, that's it. I saw her coming into the staircase in the afternoon. It must have been about four o'clock, because I'd just finished a tutorial with some first years. What about later on? Did you see her in the evening? No, I, uh, there was a drinks reception in the dean's lodgings. I went to that. And what time did the drinks reception finish? About eleven, I think. Thank you. We'll need to take a statement from you. And I'm afraid that you won't be able to have access to your room until we've finished taking physical evidence from the scene. 
not even to... If there are any items you need to get from your room, please tell the constable and he will retrieve them for you. Yes, I... Dr. Claiborne's cheeks reddened. Of course. He turned away and headed in the direction of the porter's lodge, taking his briefcase with him. Any sign of the student who has the room on the top floor? Bridget asked the PC. Not yet, Mum. When she comes back, get someone to go up with her. She'll need to collect her stuff and be allocated a new room. As she turned to leave, her phone rang. She checked the caller display. Oh, God, not now. It was her sister. She supposed she'd better answer it, or she'd get no peace. She descended to the lower level of the quad and wandered over to the mercury fountain in the centre for some privacy. Vanessa, hi. What is it? Is that how you answer the phone these days? How about, how are you? Listen, I'm really busy right now. I can't talk. I won't keep you long. I just wanted to check that you're coming for lunch on Sunday. Vanessa sounded anxious. But then she always sounded anxious. Bridget sighed. She'd forgotten about that. Sure, if I can, but I'm in the middle of an investigation and... Don't say that. I've invited a plus one. Mid-forties, but looks very good for his age. Widowed three years ago. Cancer, she added in a stage whisper. Bridget grimaced. Her sister was on a mission to fill the man-sized void she saw at the heart of Bridget's existence. His name is Jonathan, she continued, oblivious to Bridget's lack of interest. He runs an art gallery in Oxford. She spoke the words in hushed reverential tones. Very successful apparently. Great, I have to go now. See you Sunday. Bridget finished the call and pocketed her phone. If Vanessa called again, she'd let it go to voicemail. She set off briskly towards Tom Gate, the arched gatehouse that led from the college back onto the bustle of St. Aldate's. One of the bowler-hatted custodians who manned the entrance was trying to disperse a group of curious tourists who were crowding around, taking pictures on their phones. Perhaps you should consider keeping the gates closed until all the crime scene activity is finished, she suggested. She looked around the vaulted entrance space until she found what she was looking for. Just as she'd hoped, a CCTV camera was mounted on the stone wall beside the gate. She entered the lodge and found Jim Turner, the head porter, sorting through a pile of mail. He looked up when he saw her. Inspector Hart, is there anything else I can do for you? Yes, there is, actually. I see you have a security camera on the main gate. Is it operational? Are there any others? We've got state-of-the-art CCTV at all the entrances to the college. Now this was what Bridget liked to hear. The porter continued to elaborate. One here at Tom Gate, another at Canterbury Gate off Peckwater Quad, and we also have one at Meadow Gate, which is the tourist entrance. The Meadow Gate closes to visitors at quarter past four. Canterbury Gate is locked at dusk, and Tom Gate closes at nine in the evening. There are no other ways into the college? Just the three gates. So whoever did it, they're bound to have been caught on one of these cameras when they entered the college. Unless they were already inside, thought Bridget. In fact, continued the porter, I thought you might ask about CCTV, so I've already made copies of last night's tapes for you. He handed her a small padded envelope. I call them tapes, but of course they're memory sticks these days. Everything's gone digital. This is everything from the three gates from noon yesterday through to nine o'clock this morning, which was when the alarm was first raised. Wow, said Bridget. You're a star, Jim. You wouldn't believe how difficult it is sometimes to get hold of this material. You've just made my job a whole lot easier. Ah, oh, well, said the porter gravely. I want to do everything I can to help you catch whoever did this. He leaned over the counter and lowered his voice. She was a lovely girl, Zara. Heart of gold. Everyone here is really cut up about it. Thank you for your help, said Bridget. You take care, and I'll let you know if there's anything more I need. Bridget returned to her car, checking to see if any overzealous traffic warden had issued her with a ticket. But mercifully, her car was unmolested. 
She retraced her route through the one-way system and headed up the Banbury Road, passing through Oxford's most expensive residential area. The parade of shops here catered to the middle-class inhabitants of leafy North Oxford, including Bridget's sister, Vanessa. As usual, there was nowhere to park. With barely a trace of guilt, Bridget pulled up on double yellow lines outside her favourite patisserie, leaving her police permit defiantly on the dashboard. She popped into the artisan bakery and bought an iced chocolate cake in a fancy presentation box. She laid the box carefully on the back seat of the car, then pulled away, singing gutsily along to Despina's soprano aria, as other drivers in search of a parking spot threw furious glares in her direction. Bridget often felt that life would be so much easier if she'd simply been born Italian. Although Oxford's main police station was situated on St. Aldate's, just a stone's throw from Christchurch, Bridget was based at the headquarters of Thames Valley Police in Kidlington, just north of Oxford. The small town was something of a town planner's afterthought, the sort of place you pass through on your way to somewhere else, without even noticing it. There was little worth noticing. The town's old historic centre was stuck out on a limb, hidden from casual passers-by and dwarfed by the sprawl of bland houses, low-rise offices, and retail space that constituted modern Kidlington. Bridget found a small space in the car park at Thames Valley HQ, and squeezed her mini between two much larger vehicles. The smell of chocolate wafting from the back seat was making her hungry. Should she leave the cake in the car and risk the icing melting in the heat, or bring it inside? She decided it would be safer in the car. If she left the cake on her desk, there was little chance any would be left by the end of the day. "'Thought you had taken the day off,' said the duty sergeant as she walked in. "'That was the plan. Then something came up. "'That Oxford student?' Bridget nodded. "'Word had got around fast. "'Sex, death, and chocolate cake. "'It was impossible to keep any of them a secret for long at Kidlington.' Upstairs, the CID suite was humming with the clatter of fingers on keyboards, the ringing of telephones, and not entirely work-related conversations. Bridget acknowledged her colleagues with a smile here and a nod there. She hadn't even made it as far as her desk by the window, one of the perks of being promoted to detective inspector, before she heard the hectoring tones of Chief Superintendent Grayson summoning her into his office. She would have liked five minutes to grab a coffee and straighten her thoughts before seeing him, but Grayson, who had come from the military, always wanted answers straight away, if not sooner. Taking a deep breath, she entered the inner sanctum of the chief super's office, more of a glass fishbowl, really, and closed the door behind her, shutting out the comforting background noise of the open-plan workspace. Grayson sat in his comfortable leather chair behind his voluminous desk, which was always remarkably free of the teetering piles of paperwork that littered Bridget's much smaller desk. Well into his fifties, with short salt-and-pepper hair, a strong jaw, and an upright posture from years of standing to attention, Grayson was more respected than liked. He was known not to suffer fools gladly, and could come across as abrupt and even abrasive. On the plus side, he was considered to be fair, even-handed, and loyal. Pride of place on his desk was a photograph of himself and his wife, a good-looking woman who dressed well, and looked as if she kept regular appointments at the hairdressers, standing next to the mayor in Oxford's elaborate town hall. Further photographs showed each of his three children, a girl and two boys, graduating from top universities. Grayson liked to keep himself fit by playing golf, and photographs of him playing at various courses hung on the wall behind his desk. At least that solved one problem— what to buy him as a leaving present when he retired in a few years. An event Bridget was greatly looking forward to. Sit down. He indicated the chair in front of his desk. Sir? Bridget could never enter Grayson's office without feeling as if she was being called in to see the headmaster about her grades. You've been to Christchurch, said Grayson. The superintendent had a strange way of turning simple statements into both questions and rebukes. "'I've just come from there now,' said Bridget, omitting to mention the quick stopover in North Oxford, which didn't actually take her out of her way, so didn't count. "'Your assessment of the situation? What are we dealing with?' "'Definitely a suspicious death,' said Bridget. "'The girl sustained a serious injury to the back of the head, which couldn't have been deliberately self-inflicted. 
I can't completely rule out accidental death at this stage, but murder looks much more plausible. The post-mortem should confirm, one way or the other. Right, said Grayson. I'm taking you off the case. What? Sir? The chief superintendent leaned forwards with his forearms on his desk, his big hands clasped together. You do know who we're dealing with here? The dean had asked her exactly the same question. I understand that the dead girl is Zara Hamilton, daughter of Sir Richard Hamilton, the media magnate. Quite. Grayson sat back in his chair, gripping the armrests. The media spotlight will be shining brightly on this case. There's no room for error. I need a more experienced detective as senior investigating officer. Bridget's cheeks burned with indignation. But, sir, you said— I'll reassign someone else to the case. Baxter, Davis, leave it with me. He dismissed her with a sharp nod and opened a report to read. Bridget stayed where she was. Sir? Yes? The chief super looked surprised to see her still sitting there. I can handle this case. I've already identified the victim's boyfriend and sent a sergeant to take his statement. I've interviewed several key witnesses and spoken to the Socco team. The head porter has given me CCTV footage. But can you handle the press coverage? interrupted Grayson. They're like wolves. If they smell blood... They won't, sir. I won't let them. Grayson leaned back, studying her face, his dark eyes boring into hers. She held his gaze steadily. Despite the interruption to her plans for today, now that she had made a start, now that she had actually seen the dead girl, she didn't want to let this case go. She felt a sense of duty to the victim. She wouldn't let Zara down. I've encountered Sir Richard once or twice on the golf course. Take it from me. The man's a bully. He has friends in high places, too. Any slip-ups and he'll be on our backs. More to the point, he'll be on my back. I won't slip up, sir. The chief super tapped his finger on the desk and seemed to come to a decision. Very well. You can stay for now. But I want regular daily updates on progress. We'll have to move quickly on this one. Sir Richard will want to see results. Fast. But it's not just Sir Richard we have to worry about. The college won't put up with more intrusion than is absolutely necessary. They'll be worried about the damage this will do to their reputation. I already got that impression from the dean, said Bridget. Any dirt you unearth stays under wraps until we have cast iron evidence. Oh, and by the way, the Met phone just before you arrived. Sir Richard and Lady Hamilton are being driven from London and should be at the morgue in about an hour and a half. I'll make sure I'm there to meet them. Grayson nodded. You'd better get on with it, then. Thank you, sir. The meeting was over. Bridget returned to the open-plan office, desperate to get herself a coffee. A slice of that chocolate cake wouldn't go amiss, either. She'd surely burned off at least a hundred calories under the chief's intense grilling. A young woman with a pixie haircut and clad in green motorcycle leathers was perched on the edge of Bridget's desk. She was typing on her phone, using both thumbs at breakneck speed, a skill that Bridget had never mastered, and was oblivious both to Bridget and the appraising glances from the male officers seated nearby. "'Can I help you?' asked Bridget. She wondered if the new arrival was being deliberately rude, or simply had no awareness of personal space. D.C. Fionn Hughes. The young detective constable stood up straight, speaking with a lilting Welsh accent. She held out her hand. Bridget took the hand in hers. It was slim, the fingers long and delicate, the nails painted the same green hue as the motorcycle leathers. Fionn's almond-shaped eyes were the same emerald green. I was told to report to you. About the Christchurch death? Fionn picked up the crash helmet that she left on top of Bridget's bulging in-tray. I just need to get changed, she said. Then I'll be ready to start work. Of course, said Bridget. She felt short and dumpy next to this elfin beauty in her skin-tight leathers. D.S. Jake Derwent should be here shortly. Team meeting in ten minutes. Oh, and could you drop this off in forensics for me? 
She handed Fion the evidence bag containing Zack's shirt. Already on my way, said Fion, striding off across the office floor. Notice boards covered one wall of the incident room, displaying names, roles, and tasks to be assigned. Pinned to the central board were photographs of the crime scene. The victim viewed from every angle, gory close-ups of the wound to the back of her head, images of blood spatter that resembled abstract works of art. The atmosphere in the room was tense with expectation. A new case. Everyone keen to make a start and gather as much information as quickly as possible. They all knew the first twenty-four hours were critical. Bridget walked to the front of the room and surveyed her hastily assembled team. Half a dozen detective constables and a similar number of sergeants had been pulled from other, less high-profile cases. She'd worked with some of them before, and knew the rest by sight. Jake had returned from the boathouse and was munching a chocolate bar, his other hand gripping a mug of coffee with Leeds United emblazoned on it. Next to him, Fionn was holding the string attached to a herbal tea bag, dunking the bag up and down in a mug sporting a bright red Welsh dragon. All Bridget had managed since she'd got back to Kidlington was a quick coffee from the vending machine down the corridor. The machine dispensed hot water willingly enough, but grudgingly held back any hint of flavour. She waited a moment to make sure she had everyone's attention. It wasn't easy to stamp your authority on a case when everyone else in the room literally looked down on you. She stood up straighter and pulled her shoulders back. The hubbub of voices gradually died away. Okay, let's make a start. I think you all know me. D.I. Bridget Hart. She pointed to the first photograph on the notice board. The dead woman is Zara Hamilton, daughter of Sir Richard Hamilton. A murmur went around the room. They had all heard of the influential media magnate who owned a string of newspapers and television channels in the UK and across Europe. Zara was twenty years old and a second-year student studying English at Christchurch. She has a twin brother in the college, Zachary, known as Zack. Bridget took a sip of water before continuing. The victim was found this morning in her room by Sophie Hinton, her tutorial partner. Judging from the obvious damage to her skull and the blood spatter, I'd say she died after being struck with some considerable force by a blunt object. I swivel to the more gory photographs on the notice board. The body was fully clothed, and there's no obvious indication of any sexual assault. No trace of a murder weapon was found in the room or in the vicinity, and we'll have to wait for the post-mortem to be sure of the cause of death. Bridget picked up the summary report that Vikram had given her. Initial findings from Socko indicate that her mobile phone is missing. They also couldn't find her wallet, which could mean that this was a random burglary. It's possible that someone wandered into the college off the street, found their way to Zara's staircase, and attacked her. But it's unlikely, given that Christchurch has some of the tightest security in Oxford. You're not kidding, said Ryan Hooper, one of the local coppers from the back of the room. Those custodians guard the place like it contains the crown jewels. They used to call them bulldogs in the old days. Smiles and light laughter greeted his comment, and Bridget acknowledged him with a nod. A bit of banter always helped to break the ice and bond the team. He was referring to the bowler-hatted custodians who were on constant duty at the entrances to the college. The tourists thought them a quaint curiosity, until they tried to get past one. Plenty of visitors going in and out, though, said Harry one of the young constables. Could someone have entered with a tourist ticket and lingered behind? It was a fair point. The head porter's already given me the CCTV recordings from the three entrances, continued Bridget, so we'll be able to check who came and went throughout the day and night. While we can't rule out a stranger, most likely it was someone Zara knew. Jake, how did you get on at the boathouse? Jake nervously swallowed the last mouthful of his chocolate bar and scrunched the wrapper in his hand as he stood to address the team. I spoke to the boyfriend, Adam. He's now the ex-boyfriend. They split up yesterday afternoon. There were audible inhales of breath around the room. A boyfriend or husband was always a prime suspect, and a jealous or angry ex, doubly so. How did he seem? asked Bridget. Pretty shocked, to be fair, said Jake. He certainly gave the impression he didn't know anything about it. But he's a dodgy character. There's definitely something he's not telling us. 
such as? Well, his hands were bandaged. He said it was because of blisters from the rowing, but one of the bandages came loose and there were clearly cuts and bruises on the back of his hand. You don't get them from rowing. Bridget nodded. She already had a pretty good hunch where those cuts and bruises might have come from. Did he say what he was doing last night? Drowning his sorrows in the college bar. Should be easy enough to check. Good, said Bridget. Thanks. Jake sat down, a look of relief on his face. I spoke to Zack, Zara's twin, continued Bridget. He claims to have been in the Oxford Union until around eleven, and his girlfriend Verity confirms that he got back to his room in college at twenty past eleven. Zack had blood on his shirt. It's been sent to forensics, and a cut on his cheek. He'd obviously been involved in a fight, but when I questioned him about it, he got angry with me and refused to discuss it. He says that the last time he saw Zara was at lunchtime, and that she wasn't at formal hall at 7.20. Her tutor says that he saw her at four o'clock. We need to find out if anyone saw her later than that. Ryan? Bridget looked at the DS who'd made the quip about the bulldogs. Could you take a couple of constables over to the college and start establishing Zara's whereabouts last night? Where did she go? Who was she with? Who were her friends? Any enemies in college? That sort of thing. Get as much background as you can. I'm on it, said Ryan. He nodded at a couple of DCs standing nearby, and they left. Jake, Fion, I'd like you to start by going to the Oxford Union and checking that Zack was actually there. What time he left? Who he had the fight with? Jake glanced across at Fion, and his face lit up. The DC had changed out of her motorcycle leathers and was wearing tight black trousers, ankle boots, and a designer shirt that hugged her toned figure. Bridget became conscious that she was holding her own stomach in. Whether through nerves or a subconscious desire to appear slimmer, she wasn't sure. Then check Verity's alibi. She's vouching for Zack, so we have to be sure she's not lying. Then check Adam's alibi with the college bar staff. Might be worth having another word with him. Andy? She nodded to one of the other sergeants she knew. Take the rest of the team. Find Megan, the student who has the room opposite Zara's. No one's seen her since yesterday. Take a full statement from the tutorial partner, Sophie, who discovered the body. Talk to anyone who can vouch for Adam's whereabouts. Start questioning all the students who were in college yesterday and see if anyone saw anything. Start with everyone who has a room in Tomquad, including tutors and academics. Oh, yeah, and there was a drinks reception in the dean's lodgings yesterday evening. Find out who was there. Had she covered everything? Something else was nagging at her, but she couldn't think what. "'What about you, ma'am? asked Jake. Bridget checked her watch. "'I've got to run. I'm expected at the hospital in half an hour to meet the parents. Thirty minutes to get to the morgue and grab some lunch en route. One of these days she'd find a way to live a healthier life. Until then it would have to be a packet of crisps and a can of Diet Coke. Like so many times before. That bloody vending machine would be the death of her.' Six. So, who's driving? asked Jake as they made their way to the car park. Fionn looked directly at him with her startlingly green eyes. She really was quite stunning. I don't have a spare crash helmet, she told him, so we'd better take your car. Oh, right, said Jake, feeling slightly foolish, although how was he to know she was a biker? They passed a line of motorbikes, and she patted a futuristic-looking lime-green model at the end. "'That yours?' he asked. "'Kawasaki Ninja H2. Four-cylinder, 998cc engine with a centrifugal supercharger. Top speed of 183 miles per hour.' "'Wow,' said Jake, stumped for words. Not only was she a looker, but she rode a bloody cool bike. He imagined what his mates in Leeds would say if he turned up with her on his arm— some crude Anglo-Saxon phrases sprang to mind. I'm parked over here. He clicked his remote and his Subaru eagerly flashed its lights in response. The orange hot hatch stuck out a mile from all the identical grey, silver and charcoal cars in the car park. He'd picked it up second-hand two years ago from a dealer in Bradford, and had then spent almost as much again pimping it up. He hoped Fionn would be impressed. 
he hastily brushed some chocolate wrappers off the passenger seat before she got in. Subaru Impreza WRX, 2.5-litre turbocharged engine, she said, sitting next to him. Nice car. It was impossible to tell if she was being sarcastic with that lilting Welsh accent of hers. He sensed her smirking but didn't dare look. You know your motorsport, then, he said cautiously. Critics say the Impreza is a good value sports hatchback, but the suspension is soft and the interior feels cheap and outdated. Uh-huh, countered Jake weakly. He pushed the start button and the sound of the Arctic monkeys blasted out of the souped-up speakers. He turned the music off before she could offer an opinion. I've not seen you around before, he said as he reversed out of the parking space. I transferred from Reading two weeks ago. Reading? I thought you were from Wales. Stupid comment. Why couldn't you think of something more intelligent to say? I can see why they recruited you to CID. Ouch. He deserved that. He signalled left and pulled out onto the main road. When I was a kid, we used to holiday in North Wales, he said, trying to recover the conversation. Prestatin, Bangor, Rill. There were other seaside towns his family had visited, but he couldn't be confident of pronouncing them correctly. He wasn't a hundred percent sure he'd said these right. They're nice places when it isn't raining. Trouble is, it always was. It was a weak joke, but it was all he had to offer right now. Fionn looked distinctly unimpressed. If you're going to make a joke about sheep shaggers, don't bother. I've heard them all before. Sheep shaggers? Where on earth had that come from? He'd been going to ask if she followed the rugby, but thought better of it. So, um, whereabouts in Wales are you from? Cum Clidach. The strange word seemed to fill the space between them. An unpronounceable, unspellable word that sounded like it had a surplus of consonants and not enough vowels. He had no idea where it was. Did Welsh people make these names up just to confuse the English? It's a former mining village in the South Wales Valleys, explained Fionn, answering his unasked question. I couldn't wait to get out and come to Oxford. Oh, did you study here, then? he asked, surprised. They do let Welsh people in, you know. Christ, she was prickly. Weren't the Welsh supposed to be into poetry and singing, that sort of thing? So which college did you go to? He learned that this was always the question to ask. There were over thirty separate colleges making up the university, and Oxford graduates often seemed to feel more fondness for their college than for the university itself. Jesus College, said Fionn, a hint of warmth and affection creeping into her voice for the first time. Lots of Welsh people go there. They say if you stand in the front quad and shout Jones, half the windows will open. He had no idea if she was being serious. He slowed down as they approached the twenty-mile-an-hour zone in the centre of Oxford, and parked on the wide street of St Giles, just outside St John's, another grand college. Ryan had told him once that you could walk from St John's in Oxford to St John's in Cambridge, without once stepping foot off land owned by one or other of the two colleges. He didn't know if Ryan was pulling his leg, but he wouldn't have been surprised if the story was true. So what's this Oxford Union, exactly? He asked as they skirted round the tourists at the foot of Martyr's Memorial, the tall stone monument in the middle of St Giles. His dad had been a union representative at Tetley's Brewery in Leeds before he'd been made redundant. But somehow Jake didn't imagine this Oxford Union standing up for workers' rights and balloting for strikes. It's the University Debating Society said Fionn. It attracts aspiring politicians. Zack being president is a pretty big deal. They darted across Magdalen Street in front of the Woodstock bus. Several British prime ministers were president of the Union in their student days. Edward Heath, William Gladstone, Herbert Henry Asquith, not to mention Boris Johnson. They crossed the busy road into Corn Market, one of the four main streets that intersected at Carfax. A young woman was playing something classical on a cello, outside the medieval church of St. Michael at the North Gate. That was the kind of busker you got in Oxford. They turned down the narrow side road of St. Michael Street, and there, tucked just behind Oxford's main pedestrianised shopping street, was another of the peculiar discoveries that sometimes made Jake think he was living on a film set. Just a short walk away from the bustling shops and fast-food restaurants of Oxford's main shopping street— 
A wrought iron gate opened into the grounds of a building that resembled a grand manor house with fancy brickwork, octagonal towers, and full-height leaded bay windows. A gravel path led them past clipped shrubs to an elaborate wooden doorway. Jake swung the door open. After you. Inside, the impression of stepping into the country house of an earl or lord was only further enhanced by the wood panelling and oil paintings in gilt frames that adorned the walls. Looks like a private members' club, said Jake. That's effectively what it is. Fionn seemed to know her way around. She strode confidently across the entrance hall and through a doorway. Jake followed her into a student bar like none that he had ever been in, and he tried a fair few in his time at Bradford, and when visiting a couple of his mates who'd studied at Newcastle and Sheffield. Those places had either been modern, all chrome and neon lighting, or cave-like holes, not decorated since the seventies. Either way, the walls in those bars had been plastered with posters for gigs, and the atmosphere was generally loud and raucous, especially on a Friday or Saturday night. The Oxford Union Bar, on the other hand, was the sort of place he could have brought his grandmother. Floor-to-ceiling burgundy curtains framed the large windows, and comfortable leather chairs and sofas were positioned around wooden tables. The walls were covered in photographs of all the famous people who had debated at the Union, and there seemed to be no shortage of them. He recognised the Dalai Lama, Mother Teresa, and Albert Einstein, and they were just the ones that happened to be nearest. Incongruously, a chalkboard next to them advertised the soup of the day. A couple of students were seated by one of the windows, drinking lattes and chatting. The barman was polishing glasses. May I help you? Jake showed his warrant card. DS Jake Derwent and DC Fionn Hughes, Thames Valley Police. I wonder if we could have a word. The barman immediately put down his cloth and looked uneasy. Sure, what about? Were you working here last night? Until we closed at 2 a.m. Why? Did you see Zachary Hamilton here? A shadow fell across the barman's face. Oh, yeah, I saw Zach all right. Couldn't miss him. In fact, I threw him out. Why was that? Is this on the record? Not yet, but we may ask you to provide a written statement later. The barman glanced across at the two students who had stopped talking and appeared to be listening. He stared at them until they turned away and resumed their conversation. Zack was blind drunk. He often is by the end of the night. He got into a fight with another student. I know he's the president, but I had no choice. I threw them both out. Jake found it hard to believe that a punch-up would happen in this place. It seemed far too civilised. Who was the other student? I don't know his name, but he was a big guy, well over six foot tall. The barman stretched up a hand to demonstrate. I'm muscular with it. Black hair, tanned skin. I'd have put money on him being a rower or a rugby player. You get to recognise the type. Adam. He certainly fitted the description, and there was no way those grazes on his knuckles were from rowing. Any idea what the argument was about? asked Fion. The barman shook his head. Sorry, no. And what time was this? I kicked them out just before eleven o'clock. Zack was here for at least an hour before that. Thanks, mate, said Jake. You've been a big help. He turned to Fionn. Time to go. Just a minute. Fionn was watching the two students. They looked to be about nineteen or twenty. One was wearing glasses, the other had long, floppy hair. To Jake, their manner screamed privately educated. Fionn approached their table. Mind if we have a word with you? The two guys clearly didn't mind in the least. Their eyes tracked her closely as she sat down at their table and crossed her long legs. Jake pulled up a chair and joined her. Do you attend the debates here? she asked. Or do you just make use of the bar? We go to the debates, said the one wearing glasses. His accent was very posh. We were just discussing last night's speakers. Bloody awful. I'm Reuben, by the way, and this is Michael. Fionn didn't bother to introduce herself or Jake. So do either of you know Zachary or Zara Hamilton? God, everyone knows Zach and Zara, said Michael. Zach's the president this term, although a lot of people would have preferred it to be Zara, but she didn't stand. She's not studying PPE like her brother. P.P.E.? 
asked Jake. Another Oxford term to add to his lexicon. Reuben and Michael looked at him as if he'd just landed from Mars. Politics, philosophy and economics, explained Fionn. It's popular with people who have political ambitions. And would you say Zach had political ambitions? Jake asked the students. Reuben nodded his head vigorously. I should say so. He aspires to be Prime Minister one day. Do you think he actually could be? Michael spread his hands. It's an established career path. Read PPE at Oxford, become President of the Union, work for one of the main political parties for a few years before standing for Parliament, then onward and upward. But plenty of people fall by the wayside. There are no certainties in politics. Jake wondered what the barman would make of the guy he kicked out for brawling being put in charge of the country. So what about Zara? Does she take an active part in debates? He was careful to use the present tense as if she were still alive. Michael guffawed. You should see those two. Sparks fly when they're debating. They're always on opposite sides. Basically, Zack is a dyed-in-the-wall Tory, and Zara's a banner-waving socialist. Makes for some lively arguments. Next week's debate is going to be standing room only, interjected Reuben. You see, Zack has invited Katrina Hodgson as one of the speakers. The newspaper columnist? asked Jake. Katrina Hodgson was always causing controversy by tweeting her antagonistic views on social class, immigration, Muslims, and benefit scroungers. The very same, said Reuben. But some people are arguing that we shouldn't even be giving a platform to someone like Katrina, because allowing her to speak only legitimizes her views. Zack says it's all about the right to free speech. There's a Twitter campaign saying we should ban Katrina and boycott the debate. Fionn took her mobile phone out. What's the hashtag? No Oxford platform. Here we go, she said, flicking at her screen. It's trending. There are hundreds of tweets against the debate going ahead. All right, said Jake, standing up. Thanks for your time. It's been helpful. It was time to head back to Christchurch and confront Adam and Zack. 7. The aroma of partially melted chocolate cake drifting from the back seat of the car tormented Bridget as she drove to the hospital. All she'd managed since breakfast was a packet of prawn cocktail crisps, hardly a healthy choice, and yet they'd somehow also conspired to be completely tasteless. She was pretty sure that no prawns had been harmed in their making. She wondered when she'd next managed to eat a meal that wasn't grabbed from a machine or heated in a microwave. This evening she promised herself. She'd take Chloe out for a birthday dinner that evening, come what may. She'd already sent Chloe a quick text to say that she was bringing home a special birthday treat. Her daughter knew her well enough to know that treat meant cake. Oxford's John Ratcliffe Hospital, known locally as the JR, was a vast, sprawling site of mismatched buildings, situated on a hill in the northeastern corner of the city. The JR was practically a small town in its own right, you needed a map to find your way around. Every time Bridget visited the hospital, she was reminded that it was here she had given birth to Chloe. Fifteen years ago today, in fact. Ben, her ex-husband, had driven her to the maternity unit at breakneck speed, then mysteriously vanished for much of the following fifteen hours of agony that had preceded the intense joy of holding her newborn daughter in her arms for the first time. The explosion of love she'd experienced then had never quite left her, even during Chloe's most rebellious phases. The love she'd felt for her husband had not endured as long. It certainly hadn't survived his serial cheating. A queue of cars was waiting to enter the pay-and-display car park. Bridget drove past them, straight to the area reserved for doctors and other visiting professionals, making sure her well-used police permit was prominently displayed. She switched her phone to silent as she made her way, not to the maternity ward, but to its opposite, the mortuary. From cradle to grave. As she walked, she thought of Zara's parents and how they would never get to celebrate another birthday with their child. Just a few years separated Zara from Chloe, and yet Zara's life had already been brought to a brutal end. She quickly tapped out another text to Chloe. Love you lots. Kiss, kiss, kiss. Zara's parents had already arrived at the hospital when Bridget entered. 
She was met by a uniformed policewoman from the Met who'd accompanied them from London. There, in the waiting room, she said when Bridget showed her warrant card. You're late. How are they? As you'd expect. Angry. Shocked. The woman's manner suggested that this might somehow be Bridget's fault. Bridget composed herself carefully before entering the room. Meeting bereaved relatives was unquestionably the most difficult part of her job, even worse than coming face to face with the actual corpse. The corpse's suffering was over. Theirs was only just beginning. She knew better than most of her fellow officers that bereavement after a violent death could take many years to come to terms with. She'd had to deal with it herself once. Not for a daughter, but for a murdered sister. But that was a long time ago. She pushed open the door to the waiting room and stepped inside. Despite the whisper of the air conditioning, the small room seemed stuffy and airless, the atmosphere tense. A vase of flowers on the central table was starting to wilt, the petals dropping onto the glass tabletop. Sir Richard was on his feet and looked as if he'd been pacing the room, an urgent appointment beckoning. At the sound of the door opening, he swung abruptly to face her. She recognised him instantly from television appearances. The thick silver hair that gave men of that age a certain gravitas. The well-cut suit designed to disguise the middle-aged paunch. Lady Hamilton, by contrast, was too thin for a woman of her age and height, her cheekbones too prominent, her shoulders too angular. Her forehead was unnaturally smooth. Her platinum hair, which she wore shoulder-length, had that professionally blow-dried look that Bridget never managed to attain. She was wearing a grey silk dress, casually understated, and clasping an expensive designer handbag. She perched on the edge of one of the chairs, rigidly upright, her face a mask. Only the slight puffiness around the eyes gave a clue to the sorrow and pain she must be feeling. "'So sorry to have kept you,' said Bridget, extending a hand to Sir Richard. "'D.I. Bridget Hart.' He didn't take her hand. Instead, he glared down at her, nostrils flaring, failing to hide the surprise in his voice. "'Where's the person in charge? That other woman said the senior investigating officer would be coming to meet us.' "'I will be leading the investigation into your daughter's death.' "'And how old are you?' Bridget ignored the rudeness of the question. Nothing would be gained here from confrontation— she didn't need the chief superintendent's warning to tell her that. I'm thirty-eight, I'm a detective inspector, and I have many years of experience as a police officer. Hmm. And you're sure it's actually her? Richard, please. He ignored his wife. I mean, we haven't seen her yet. If you'd like to come with me, said Bridget, I need you to formally identify the body. I know this is going to be difficult. Please, when you're ready. She stepped out, holding the door open wide. Lady Hamilton appeared first, her heels clipping loudly in the silent corridor. Her husband followed, his hands clasped tightly behind his back, chest puffed out, eyes narrowed, as if this might still turn out to be some elaborate and cruel hoax. They followed a waiting mortuary assistant to the chapel of rest. Bridget stood discreetly to one side as the assistant pulled back the white sheet covering Zara's face. The injury to the back of her head had been carefully concealed, the bloody hair tucked discreetly away. Her beauty was still striking, even with the cold, waxen skin of a corpse. Bridget was reminded starkly of her own dead sister, Abigail, only sixteen when her life was taken from her. And Chloe, just turned fifteen, her whole life still ahead of her. People told her that she must never make this job personal. But how could she not? Abigail's death was the force that drove her. It was the single reason she was a police detective, and not just working in some anonymous office somewhere. Lady Hamilton let out a sob, and Bridget stepped outside to give the parents some time alone. She knew that until this moment they would have been in denial, clinging on to the hope, however faint and unlikely, that there had been a terrible mistake, that it wasn't their daughter lying on the table. But when the sheet was pulled aside, all hope vanished. 
Nothing needed to be said in that instant. Identification was confirmed in the sudden widening of the eyes, the intake of breath, the slump of the shoulders, the visceral cry of grief. Ten minutes later they reappeared. Lady Hamilton's eyes were raw red. She looked as if she might crumple. Sir Richard had a protective hand around his wife's shoulder and the other guiding her arm. He had clearly been badly shaken too, but not defeated. Do you know yet who did this? Despite everything, it was unmistakably the voice of a man who demanded results and expected them quickly. That was how a man like Sir Richard came to be the head of such a large corporation, Bridget guessed. No matter how bad the news, all that mattered was the next move, and how to get ahead again. We're making inquiries and following up a number of leads. Bridget knew that the bland, formal phrase said nothing. In other words, no, said Sir Richard. They returned to the waiting room, and he resumed his pacing. I'm going to speak to the chief superintendent. I want to make sure the best person is leading this case. Of course, said Bridget. She didn't think that Grayson would be too surprised to receive Sir Richard's call. But she knew the chief super would back her. Unless she screwed up, of course. If that happened, her head would be on the chopping block. She turned to Lady Hamilton. Would you like to sit down? Shall I fetch you some water? Lady Hamilton sank onto her former chair and nodded. Please. Her voice was barely above a whisper. Bridget fetched two plastic cups of water from a cooler in the corridor. She handed one to Lady Hamilton and placed the other on the table beside the wilting flowers. She took a seat next to Lady Hamilton. Do you mind if I ask a few questions about the family? Zara had a twin brother. What were they like together? Did they get on? Lady Hamilton turned to look at her. Up close, Bridget could see a few grey roots in the otherwise immaculate coiffure. Fine wrinkles traced lines around her mouth and eyes. Her hands, crossed neatly in her lap, couldn't disguise her true age. Zara and Zack, they were always so... Lady Hamilton stared into the middle distance, and her gaze softened as if she was remembering something. Bridget sensed that she was ready to open up and talk about her daughter. Is this really necessary? interrupted Sir Richard. He pulled back his cuff ostentatiously, to reveal an expensive gold watch. Unless you have any relevant questions, I think that you— he glared at Bridget— should be out tracking down the killer. Beside her, Bridget felt Lady Hamilton flinch at her husband's tone of voice. I can assure you, said Bridget, that my people are already doing everything they can to find the perpetrator. I am just trying to build up a better picture of Zara as a person. It was always important to remember that the dead person once had a life, had hopes, dreams, desires, and fears, like the rest of us. Sir Richard shook his head firmly. No. Zack texted me to say he's travelling to our country home. We shall be there to meet him when he arrives. Come on, Celia. It's time we left. Lady Hamilton rose to her feet. You can call me at any time, said Bridget, handing Lady Hamilton her card. Thank you. She dropped it into her leather handbag with barely a glance. Outside in the corridor... The family liaison officer from London was waiting to accompany Sir Richard and Lady Hamilton to their country house in the Cotswolds. Bridget handed them over gladly, and they left without another word. 8. If Fionn had been alone and on her Kawasaki, it would have been much quicker to get around. Parking was always simpler on two wheels. But, as it was, it was easier to walk straight from the Oxford Union to Christchurch than to go back and pick up Jake's car— and then follow the circuitous traffic system that wound its way around the city centre. They walked together down Corn Market, deftly avoiding the attempts of various leaflet-toting activists to change their views on religion or animal rights. Jake strode along briskly, slightly ahead of her, his hands in his pockets, saying nothing. She knew she'd been mean to him, mocking his car and snubbing his efforts to make conversation, and he'd really done nothing to deserve it. He was all right, actually even if he did own a stupid car and have terrible taste in music. 
Her response to him had been purely defensive. Defense in advance of any actual attack. Excessive, perhaps, but effective. She'd learned to deal with men this way over the years. It wasn't that she wasn't attracted to men. She just liked women, too. And experience had taught her that her relationships with women were simpler to navigate. There was no misunderstanding, for one thing. If she dated a woman, then that woman was either gay or bisexual. But when she dated men, most of whom were straight, they tended to assume that any woman they went out with would be straight, too. And things could get awkward when guys discovered her true nature. She'd yet to meet a man sensitive and understanding enough, so she'd largely given up on them. She could do without the hassle. If he asked, she would simply tell him, I'm bisexual, and everything would be out in the open and simpler going forward. Perhaps she ought to have volunteered the information, so that things were clear from the start. As it was, they weren't even talking, and it was probably her fault. She remembered when she had first come to Oxford. Big city strange faces. She'd been lucky to make friends quickly. Jake was still new to Oxford. Perhaps he was just looking for a friend. But with men it was always so complicated. They crossed Carfax and headed down St. Aldate's, weaving their way through the crowds of people waiting for buses. They stopped in the porter's lodge and asked for directions to Zack's room. The porter's name badge read Jim Turner, head porter, Mr. Hamilton has left the college. A car came to pick him up half an hour ago. He's gone to his parents' house in the Cotswolds. Understandable, in the circumstances. Uh, right, said Jake. What about Adam Brady, Zara's boyfriend? Do you know where we can find him? Just a moment, sir. The porter tapped some keys on his computer. Ah, here we go. Mr. Brady has a room in Blue Ball Quad. I'll make a note of the room number for you. He wrote the staircase and room number on a piece of crested notepaper and handed it to Jake. Do you know the way to Blue Ball Quad? Yeah, I know, said Fion. No problem. Anything else I can help you with? asked Jim Turner. That's all for now, said Jake. Thanks. They walked through a largely deserted Tom Quad, past the crime scene tape at the foot of Zara's staircase. The uniformed constable standing guard nodded to them as they passed. It's a funny name, ventured Jake. Blue Ball. Not really, said Fion. It's named after the adjacent street, Blue Ball Street, she added helpfully. Makes sense. Still funny, though. She supposed it was, but strange names started to sound normal after you'd heard them a few times. The Blue Ball was the symbol of the De Vere family. They were the Earls of Oxford, back in the fifteenth century. You're interested in history, are you? asked Jake. I just have a good memory. She led the way left into Peckwater Quad, then left again through a walled walkway into Blue Boar Quad, pausing to see what Jake would make of it. Jesus, he said, stopping to look around. How did this get planning permission? Fionn smiled to herself as she watched Jake take in the quad's strikingly modernist design. The L-shaped building was all brutal horizontal and vertical lines. It was pure 1960s, and Fion rather liked it. But compared to the 16th and 18th century quads they'd just passed through, it did rather resemble an architectural alien whose ship had blown off course. Don't you like it? she asked, keeping a deliberately straight face. It's a grade two listed building, you know. Couldn't they have built something that fitted in a bit better? asked Jake, staring at the grey concrete accommodation block. I'd never have had you down as an architectural snob. I didn't think I was. But still. He wasn't a snob, exactly, she decided. Just someone with fixed and firm expectations. She was glad she'd kept him at a distance. They found Adam's staircase and climbed the stairs to his room on the third floor. Jake knocked loudly. Who is it? called a grumpy-sounding voice. D.S. Jake Derwent and D.C. Fionn Hughes, said Jake. The door opened, but only halfway. What do you want? Could we come in and have a word, please? The scowl on Adam's face said they were not welcome, but he withdrew into the room, leaving the door open. Fionn followed Jake inside. Like the building, the room was modern and functional, 
with fitted cupboards and an ensuite bathroom. The wide window looked out onto more traditional architecture to remind you that you were still in Oxford. But the room was a complete tip. Energy bar wrappers, lycra rowing suits, track suits, pairs of trainers and assorted muddy socks littered the floor. Adam stood in front of the window and Fionn got her first proper look at him. He was even taller than Jake. Six foot five, perhaps even six six, and heavily built too. She estimated his weight at fourteen stone. He was certainly made to be a rower. He'd obviously changed out of his kit since Jake had interviewed him down at the boathouse, and was now dressed in a black T-shirt and tight black jeans that matched his hair. Rugged good looks. That was the phrase most people would use to describe him. But Fion had an eye for detail. His face was long and his brow broad and prominent. His eyes were a dark chestnut. His coal-black hair was untamed, and rough stubble cast a dark shadow across his neck and face. If he'd shaved this morning, he hadn't spent a lot of time on it. She studied his hands. They were large and bristling, with dark hairs on the back. His fingers and palms were calloused from the rowing, but the bandages that Jake had described had disappeared. Instead, they'd been replaced by sticking plasters applied directly over the knuckles of his right hand. Adam stared at them sullenly for a moment, then sat down on the unmade bed. Jake took the desk chair and Fionn sat on the window seat, her back to the view. She crossed her legs and watched as Adam's gaze drifted in her direction. "'We'd like to ask a few more questions,' said Jake. Adam turned away from her. First of all, where were you last night?' "'I already told you. I was in the college bar, drowning my sorrows. "'You can check with the bar staff and about a hundred students if you don't believe me.' "'Because you split up with Zara?' "'Yeah. So how did that happen?' Did she dump you? Jake somehow managed to inject the right amount of blokish sympathy to take the sting out of the blunt question. Adam nodded, looking miserable. Did she say why? Adam sank his face into his huge hands, clearly revealing his injured knuckles. She didn't say, just that she didn't want to see me any more. And what time did you leave the bar? Adam shrugged. I don't know. It wasn't like I was watching the clock or anything. Does it matter? Earlier you told me you left at ten, said Jake. Ten, then. Were you with anyone in particular? Mostly by myself. I didn't feel much like talking. I can understand that, mate. And where did you go after you left the college bar? A moment's hesitation. Popped out for a kebab, if you must know. You didn't go to the Oxford Union? A guarded look crossed his face for the first time. Why would I want to go there? I'm not even a member. Zara was, though, prompted Fionn. Adam turned towards her, studying her face, frowning. We didn't do everything together. She wasn't a rower, for instance. So what did you have in common? she asked. Anger flashed in his dark eyes. I don't have to explain my relationship to you. Do you have a boyfriend? No, said Fionn levelly. She sensed Jake glance in her direction. Adam turned away, a look of misery replacing the momentary aggression. Tell us about you and Zara, said Jake in a more conciliatory tone. How long had you been together? Most of the year, I guess. How serious was the relationship? Adam shrugged. I don't know. How do you tell? Jake scratched his nose carefully. Fionn had seen him do that before. He did it when he was thinking. Well, he said, did you love her? Adam gave the question some consideration. I think I did. I thought she loved me too. Until the breakup. Did you ever visit her parents? asked Fionn. No, Zara didn't talk much about her family, apart from Zack. Was she ashamed of them? No. Was she ashamed of you? asked Fionn. Adam glared at her. You're very rude. Has anyone ever told you that? Yes, said Fionn. So was she ashamed of you? 
No, she just liked to keep different parts of her life separate. To be honest, I was glad. Her father comes across as a bully. Have you met him? Just once. I think it's fair to say he didn't think much of me, and wasn't shy about saying so. And how is your relationship with Zack? I try not to spend much time with him. We tend not to agree on much. So, said Jake, we've just come from the Oxford Union, and the barman there says he threw two students out last night for getting into a fight. One of them was Zachary Hamilton, and the other matched your description. Now, we could check on CCTV, or you could just save us all a shitload of work if you admit that you went to the Oxford Union and had a bust up with Zack. A scowl crossed Adam's heavy brow. Yeah, all right then. I did see Zack. I knew he'd be at the Union, and I went to see him. He stopped. Fion prompted him. So you went to see Zack? What happened? Adam looked up again, morose. Something snapped. I guess that after losing Zara, I felt I had nothing more to lose. I should have hit him a long time ago. Finally, I did. It felt good, if you want to know. He clenched his right fist, showing the plasters covering his knuckles. That's how you got the cuts on your hand? asked Jake. Yeah. Fionn studied his face. There wasn't a mark on it. Zack had no doubt come off the worse in this altercation. What was the argument about? Doesn't matter. Could have been about anything. The guy's a tosser. Why didn't you tell me about the fight with Zack when I asked you before? asked Jake. Adam snorted with derision. Seriously? Yeah, seriously. Adam looked at Jake as if he was stupid. What do you think will happen to me if the college finds out I had a fight with Zachary Hamilton? I'll be sent down. That's what's going to happen, isn't it? After all my hard work, I'm going to be kicked back to where I came from. But wouldn't Zach be sent down, too? Adam laughed mirthlessly. <laughs> you don't get it, do you? Look, I didn't go to Eton. My parents aren't Sir and Lady whoever. I'm from nowhere. Coming here to study at Oxford was a dream come true for me. And meeting Zara. She didn't care where I came from. She treated people however she found them, no matter what their background. But the Dean will kick me out of my arse if he finds out about this fight. He wouldn't dare lay a finger on Zack, because his father's too important. People like Zack can get away with murder. He flinched at his own words. Sorry, that came out wrong. But you know what I mean. Fionn sensed that Adam's outburst wasn't quite finished. She motioned for Jake to stay quiet. After a moment, he continued. The thing is, Zack's father... Sir Richard Hamilton is making a big donation to the college so they can build a new block of student accommodation off-site. It's going to be called Hamilton House. So even though Zack's a lazy shit who hardly ever does any work, he gets to swan around playing at being president of the union and generally being a dick. He lapsed into silence again. Do you know why anyone might have murdered Zara? asked Jake. Adam shook his head. No, I have no idea. She was the golden girl, you know? Everyone loved her. Including Zack? Yeah, they were really close. We heard they often clashed in debates. He shrugged. They had different views, that's all. It wasn't personal. Like I said, Zara never held grudges. One last thing before we go, said Fion. I'm going to ask you again what the fight with Zack was about. The look Adam shot her was pained and furious. Nothing. I already told you. He stood up, his physical size dominating the room. I think it's time you left now. Fionn nodded. We will, just as soon as we've taken your fingerprints. She smiled sweetly at him. Just for elimination purposes, you understand. He's still hiding something, isn't he? said Fionn, as they left Adam's room in Blue Boar and headed back to Tomquad. He's been acting shifty right from the start, said Jake. But Adam's words had touched a raw nerve with him. Coming from a working-class northern background himself, he couldn't help feeling some camaraderie with Adam. 
Is he right about being kicked out of college? But Zack being let off because of his father? He asked. Fion shrugged. Some people like to pin blame for their misfortunes on others. The truth is that Oxford has been bending over backwards in recent years to offer places to students from diverse backgrounds. Look at me. A girl from a Welsh mining village, and... She paused and looked away. I am as diverse as they come, she concluded. They rounded the corner and found the PC guarding Zara's staircase having a lively discussion with a female student. When Jake and Fionn arrived, he turned to them. This young woman says her room is upstairs and she needs to get access to it, but I can't allow her to enter. It's all right. We'll handle this, said Jake. What's your name? he asked the student. Megan Jones. Can I get my stuff, then? You're the student with the room opposite Zara's on the top floor, aren't you? Yeah. Has the college found another room for you? Yeah, some shitty corner of blue boar. Jake suppressed an urge to smile. Moving from the stone cloisters of Tomquad to the concrete bunker of Blue Boar sounded like a fall from grace. Yet he'd actually felt more at home in Blue Boar Quad. It reminded him of the student accommodation he'd lived in when he was at Bradford. Plain, functional, and no nonsense. He didn't really trust the decorative arches and crenellations of Tomquad. It looked too fairy tale, as if it might all disappear in a puff of smoke. Still, he said to Megan, it's good they found you a place so quickly. I'm D.S. Jake Derwent, and this is my colleague, D.C. Fion Hughes. We'll take you upstairs so you can fetch your stuff. We'd also like to ask you a few questions, if you don't mind. Megan seemed to relax at the offer of being escorted to her room. Sure. On their way up the stairs, they passed a seminar room on the ground floor that was being redecorated. What's happening in there? Jake asked. Isn't it a bit odd to get the builders in during term time? I'd have thought they'd wait until all the students have gone home. There was some water damage, said Megan. The room was unusable, so they had to sort it out. On the top landing, she glanced anxiously towards Zara's room, but the door was closed and there was nothing to see. She drew out her own key, but paused before unlocking her room. When she turned to face Jake, her eyes were shining with tears. What happened to Zara? How did she die? I can't give you any further information at this stage, but we are treating her death as suspicious. Her mouth twisted down. I hope you find the bastard who did it. We'll do everything we can, Jake assured her. First, we'd like to know where you were yesterday, and what you saw. Megan pushed into her room and sat down on the sofa, wiping her eyes. Her room was a mirror image of Zara's, only the posters on the wall and the books on the shelves were different. I saw her coming out of the dining hall at half past six, she said, her voice thick. I was just going in, but Zara had already eaten and was rushing off somewhere. She must have been there when they started serving food at six twenty. She stopped and more tears ran down her cheeks. Zara was such a bright student. Her death is such a tragic waste. Jake gave her a moment, then prompted her gently. What then? After dinner, I went back to the library. I had a Latin translation to finish. Tacitus. Bloody awful it was, too. Did you see her again? No, that was the last time. Do you know what Zara was planning to do with her evening? I think she might have been going out, but I don't know where. And what about you? Did you get your translation finished? Yes, eventually. She bit her lip, hesitating. What is it? It's probably nothing, but I came back here about 8.30 to do some reading in my room. I like to read with my headphones on. I finished a bit after 11, and then I went out to see my boyfriend. Anyway, as I was leaving, at about half past 11... I saw Zack banging on Zara's door. How did he seem? He was in a foul mood, actually. I think he was drunk. Nothing unusual there. Did you speak to him? No, I try to avoid him when he's like that. And did Zara open the door to him? No, like I said, I think she was out. But Zack wouldn't give up. He just kept hammering away. 
I left him there. How long did you spend with your boyfriend? asked Fionn. All night. He lives over the road in Pembroke College. I was supposed to have a tutorial at three. I got back to college an hour ago and found out what had happened. Thanks for telling us, said Jake. Can we give you a hand carrying your gear? Please. She gave them a thin smile. Now I think about it, I'll be glad to move out. I don't want to stay on this staircase after what happened. 9. You're too late, muttered Dr. Roy Andrews as Bridget pushed open the door to his office. This time on a Friday afternoon, hospital consultants and registrars were already beginning to disappear for the weekend. But the senior pathologist was old school, and Bridget had been confident he'd still be at work. Sure enough, he was sitting behind his squat desk, scratching notes in his writing pad with a gold fountain pen. A protective clutter of books, papers, and typed reports partially screened him from the outer office. Roy regarded her arrival mournfully over the top of his wire-framed reading glasses, his gloomy hangdog expression belied by his signature brightly coloured bow tie, which protruded above his white coat. Today's bow tie was purple, with a design of tiny buzzing bees. A graduate of Magdalen College, he possessed a sharp mind and an acerbic wit. Other detectives found him difficult to work with, but Bridget liked him. My secretary's already gone home, he told her. It's close of play for this week. That's not like you, Roy. Since when have you been a clock watcher? Always have been. Nothing like being a pathologist to make you realise that time's running out for all of us, he said darkly. Good, then let's not waste any. He finished his writing and folded away his glasses. You're here about the girl, no doubt. Zara Hamilton. I've just shown her body to her parents. Sad business. And you want me to tell you the time of death? That would be helpful. Time of death, cause of death. Any initial thoughts? Can't help you. Not until after I've done the post-mortem. He peered at the computer screen on his desk. Monday morning sound good to you? I was hoping for something sooner. No peace for the pathologist, eh? What makes you think I have nothing better to do on my weekend? Bridget knew for a fact that Roy Andrews was a confirmed bachelor and a workaholic, but it always amused him to play these games with her. You have better company to keep than a corpse? she inquired. Hmm. He sighed, with more than a touch of theatrical melancholy. You're right. I'll come in tomorrow afternoon. Bridget smiled at him. I'll start promptly at two o'clock, if you want to send someone over. I'll be there. She turned to leave. Aren't you going to insist that I give you a provisional estimate of the time of death? He asked even though I have yet to give the corpse more than a cursory inspection. She turned back, one eyebrow raised. All I can say at the moment is sometime between eight o'clock in the evening and midnight. That's an estimate, you understand. I can't be more precise until tomorrow. But you're confident it's between those hours? Have I ever let you down? What about the cause of death? Blunt force trauma. I'm sure that even you could have worked that out. Thanks. I'll see you tomorrow. Don't be late, he cautioned. Time and tide wait for no man. She left the chilly and claustrophobic confines of the morgue behind her and made her way out into the warm summer evening. The bright sunshine seemed wrong after spending so much time in the proximity of death. But evening shadows were already beginning to reach across the hospital grounds, it was five o'clock, and Chloe would have arrived home from school half an hour ago. As she walked back to her car, her phone buzzed, a text from Chloe, presumably in response to the ones Bridget sent earlier. Just going into Oxford to celebrate. See you later. Kiss. Bridget frowned at the screen. Going into Oxford? But what about her plans to take Chloe out? She hadn't actually told her daughter she intended to take her for a birthday meal, of course. She'd simply assumed she would be waiting when she arrived home. She dialed Chloe's number. The phone rang half a dozen times before her daughter picked up. Hi, Mum. 
giggling and chattering in the background. Chloe, where are you? Chill, Mum, I'm on the bus into Oxford. But where are you going? Big sigh. Just out. We might grab a pizza later. But I... It's not like you planned anything for my birthday, did you? I... She should have told Chloe about the Italian restaurant. I'm sorry, I was hoping we could eat out tonight. But actually, I'm really busy in any case. Yeah, whatever. More giggling and chattering. Listen, I've got to go. This is our stop. Chloe? What? Stay safe, and don't be back late. Oh, yeah, I forgot to say. Olivia said we could all sleep at her place. I've really got to go now, Mum. From the traffic sounds in the background, Bridget guessed they'd got off the bus. Call me when you get to Olivia's, so I know you're safe. Yeah, bye. The line went dead. Bridget pocketed the phone and trudged over to her car. She opened the door, only to be tormented by the sweet, cloying smell of melted chocolate cake. Damn. She'd had virtually nothing to eat all day. The smell taunted her all the way back to Kidlington. Most of the team were already back at HQ when she arrived. Ryan and his sub-team had spent the afternoon collecting witness statements from everyone with a room in or around Tomquad. They were busy entering the details into the home's police database. How did you get on? Bridget asked. Ryan studied his notes. We spoke to loads of students. Lots of people saw her at various times and locations yesterday. We should be able to piece together a detailed map of her movements. Everyone knew Zara, and about half of them claimed to be best friends. His tone suggested some scepticism. Any enemies? We didn't hear a single bad word against her. Andy's team was similarly occupied, entering their findings into the database. We took a detailed statement from Sophie, Zara's tutorial partner, he reported. We spoke to people who were in the college bar. Several of them saw Adam there getting pissed. We also managed to get a guest list for the drinks reception at the dean's lodgings. He held up a sheet of letter paper with the college crest at the top. Quite a crowd of bigwigs there last night including the leader of the city council. She left them to it and went to speak to Jake and Fionn, who were just returning from Christchurch. Fionn was striding into the incident room with Jake trailing a few feet behind her. Bridget wondered if they had hit it off, working together. Their body language wasn't encouraging. The bartender at the Oxford Union confirmed that Zack was there last night, said Jake. Zack got into a fight with Adam. We weren't able to speak to Zack or Verity, because they'd already left for the Cotswolds by the time we got to the college. But we went to see Adam again. He admitted he got into a punch-up with Zack, but refused to say what it was about. We also spoke to Megan Jones, the student who has a room opposite Zara's, said Fionn. She was out most of last night, but she saw Zara leaving dinner at 6.30. She thinks she may have been going out somewhere, and, interestingly... She also bumped into Zack later that evening. She paused for dramatic effect. Go on. He was banging loudly on Zara's door. Megan says he was drunk and angry. What time was this? About half past eleven. That's ten minutes after Verity claims he got back to his room. We also learned something interesting in the Oxford Union, said Fionn. Zack and Zara always took opposing sides in debates. And as an aggressive Twitter campaign against one of the speakers that Zack has organised for next week. Katrina Hodgson, the journalist who's always sounding off and defending people. Interesting, said Bridget. Well done. Jake, tomorrow morning you and I will be taking a little trip to the country home of Sir Richard and Lady Hamilton. I want to speak to Zack myself. She turned to Fionn. I hear you're good with computers. Fionn's face lit up. I'd like you to find out all you can about Zara online. What's her social media profile like? Did she have any obvious enemies? And see if you can learn any more about this Twitter campaign. Find out if Zara was involved in any way. Fionn looked delighted to have been given a technical job. Right, said Bridget, looking at her watch. I suggest you both go home and get some rest. It's going to be a long week. With the birthday meal off the table, she fetched herself a coffee and logged onto her computer to read through the case notes and check her emails. Dozens of messages had arrived throughout the day. She scanned through them quickly, 
looking to see if Vic from the Socco team had sent her anything. He had. She opened his message and found a short summary of the team's initial findings, together with a list of all the items that had been collected for further analysis. One interesting detail caught her attention. The team had found a handprint in fresh paint in the ground floor seminar room that was being redecorated. A bloody towel had also been recovered from the same location. Bridget already had a pretty good idea whose handprint it was. She hoped to be able to confirm that tomorrow. Before leaving, she knocked on Superintendent Grayson's glass door and brought him up to date. So far, we've gathered a lot of intelligence about Zara's movements throughout the day and evening leading up to her death. The pathologist has given us a provisional time of death, and we're seeing how that fits with the timeline of events. We've also verified the whereabouts of several persons of interest, and we have a couple of leads. Who? Zara's brother, Zack, had a fight with her ex-boyfriend, Adam Brady, at the Oxford Union yesterday evening. Zack was seen banging on Zara's door later that night, though we can't be sure yet whether that was before or after she was killed. Grayson's brows knitted together. Remember what I said. Tread very carefully, especially with regard to Zack. Don't make a move without notifying me first. No, sir. I met Sir Richard and Lady Hamilton today when they came to ID the body. I'm planning to drive over to the Hamilton's country home tomorrow and talk to Zack again. Also, I've persuaded the pathologist to bring forward the PM to tomorrow afternoon, and forensics should have some preliminary results for us too. We should have a much clearer picture by this time tomorrow. She remembered then what she'd forgotten earlier. The CCTV footage. The memory stick was still in her bag. She'd make sure to get someone to study it tomorrow. She suddenly felt very tired. There were so many jobs to remember, and despite having a great team, the responsibility fell on her. Already the strain of running her first murder inquiry was making her feel exhausted. Just this morning her biggest concern had been the ingredients for a birthday cake. Now she was charged with a matter of life and death. She hoped that Grayson couldn't detect any signs of stress. He fixed her with his dark eyes. Keep me informed. It was gone nine o'clock when Bridget parked her car by the village green in Wolvercote. On this June evening it wasn't yet dark, but the children who'd been playing on the swings were long gone, probably tucked up in bed by now. The lights were on in the village pub and sounds of music and laughter drifted across the green as its doors opened and closed. She carried the box containing the chocolate cake into the empty and silent house. On a day like today, after dealing with a murder inquiry and visiting the morgue, she'd have liked to come home to the sound of Chloe's music playing upstairs, or see her watching TV in the front room. She wanted to ask her daughter how her day had been, wanted to see her, hug her, know that she was safe. She checked her phone for messages, but there were none. She went through to the kitchen and put the cake on the kitchen table next to her swimming kit, which was still sitting where she'd left it this morning. She was far too tired to go swimming now. She was too tired even to cook, or to change out of her work clothes. She was suddenly starving. What had she eaten today? A packet of crisps. She opened the fridge and peered at its brightly lit contents. An open packet of chicken slices curling at the edges, a tub of low-fat cottage cheese past its sell-by date, half a dozen fat-free yogurts, some vegetables and salad. Healthy ingredients? Good intentions. Oh, what the hell! She let the fridge door swing close and lifted the lid off the cake box. Parts of the cake had collapsed. The icing had completely melted and pooled around the bottom of the box. It no longer looked like the sort of cake you could give to someone as a birthday gift. She dipped a finger into the melted icing and licked it. Delicious. She cut herself a generous slab of the cake, poured herself a large glass of Pinot Noir, and took both through to the lounge. She dimmed the lights and switched on the CD player. Soon the staring overture from Mozart's Marriage of Figaro began to soothe her nerves, and she leaned back on the sofa with her feet up. Cheers. She raised her glass. The wine was full-bodied and aromatic, with strong hints of cherry and raspberry. She couldn't think of a better match for the rich chocolate cake. Happy birthday, Chloe. 
she said. It was surprising how much cake she was able to put away, once she got going. Tantor Audio, a division of recorded books, presents Killing by Numbers, an Oxford Murder Mystery, by M. S. Morris. Narrated by Esther Wayne. 1. Gabriel Quinn had spent a lot of time thinking about death. But when it came for him, it didn't happen the way he'd imagined. In his mind's eye, he'd pictured the four horsemen on their steeds, brandishing swords and tridents, trampling sinners underfoot. His dreams had featured deadly plagues, fiery pits and seven-headed monsters. He'd spent hours poring over images of hell and the apocalypse, elaborate images of exquisite detail and craftsmanship, drawn by an artist with a God-given skill that surpassed all others. His girlfriend said he was obsessed. But Gabriel knew that death could be sudden and violent, and in that respect, at least, he wasn't wrong. At first he wasn't sure what had happened. He heard a car horn and smelled burning rubber. Not the trumpet of the Angel of Death not the stink of brimstone. When he forced his eyes open, a big man in a checked shirt with a huge camera slung around his neck was leaning over him. Definitely not St. Peter. Hey, buddy, you all right there? American. A tourist. Gabriel suspected he was far from all right. One minute he'd been cycling along Oxford High Street, and now he was lying in the middle of the road with a searing pain in the center of his chest. Gasping for breath, he squinted at the man's jowly features and tried to figure out what had happened. He'd just come from Jonathan Wright's art gallery, which was displaying some of his paintings along with those of other former students of the Ruskin School of Art. Jonathan was a big supporter of local artists, and liked to promote the work of those at the start of their careers. The exhibition had opened just over a week ago, and sales were looking promising. He'd gone to the gallery to discuss substituting some of the sold paintings for new canvases. With any luck, his embryonic career was about to take off. But then Gabriel had seen something that chilled him to the bone. He had left the gallery in a state. It was imperative that he speak to Todd Lee, who ran the art supply shop on Broad Street. He had to see Todd straight away and tell him what he'd found. That was why he'd been cycling along the high street in such a hurry. It all started to make sense to him now. For weeks he'd had the feeling he was in danger. Call it a gut reaction or a sixth sense, whatever you like. A creeping sensation that caused him to look over his shoulder every other minute. Whenever he glanced around, there was always someone with a camera or an iPhone pointed in his direction. Spies. That's what they were. That woman in the red summer coat outside the university church who'd pointed her lens in his direction while he was unlocking his bicycle. He'd instinctively put up a hand to avoid being photographed. The couple eating ice creams who'd swerved into his path as he wheeled his bike onto the road. The bearded man in the gallery peering at him while he talked to Jonathan. It was impossible to distinguish innocent bystanders from those who were involved. And now this latest discovery. He had to speak to Todd. Shaking with nerves, he jumped on his bike and pedalled away as fast as he could, overtaking the open-top sightseeing bus that had stopped to let people on and off. And then what had happened? He remembered signalling right and pulling into the centre of the road, ready to turn into Turl Street. But then a car had pulled up on his left-hand side. A black car. The driver's window was lowered. Gabriel had looked at the man and noted the close-cropped hair the two-day-old stubble, the designer sunglasses, Ray-Bans, and the single black stud earring. He had an acute eye for detail and could have drawn the man's likeness in a matter of minutes. It was a gift. But then he'd seen the barrel of the gun, aimed straight at him. Death was not riding a pale, skeletal horse, but driving a Toyota. Everything seemed to happen at once. A sudden, sharp pain, the smell of exhaust fumes as the car sped away, the world turning upside down as he lost control of his bike. 
landing on the road with an almighty thump. And now a growing crowd of people, following the lead of the American tourist, leaning over him. Oh my God, Frank, he's been shot. Look at the blood on his chest. This from a short blonde woman who is presumably the American tourist's wife. Dial 911, quick! It's 999 in England, Martha, said Frank, reaching for his phone. Numbers. 911. 999. It's important to know the right number, thought Gabriel. If he was going to die, and his chances right now were looking less than 50-50, he had to tell someone what he'd discovered. He tried to speak. He's saying something, said Martha. She knelt down beside him and leaned in close. What is it, honey? Gabriel didn't know if he was making sense. His mouth was so dry he could hardly talk. His vision was starting to blur and sounds were becoming muffled. It took all his strength to form the words. What's that? asked Martha. I couldn't hear you. Gabriel tried again. L-794-682-35. Hang on, let me write that down. He did his best to repeat the number. Then everything went black. Two. Did you remember to pack your toothbrush? Yes, Mum, stop fussing. Detective Inspector Bridget Hart pulled off the Wolvercut roundabout onto the Woodstock Road and joined the flow of traffic heading towards the centre of Oxford. Her fifteen-year-old daughter, Chloe, was in the passenger seat clutching her overnight bag on her lap and typing rapidly on her phone with two thumbs. And toothpaste? They'll have toothpaste. I guess so. It wasn't really the toothbrush, or potential lack thereof, that was making Bridget so anxious. It was the idea of Chloe taking the train to London on her own, and staying overnight with Bridget's ex-husband, Ben, and his new girlfriend, Tamsin, who was ten years younger than Bridget, and, Bridget imagined, ten pounds lighter. Rationally, she told herself that Ben was Chloe's father, and if Chloe wanted to have a relationship with him, then she shouldn't stand in her daughter's way. It was just that where Ben was concerned, Bridget found it hard to be rational. She harboured a deep-seated, visceral antipathy to her ex-husband, based, not unreasonably, on the fact that he had cheated on her, multiple times, during their brief marriage, so that she now found it impossible to trust him, even where Chloe was concerned. She gripped the steering wheel and silently cursed a bus that pulled out in front of her. "'Are you all ready for this evening, Mum?' asked Chloe, interrupting Bridget's uncharitable train of thought. Miraculously, her daughter appeared to have put her phone away and was making conversation. Bridget knew she should be delighted by this rare occurrence, but the way Chloe asked the question made her squirm in her seat. "'This evening? You mean going to the opera with Jonathan?' "'I mean your date with Jonathan?' said Chloe, in an exasperated tone of voice that implied Bridget was a hopeless case where men were concerned. She probably had a point. "'Yes, I'm all ready. But I wouldn't call it a date as such. What is it, then? We're just going to see a production of La Boheme at the new theatre, that's all.' She signalled right and turned into Beaumont Street. An elegant couple descended the steps of the Randolph Hotel and climbed into a waiting taxi. A group of foreign schoolchildren were staring at their phones outside the Ashmolean Museum, indifferent to Oxford's antiquities. "'Sounds like a date to me,' said Chloe. "'Yes, well, I suppose so.' Bridget stopped at the red light outside Worcester College. She had met Jonathan, very briefly, for the first time a couple of weeks ago. Her sister Vanessa had invited them both to Sunday lunch in the hope of doing a spot of matchmaking. For the happily married Vanessa with her doting husband, two perfect children, one of each, adorable dog and comfortable family home, Bridget's single status seemed to be a constant source of anxiety, a problem needing to be fixed. But after dropping Chloe off at Vanessa's that day, Bridget hadn't been able to stay for lunch because she was in the middle of a murder inquiry. A student found dead at Christchurch, so she'd only got as far as saying a quick hello to Jonathan. 
Afterwards, Chloe had told her what a great person he was. Jonathan had then invited her to the opening night of a new exhibition at his art gallery on the high street. She'd gone along, at Chloe's insistence, and had enjoyed half an hour chatting to him. But then she'd had to leave early after receiving an urgent call from her sergeant. Such was the life of a detective inspector with Thames Valley Police. "'You should go for it, Mum,' said Chloe, in the voice of one who seemed to be an expert on affairs of the heart. "'Go for what?' Bridget wondered. She didn't like to ask. Still, she'd made an effort to tidy her little house in Woolvercott in anticipation of inviting Jonathan back for a nightcap. She'd even put clean sheets on the bed, although that was probably over-anticipating things. This was only a trip to the opera, after all. A first date, if you must. She pulled into the train station car park and skillfully reversed her red mini into the narrow space left by two much bigger cars— she loved her little car. It was nippy, easy to park, and a lot more reliable than her ex-husband. Small is beautiful, she thought. It was something she told herself on a regular basis, in view of the fact that she measured only five foot two at full stretch. Chloe, on the other hand, was already, at fifteen, an impressive five foot six. In this respect, at least, it looked as if she was going to take after her father. They crossed the footbridge over the Botley Road, and Bridget bought Chloe a return ticket from one of the machines in the station entrance. Phone me when you get to Paddington, won't you? Just so I know you've arrived safely. Yes, ma'am, and I promise not to talk to any strange men on the train. Bridget was about to say something in response when she saw that Chloe was grinning at her. She hugged her daughter and gave her a kiss. Have a lovely time. You too, ma'am. She watched as Chloe went through the ticket barrier and disappeared from view. She really must try not to turn into one of those tiresomely neurotic mothers, always worrying and nagging about the least little thing. Her own mother had been terrible in that respect. But then that was hardly surprising after what happened to Bridget's younger sister, Abigail. As Bridget turned to leave, her phone began to vibrate in her bag. She glanced at the screen before answering— Chief Superintendent Grayson. God, that man had a knack of choosing the wrong moment. She was due at the hairdresser's in half an hour, an emergency appointment to touch up a few grey strands that had just started to appear, like unwelcome intruders, in her medium brown bob. She had stared at them in disbelief in the mirror, wondering how they could have suddenly materialised, just when she was about to go on her first date in years. She wasn't even forty yet. Hello? She stepped outside the station, straight into the path of the smokers congregating there to light up. D. I. Hart, we've got an incident on the high street. Grayson always dispensed with pleasantries and got straight to the point. What sort of incident? She waved away the smoke from a nearby cigarette and walked down the steps. The air there was probably even filthier, thanks to the diesel fumes from idling taxis. Cyclist killed. Isn't that a job for the traffic cops? Accidents involving cyclists were an all-too-common occurrence in a city with hundreds of students riding bikes. Sometimes it was the fault of the car driver, sometimes the fault of the cyclist. Deaths were rare, but not unheard of. Reports say he was shot. Bridget stopped walking. Shot? Gun crime in the city of Dreaming Spires was practically non-existent. Uniform from St. Aldate's are down there now, but this looks like a murder, and I need a detective to take charge. Isn't anyone else available? I'd like you to lead the investigation. I see. She ought to have been pleased that she was his first choice to head up the case. It had been a long, hard slog to get to this point in her career. Having a child at a young age had held her back. Now, with Chloe less dependent on her, she'd finally started to make a go of things, recently leading her first murder inquiry. That had been touch and go at times, with Grayson wanting to take her off the case and replace her with a more experienced detective when things started to heat up. But she'd fought her corner, kept the case, and ultimately solved it. Grayson had even congratulated her and her team in the end, but she still felt as if she needed to prove herself to him to demonstrate that the last case hadn't been just a lucky fluke. She took a deep breath. 
How would the chief super react if she told him it was her day off and she had a hair appointment? Somehow she didn't think he would be understanding. I'll get down there right away, she said. Keep me updated. Grayson ended the call. On the way back to her car, she called the hairdressers to cancel. 3. A shooting was such a rare event in Oxford that Bridget wondered what she was going to find when she arrived at the scene. This wasn't a tough inner city. Any guns in this part of the world were typically used for shooting pheasants and partridges. Grayson was demonstrating considerable confidence in her, assigning the case to her instead of one of the more experienced detectives like Davis or Baxter. She hoped she was up to the challenge. As she turned on to St. Aldate's, the dome of Tom Tower loomed up ahead, reminding her of her previous case, the murder of a female student at Christchurch, her first murder investigation since being promoted to detective inspector. She would never be able to visit the college or the cathedral again without thinking of the beautiful and intelligent young woman who had been battered to death. Such a tragedy. With Trinity term now over, the undergraduates had left the city, or gone down, in Oxford speak, making way for an influx of summer students and conference guests who would stay in rooms overlooking idyllic quadrangles and dine in great halls. At this time of year there was also a huge surge in tourists who flocked to Oxford from all over the world, drawn by the city's renown as home of the oldest university in the English-speaking world, and by its medieval architecture and dreaming spires. But Oxford wasn't all punting and poetry. The traffic, for one thing, was diabolical. St. Holdate's was, as usual, heaving with double-decker buses, made worse by the fact that the police had sealed off the top of the road at Carfax, so that no one could turn onto the high street. A hapless traffic cop who looked new to the job was doing her best to reroute buses down Queen Street. Bridget managed to manoeuvre the Mini around the obstacle course of buses, showed her ID to the officer guarding the crossroads, and was granted access to the high street. A couple of marked police cars were slewed across the road, their blue lights flashing. An ambulance stood with its rear doors open, but no siren sounding. When life had expired, there was no urgency to get back to the hospital. She could see that armed police had been called in and were conducting a search of the area, going in and out of the shops and cafes along this stretch of the high street. They would be concerned that the shooter might still be at large. With the traffic stopped and pedestrians being held at bay, there was an eerie silence to the centre of the city, normally bustling with life. A bright orange Subaru parked next to the ambulance could mean only one thing. Detective Sergeant Jake Derwent must already be here. She'd worked with him on the last case and appreciated his down-to-earth manner. She pulled up behind his car and soon spotted him standing head and shoulders above everyone else around. At six foot five, he made her feel like even more of a midget than usual. He was interviewing a group of bystanders about the incident, scribbling in his notebook. He spotted her approaching, and a welcoming smile spread across his face. "'Morning, Mum.' He stooped slightly when he spoke to her. "'I was just taking a few witness statements.' "'Good. What's the situation so far?' Jake frowned at his notebook. "'No one's completely sure what happened.' At first, people thought that the cyclist had been knocked off his bike. But then Mrs. Harris over here... He pointed towards a middle-aged woman who was being comforted by a man, presumably her husband, with a huge camera slung around his neck. Noticed that he'd been shot. They called the emergency services. Let me speak to them, said Bridget. She approached the couple, who looked badly shaken but seemed only too happy to cooperate. The man shook her hand with an iron grip and introduced himself as Frank Harris, retired bank manager from Houston, Texas. His wife's name was Martha. She was a small, round woman who made Bridget think of homemade apple pie. Frank explained that they'd been in London and this was their first day in Oxford, where they would stay a couple of nights at the Randolph, before moving on to Stratford-upon-Avon, then York and Edinburgh. The usual tourist trail. We just come out of that quaint little street over there, drawled Frank, pointing towards Turl Street. And I was saying to Martha we should go take a look at the university church and maybe climb the spire to get a good view. 
when this cyclist topples off his bike and lands on the road like a sack of potatoes. It all happened so quickly, didn't it, Martha? Martha nodded her head in agreement. That poor boy. I went over to him and asked if he was all right, continued Frank. But then Martha noticed the red stain on his chest and said he'd been shot. That's not the kind of thing we expected to see in England, did we, Martha? We certainly didn't. She dabbed her eyes with a handkerchief. And did either of you see who fired the shot? asked Bridget. How could a man be shot in broad daylight in the middle of Oxford High Street without someone seeing or hearing something? I noticed a black car, said Martha. Don't ask me what make it was, because I don't know English cars, but it pulled up next to the cyclist right before it happened, and then it sped away like a bat out of hell. Didn't it, Frank? It sure did. It was going that way. Frank pointed towards Carfax Tower. With Corn Market permanently closed to traffic, and Queen Street open only to buses, Bridget deduced that the car must have gone down St. Aldate's, the way she had just come. "'What about the driver?' she asked. "'Did you see who was behind the wheel?' Both Frank and Martha shook their heads. "'Sorry, we didn't get a proper look.' "'And what time was this?' Frank thought for a moment. "'Just after eleven o'clock, I think.' That's right, honey, confirmed Martha. We'd stopped for a coffee at that nice little cafe on Turl Street. And you looked at your watch, Frank, and said we should get a move on if we wanted to avoid the crowds at the university church. Thank you, said Bridget. That's very helpful. Oh, there was one other thing, said Martha. What was that? Well, before he... Before he passed away, the poor boy tried to speak. What did he say? Well, that's the strangest thing. It was a number. Can you remember what it was? Sure. Martha reached into her handbag and pulled out a little pocket diary. I wrote it down here so I wouldn't forget. She put on her reading glasses, which were hanging on a gold chain around her neck. It was actually a letter followed by a string of numbers. L seven nine four six eight two three five. He repeated it twice and seemed very keen that someone should know it. He didn't say anything else? No. Bridget turned the number over in her mind, but it didn't mean anything to her. It seemed like a very odd thing to utter with your dying breath. It might be significant, or it might not. It was too early to tell at this stage of the investigation. Make a note of that number she told Jake. Then see if you can find anyone else who saw a black car accelerating away from the scene. Bridget thanked the American couple for their help, and instructed a uniformed officer to take their statements. Then she braced herself to approach the white screen that had been erected around the victim. A dead body was never an easy thing to look at, especially when the death had been violent. Dr. Sarah Walker, forensic medical examiner, was kneeling by the corpse, doing her final checks. Meanwhile, the head of the scene of crime team, Vikram Vijayaragavan, better known as Vic, was busy taking photos of the deceased and his injuries. Bridget kept back so as not to get in the way and contemplated the dead man. He was young, no more than mid-twenties, with a thin, pallid face framed by a wispy beard. His clothes— faded jeans, fraying white t-shirt, and worn plimsolls, suggested someone who didn't spend a lot of time on his appearance, or perhaps couldn't afford to. The overall effect was one of fragility. In the middle of the t-shirt a red stain had bloomed and spread, like one of those ink-blot psychological tests. There were other spots of colour on the fabric, blue, green, purple, that might have been paint. The bicycle lay to one side, apparently undamaged. It was a rusty old thing with a bell on the handlebars and threadbare tyres. On seeing Bridget, Dr. Walker rose to her feet. A similar age to Bridget, Sarah Walker was single, and, unlike Bridget, her career had not been held back by the inconvenience of children. They had worked together briefly before, and Bridget found her polite, serious, and, above all, professional. Bridget would have liked to get to know her better, ideally over a glass or two of wine, 
but the circumstances of their meetings invariably involved a corpse and little opportunity for small talk. Hi, said Bridget. Any conclusions so far? It was rare for a medical examiner or pathologist to make any firm pronouncement at the scene of the crime, but Bridget was always hopeful. A single gunshot wound to the chest at close range, said Dr. Walker gravely. The bullet either entered the heart itself or tore one of the coronary arteries, resulting in massive hemorrhaging. The victim would have bled out very quickly. We'll know more when Roy Andrews does the post-mortem. Dr. Roy Andrews was the senior pathologist at the John Radcliffe Hospital, a lugubrious Scot with a taste in fancy boat eyes. A bullet right in the heart? queried Bridget. What are the chances of that happening? Dr. Walker smiled enigmatically. That's not my department. It might have been the victim's unlucky day, or maybe the shooter knew exactly what he was aiming for. Vic joined them. The victim had a small amount of cash in his back pocket, but no credit cards or any other form of ID. He held up a couple of plastic evidence bags. I bagged up his phone for you. And there's a key. But it doesn't look like a standard house key. It's too small. Thanks, said Bridget. A phone was always a big help in identifying a victim and finding next of kin. Can we move him to the morgue now? asked Dr. Walker. Please do, said Bridget. The sooner they cleared the street and reopened it to normal business, the better. Ma'am, Jake strode towards her, accompanied by a man in a bus driver's uniform and a young woman with a mobile phone. I've been speaking to the driver of the tour bus. He confirmed seeing a black car speeding away from the scene. Says it was a Toyota. And this lady, he indicated the young woman, has caught the car in a video she was filming from the top of the bus. The open-topped double-decker bus was parked to one side. Its passengers dispersed. It's not a great video, said the woman. She held her phone out and pressed play. The film showed the view from the top of the bus as it approached Carfax Tower. The voice of the tour guide was just audible in the background, explaining how the tower was all that remained of the 12th century St. Martin's Church, and how no new building in the city was allowed to be taller than Carfax Tower. About thirty seconds into the video, a black Toyota overtook the bus and pulled up alongside a cyclist. An arm emerged from the car window holding what looked like a gun. It wasn't possible to see any more of the driver from this angle. A sound like a loud click followed, and the cyclist toppled from his bike. Then the car accelerated away from the scene at high speed, and the video came to an abrupt halt. I had to slam my brakes on, the bus driver was saying. Or I'd have run over him. Bridget thanked the woman who'd taken the video and turned to Jake. Get that sent over to Fion at Kidlington, and see if she can enhance it to get the number plate. Detective Constable Fion Hughes was the best person Bridget had in her team when it came to computer skills. I'm on it, said Jake. Now all we need is to identify the victim, said Bridget, more to herself than anyone in particular. Someone must know who he is. I think I might be able to help with that, said a familiar voice behind her. Bridget turned in surprise to see Jonathan, her date for the evening standing there. He must have come from his art gallery, which was just down the road opposite the university church. Her heart did a little somersault at the sight of him. He really was quite a dish in his open-necked shirt and tortoiseshell glasses. Did you know him? she asked, trying to keep her voice level. Jonathan nodded, looking miserable. He was with me at the gallery just before this happened. His name is Gabriel Quinn. He's an artist. 4. Jonathan seemed badly shaken by what had happened, and Bridget accompanied him back to his gallery, keen to hear whatever he could tell her about Gabriel Quinn. She had first visited Jonathan's gallery less than a fortnight earlier, enjoying a glass of wine and chatting to her host on the opening night of his latest exhibition, which was still currently on display. But an unfortunate discovery in the River Thames had put an end to that, calling her away on urgent police business. 
It seemed that whenever she met Jonathan socially, their encounters were destined to be brief. But today's meeting was strictly business, and she felt slightly awkward in her formal capacity as detective inspector in a murder inquiry. Especially when she and Jonathan were supposed to be going to the opera together this evening. She touched the top of her head lightly, hoping he wouldn't notice the grey hairs. The white walls of the gallery were filled with contemporary oil paintings and some limited-edition prints. Jonathan's eclectic tastes matched Bridget's own, and she would have loved to buy one of the really eye-catching works. But with her floor-to-ceiling bookcases and extensive CD collection of mainly opera, there was hardly any room left on the walls of her tiny home. Vanessa, her sister, had a house big enough to take the sort of artwork normally seen only in the National Gallery— but the paintings in Jonathan's gallery were far too bold for her sister's taste. Everything in Vanessa's home had to coordinate with the soft furnishings. Jonathan ushered her inside and bolted the door behind them, turning the sign on the door to closed. The last time Bridget had been here, a crowd of people had filled the space. But today, with the high street cordoned off by the police, it was empty apart from a young woman sitting behind the counter— she had corkscrew curls tied back in a bushy ponytail, and wore a worried expression on her pale, lightly freckled face. "'It wasn't Gabriel in the accident, was it?' she asked, jumping to her feet as they entered the shop. "'I'm afraid so,' said Jonathan. "'Bridget, this is Vicky, my assistant.' Vicky suppressed a sob and held a handkerchief to her eyes. "'He was such a sweet, gentle person.' How could someone run him over like that and then just drive off? Hit-and-run drivers make me sick. Bridget already knew that this was no hit-and-run incident. More like a shoot-and-run. But she didn't want to reveal too many details just yet. Vicky, this is Detective Inspector Bridget Hart, said Jonathan. She's... He seemed to hesitate, and Bridget wondered if he was about to introduce her as his date for the evening. "'Investigating what happened.' "'Vicky smiled at Bridget through her tears. "'Can I get you a cup of tea or a coffee, Inspector?' "'The day was hot, and Bridget realised she was parched. "'She was supposed to be at the hairdresser's now, "'getting her grey strands touched up, "'browsing a celebrity gossip magazine. "'She only ever read them at the dentist's or the hair salon, "'and enjoying a complimentary cappuccino. "'Thanks. Just a glass of water, please.' "'There's a bottle of San Pellegrino in the cool room, my office,' said Jonathan. "'Maybe you could bring us all a glass, Vicky.' "'Sure,' said Vicky. Bridget turned to Jonathan. "'You said Gabriel was an artist. Do you have any of his paintings on display?' "'Actually, I do. He's one of half a dozen artists whose work I'm showcasing at the moment. They're all former students of the Ruskin School of Art in Oxford.' That's just down the high street, isn't it? Yes, the Ruskin School is next to the university examination schools. This group of artists graduated about five years ago. They're all up and coming, but the art world's a very precarious business. Most people who study fine art end up becoming art teachers in schools, or else they retrain as accountants. He gave her a wry smile. It's hard for young artists to make a name for themselves so I try to support any that I think have real talent. Let me show you Gabriel's work. He led her over to a wall hung with six brightly coloured canvases. These pieces are all his. Bridget contemplated the paintings and found that they had a strangely mesmerising effect on her. Hypnotic patterns of colour covered the canvases, drawing the viewer in so that it was hard to look away. The patterns were abstract, but seemed to suggest figures or faces that were just out of focus. On closer inspection, she saw that the paintings were made up of thousands, if not millions, of tiny dots. They must have taken ages to produce. Gabriel was very interested in numbers, said Jonathan. You might say it was something of an obsession. This series of paintings all have numbers in the title. Bridget examined the labels next to the canvases. The paintings had titles like Two Million and Thirty Six, or Two to the Power of Thirty Eight. What do the numbers refer to? she asked. That's part of the painting's mystique, said Jonathan. Gabriel attached deep significance to his work, 
but I can't say I really understood the mathematics behind the images. Bridget remembered the number that Gabriel had spoken as he lay dying in the middle of the road. She pulled her notebook out of her bag. Does he have a painting called L79468235? Jonathan shook his head. I haven't come across that one, but it's possible it's something new he was working on. Gabriel was a real perfectionist. I imagine he'd hate anyone to see an unfinished work. He'd probably prefer it to be destroyed. Oh, well, it was worth a try. Bridget put her notebook back in her bag just as Vicky reappeared with three glasses of sparkling water on a tray. Bridget accepted a glass and took a grateful gulp of the refreshing liquid. Was Gabriel a successful artist? she asked. His paintings were all priced between three hundred and five hundred pounds, depending on their size. Two of them had red dots on the accompanying cards to show that they had been sold. That depends on your definition of success, said Jonathan. None of the artists here are famous names yet, but if any of them had the potential to make it big, it was Gabriel. As you can see, I'd already sold a couple of his paintings. That's why I invited him round this morning, to speak to him about getting some new ones in to replace them. And how did Gabriel seem this morning? Did you notice anything unusual? Well, he could be a bit of an oddity at the best of times. Perhaps he did seem a little on edge, but he was always rather shy and introverted. He wasn't a great talker, but there were hidden depths in that head of his. I always liked him, said Vicky, who had resumed her seat behind the counter. He was very modest, despite being so talented. One or two of these others, she indicated the work of the artists on display, seem to think they're God's gift and should be worth millions. Gabriel was never like that. Where did he live? asked Bridget. Did he have any family? He never mentioned any family, said Jonathan. He lived alone on a boat on the Oxford Canal. La Belle Dame. Let me write the name down for you. He wrote the name on the back of a postcard that showed one of Gabriel's paintings. The postcards were stacked on the counter, next to a Sotheby's catalogue. I could also give you the phone number of his former tutor at the Ruskin School of Art, if that would be helpful. She might be able to tell you more about him. Thanks, said Bridget. Jonathan checked on his phone and wrote a number on the back of the postcard. Her name is Dr. Melissa Price. Bridget dropped the postcard into her bag. It was a reproduction of the painting she'd liked best, the one titled Two to the Power of Thirty-Eight. She herself was thirty-eight. Not such a bad age. Could she justify buying the painting for her tiny house? It was relatively small and would just fill the space above the sofa, not to mention hiding the cracks in the plaster. But this was a murder investigation, not a shopping spree. Her team would be waiting for her at Thames Valley Police Headquarters in Kidlington. Not to mention Chief Superintendent Grayson, who would want an update as soon as she entered the building. She finished the rest of her water. Thanks for your help. I'd better get going. Jonathan unbolted the door and stepped outside with her. Are we still on for this evening? Bridget hesitated. She really wanted to go to the opera with Jonathan. La Boheme was one of her favourites. But she'd probably be up to her ears in work now. The first twenty-four hours on a case were always crucial. I'm not sure, she said. I'll have to let you know. Sorry. He nodded understandingly, but she could see the disappointment in his eyes. This would be the second time she had let him down. Her work was developing a habit of coming between the two of them. I'll be in touch, she said. The high street had reopened, and her mini was creating an obstacle for the buses, taxis, and cyclists jostling to get past. A bus tooted its horn at her as she returned to the car. She fixed the driver with an angry glare. A carelessly parked car was hardly a matter of life and death. 5. Before setting off for HQ, Bridget checked her phone for messages and was alarmed to discover two missed calls from Chloe. She'd been so preoccupied for the last couple of hours that she'd completely forgotten about her daughter. What sort of mother did that make her? 
She pressed quick dial and waited anxiously for Chloe to pick up. What if she'd been mugged at Paddington? Knife crime was a growing problem in the capital. What if Ben hadn't turned up to collect her and she'd been left on her own? This seemed a more likely scenario. Hi, Mum. The voice on the other end of the line sounded bright and chirpy. Not mugged, then. She really must stop anticipating the worst all the time. Is everything all right? asked Bridget. Yes, of course it is. Why wouldn't it be? It's just that you called twice, and I didn't pick up because I'm in the middle of a new case. When I saw you'd called, I got worried, and— Chill, Mum! Everything's good. I was just calling to let you know I'd arrived. Like you asked me to? Chloe added with only a slight hint of reproach in her voice. It was supposed to be reassuring, knowing that your offspring were just at the other end of a phone call. But somehow it added to the stress of being a parent, this constant need to stay connected. Part of Bridget wished for a simpler, more innocent age. "'Where are you now?' she asked. "'In a cab heading up to Highgate.' "'Did Dad meet you at the station?' "'No, I got into a car with a strange man.' Ominous pause. "'Of course Dad met me at the station. Stop freaking out, Mum.' Bridget realised how annoying she was being. She recalled similar exchanges with her own mother, although, of course, they had taken place without the benefit— or curse, of a mobile phone. Why was she subjecting her daughter to the same treatment? Sorry, it's just that I've had quite a stressful morning. I thought you were going to the hairdressers. Change of plan. Well, don't change your plans for this evening. Do you want to speak to Dad? Not really, thought Bridget. But she didn't want to spoil Chloe's good mood. All right, then. Put him on. She could hear Chloe handing over the phone and then Ben's voice, loud and confident as always. Hi, Bridget. How are things? Oh, you know, she thought, just dealing with a murder inquiry. And worrying about my teenage daughter. Fine, she said. Good. Great. Listen, gotta go. We're just arriving at the house. And don't worry, I'll look after her and make sure she's on the right train tomorrow. Enjoy your evening. And with that... Ben ended the call. For a moment, Bridget sat with the phone in her hand, breathing heavily. Speaking to Ben always made her so uptight. Even now he had the power to upset her, just by the casual way he acted, as if his serial infidelities had been nothing more than an oversight on his part. His cheating had dealt Bridget a body blow, leaving her vulnerable, with a young daughter to bring up single-handedly, knocking her career into the slow lane, of course it hadn't held Ben's career back one jot. He had moved to London and now held a senior position with the Metropolitan Police. What angered her most was that he had never once apologised for his behaviour. She was still waiting after all these years for him to say the words, I'm sorry. She put the phone back in her bag and told herself to relax. Ben was far away and she was a D.I. now with an important case to solve. Chloe would be fine, and she wouldn't thank Bridget for checking up on her every five minutes. And there was still just a chance that she might make the opera with Jonathan this evening. She looked at her watch. God, it was already gone too. Grayson would be twitching for an update. She was surprised he hadn't already called her. She turned the key in the ignition and set off for Kidlington. Thames Valley Police Headquarters was located about three miles north of the Oxford Ring Road in the sprawling village of Kidlington. It took Bridget half an hour to drive there from the city centre up the Banbury Road, and by the time she arrived she was starving. She had promised herself a healthy salad for lunch in town, but like the rest of her plans for the day, that had come to nothing. She grabbed a coffee, a bag of crisps and a chocolate bar from the vending machine before heading into the main incident room. She was pleased to see that Jake had got things organised and was working alongside Fionn Hughes, the young Welsh detective constable who had joined the team for the last case, causing heads to turn whenever she strode into the office in her skin-tight green motorcycle leathers. A small team of detectives had assembled in the incident room, starting to gather together the initial witness statements, the scene of crime evidence, and the mounds of paperwork that would hopefully lead them to the killer. Bridget recognised Ryan Hooper and Andy Cartwright two sergeants who had worked with her before. That was good. With a familiar team in place, they would be able to hit the ground running. 
Although Ryan could be a bit of a joker, he was a hard worker and a good police officer, and Andy was always solid and dependable. So, what have you got for me so far? she asked, tearing open the bag of crisps. Salt and vinegar had been the only flavour left in the machine. It was her least favourite, the smell reminding her of a particularly dreary childhood holiday by the sea and pool, Dorset, spent mostly sheltering from the wind and rain. "'I managed to enhance the number plate of the car in the video,' said Fionn in her sing-song Welsh accent. "'And I've got a match from the database.' As well as being enviably slim and stunningly good-looking with her elfin features and pixie haircut, Fionn was rapidly gaining a reputation as the office tech wizard. "'The vehicle is a Toyota Prius, registered to a car hire company in East Oxford.' Fionn wrote the number plate, make and model on a piece of paper and handed it to Bridget. "'Wow, good work,' said Bridget. "'Jake, can you get over to the car hire company right away and get the driver's details?' "'Will do.' "'What else do we have?' "'The body's in the morgue,' said Jake. "'And I've arranged for the post-mortem to take place first thing on Monday. "'Vic and the Socorro team have filed the physical evidence from the scene "'and we've interviewed all the witnesses. "'None of them said anything you haven't already heard.' "'Okay,' said Bridget. "'I've got an ID for the victim. "'Gabriel Quinn, an artist living on a boat on the Oxford Canal. "'That key he was carrying is probably the key to the boat.' We'll go and check it out next. She looked around the room. Everyone was busy, staring at screens, typing at their keyboards. She didn't want to interrupt them now, but she would gather everyone together for a briefing after speaking to the chief. Any ideas about the string of numbers that Gabriel uttered before he died? She asked. We've been giving it some thought, said Jake. We have a few ideas. It might be a bank account, said Fionn. Bank accounts have eight digits, although Gabriel's number has a letter before it. "'What about a telephone number?' asked Ryan, who had come over to join them. Ryan rarely passed up an opportunity to spend time in Fionn's vicinity. "'No, telephone numbers have ten or eleven digits and start with zero, said Fionn, batting away Ryan's suggestion like an unwelcome insect. "'What about a driving license? he suggested, sounding less hopeful. Sixteen alphanumeric characters,' said Fionn dismissively. "'A passport number, then? Nine digits,' said Fionn, shaking her head. "'It could be a company registration number,' suggested Jake. "'They have eight digits.' "'Or the serial number for a boat,' said Fionn. "'Or an eight-digit barcode.' "'Okay, I get the picture,' said Bridget. "'A bit of investigation needed, I think. "'Can I leave that with you, Fionn?' Let's get this hire car checked out first. I'm on it, said Jake, grabbing his jacket and heading for the door. Bridget made a call to Vic and arranged for a team to go and look over Gabriel's canal boat. She planned to join them and see for herself where Gabriel had lived, but she'd barely replaced the receiver before she heard Chief Superintendent Grayson's stentorious tones summoning her into his office. She gulped down a last mouthful of cold coffee and headed for the glass fishbowl that was the Chief Super's domain. Grayson sat behind his enormous desk, his back bolt straight, drumming his fingers impatiently on the polished surface. He was never an easy man to please. Bridget took the chair opposite, hoping that her progress so far would be enough to placate him. Although Grayson had praised her success at solving the case of the murdered student at Christchurch, and had even stood the team around at the pub as a token of his appreciation, Bridget knew she couldn't afford to bask in past glories. All that mattered now was how quickly she could get on top of this new murder. "'Give me the essentials,' he said. "'Well,' said Bridget, "'the victim was a young man, mid-twenties, by the name of Gabriel Quinn. "'He appears to have been shot at point-blank range from a car on the high street. "'We've identified the vehicle as a Toyota Prius, "'belonging to a car hire company in East Oxford. "'Sergeant Jake Derwent is on his way there now to get details of the driver.' Hmm, said Grayson. Any idea what kind of weapon was used? Not yet. Hopefully ballistics will be able to tell us more. But one thing strikes me as odd. Yes? No one reported hearing a gun being fired. I know that it was a busy location, but I've seen a video of the incident, and all I could hear was a noise something like a loud click. 
not the deafening crack you'd expect from a normal firearm. I'm thinking that the shooter may have used a silencer. Sounds like a gangland execution, said Grayson, furrowing his brow. A professional hit? Not your usual Oxford crime, at any rate. Who was this Gabriel Quinn? What do we know about him? He was an artist. An artist? Grayson's tone suggested that he classed artists along with other social misfits, subversives, and generally worthless individuals. Bridget suspected that his politics were not very liberal. What on earth is an artist doing getting himself shot? What sort of artist was he anyway? Bridget reached into her bag, pulled out the postcard of Gabriel's painting, and passed it across the desk. Grayson grunted unenthusiastically. The chief super was evidently not a big fan of modern art, or perhaps art of any kind. The only pictures on display in his office were photographs of himself on various golf courses, and one of him and his wife at an official function in the town hall with the city's mayor. It's called Two to the Power of Thirty-Eight, she told him. What in God's name is that supposed to mean? The title is part of the work's mystique, she said, quoting Jonathan. She felt strangely compelled to defend the artist's work, whether because she'd felt drawn to it herself, or because Jonathan was clearly a fan, she wasn't sure. Jonathan told me that Gabriel was very interested in mathematics, and in numbers in particular. Jonathan? Bridget felt her cheeks growing hot. The gallery owner who identified the victim. Grayson studied her for a moment before pushing the postcard back across the desk. Bridget quickly tucked it away in her bag. "'If you say so,' said Grayson. "'Can't say art galleries are my thing. The wife likes them.' He glanced at the photograph of Mrs. Grayson on his desk. "'But I prefer golf courses myself.' "'Yes, sir.' Bridget paused, wondering if she should mention the other fact relevant to the case. Would Grayson even consider it to be relevant? "'There was one other thing.' Yes. Just before he died, Gabriel communicated an eight-digit number to a witness on the scene. Grayson looked as if this latest piece of information confirmed all his worst suspicions about artists and their ilk. What does the number refer to? We don't know yet, admitted Bridget, but it's one line of inquiry. I hope you've got others. Certainly. Like I said, Sergeant Derwent is on his way to the car hire company, and I'm about to go down to Gabriel's canal boat. Socko should be there already. The post-mortem is scheduled for the first available slot. Good. You didn't have any plans for the weekend, did you? Bridget thought with longing of the opera, which she was almost certainly not going to see after all. No, sir. Nothing important. 6. Bridget would have liked to take Jake to accompany her to the canal boat. She appreciated his calm and level-headed nature. But with Jake out at the car hire company, she chose Fionn instead. It was always good to have two pairs of eyes when visiting a site that might hold clues to a crime, and Fionn's emerald green eyes were as sharp as they came. The young detective constable slid effortlessly into the passenger seat of the Mini, like a cat folding itself into its basket. Clad in skin-tight black trousers and a leather jacket, she seemed so lithe and supple. Bridget wondered if it was natural, or if she practised yoga in her spare time. Bridget had tried a yoga class once and had barely been able to walk for a week afterwards. But it wasn't hard to imagine Fionn sitting for hours in the lotus position at a mountain-top retreat. There was something aloof and detached about the Welsh woman. Despite working closely together on her previous murder case— Bridget still felt she hardly knew Fionn at all. "'How are you settling into Kidlington?' she asked as they drove down the Banbury Road into Oxford. Fionn had transferred from the Reading office just a couple of months ago. It wasn't always easy settling into a new work environment, especially as a woman, and Bridget wanted to be the sort of boss who supported other women at the start of their careers. "'It's fine,' said Fionn brightly. "'Getting on all right with the rest of the team?' By that, Bridget primarily meant Jake and Ryan. Despite the equality and diversity training they all underwent these days, office banter could still be very male-orientated, 
and if left to themselves, the guys could easily lapse into a discussion focusing largely on football, beer, and girls. Bridget guessed that the subject of DC Fionn Hughes, as one of the few female detectives on the team, might sometimes enter into their debate. "'I think I can handle the boys,' said Fionn, a distinct note of amusement in her voice. "'I'm sure you can,' thought Bridget, smiling to herself. She had no doubt that Fionn would put them in their place if they ever stepped out of line. She turned the car into Beaumont Street, following the same route she'd taken that morning with Chloe. What was Chloe doing now? Out with Ben in London, no doubt. And with Tamsin, too. What kind of impression would Ben's new girlfriend be making on Chloe? Tamsin was so much closer in age to Chloe, they might have a lot in common. Bridget sincerely hoped not. She wanted to keep Chloe all to herself. The girl was growing up so fast, she only had three more years left at school, and then she'd be off to university. Or maybe she would want to go backpacking around the world instead. Either way, she'd be gone. Bridget's heart lurched at the thought. She parked in Worcester Street Public Car Park, slotting the Mini into a tight corner that had been avoided by other drivers. From there they headed down to the nearby canal, picking up the towpath by the bridge over Castle Mill Stream, an offshoot of the River Thames. This was where the canal started, or ended, depending on how you looked at it. With the gently flowing stream on one side and the tree-lined canal on the other, a feeling of tranquillity descended as soon as they left the bridge behind, even though they were still just a stone's throw from Oxford's traffic-laden streets. Bridget quite fancied the idea of living on a canal boat herself, being able to sail away to a new location whenever she felt like it. La Belle Dame was moored a few hundred yards from the bridge, next to another boat called Dragonfly. Unfortunately, La Belle Dame was no longer very belle. The red paintwork was peeling, and the hull revealed distinct patches of rust. The grime on the windows was so thick in places that it was impossible to see inside. Dragonfly, on the other hand, was in pristine condition, and looked like a contender for the Britain in Bloom competition. The deck and roof were a riot of flowering pot plants of every shape and colour, from vivid violets to summery yellows and strident reds. Their fragrance wafted over Bridget as she walked along the towpath. The green-fingered owner of the boat, a middle-aged woman with silver hair, was sitting on a deck chair amongst her horticultural charges, anxiously watching proceedings on La Belle Dame as the Socco team went about their business searching for any clues as to why someone would have shot dead its owner. "'Hello,' called Bridget. "'You must be Gabriel Quinn's neighbour. She introduced herself and Fionn. The woman got to her feet and stepped nimbly off the boat onto the bank. Dressed in faded pink dungarees over a man's checked shirt, and with a large straw hat perched lopsidedly on her head, she was every inch the true English eccentric. Bridget wondered what Superintendent Grayson would make of her. The woman extended a cautious hand. "'I'm Harriet Watson, but everyone calls me Hat.' Her accent was local, with a strong rural flavour. She drew out the A in Hat, adding a hint of an R to the vowel sound. Bridget shook her hand, which was hard and calloused. Bridget supposed it was a tough life living on a canal boat— Hat was probably in her late forties or early fifties, but her weathered face made her look older. "'I let the police have a key to Gabriel's boat when they turned up and told me what had happened. "'I can't believe it. Is it true?' Harriet seemed flustered and on the brink of tears. "'I'm sorry,' said Bridget. "'But I'm afraid it is.' "'Oh, dear!' Harriet pulled an enormous handkerchief from the pocket of her dungarees and dabbed at her eyes. The poor boy. How long had you known, Gabriel? We've been neighbours on the canal for five years, ever since he first started living on the boat, said Harriet. We kept an eye out for each other. When you live afloat, it's special, you see. Not like living in an ordinary house. Did Gabriel have any relatives? Harriet shook her head. I don't think so. He inherited the boat from an elderly uncle, but he never mentioned any other family. I got the impression his parents were dead. What about friends? 
Well, we're all friends here on the canal. You have to be when you live on board a narrow boat. You could say we're a tribe. We all help each other as much as we can. But Gabriel was shy. He didn't talk much to the other boaters. Any special friends? asked Fionn, who was busy inspecting Hat's pot plants. There was a girlfriend who used to come round now and again. Gabriel was besotted with her, but to be honest, I had my doubts. I used to say to him, Gabriel, go carefully with that one. But he was in love. Anyone could see that. She didn't live with him, this girlfriend? No, she said the boat was too cramped for her. Life on board a narrow boat's a lot harder than people think. It doesn't suit everyone. Harriet sniffed to show her disapproval. And what is the girlfriend's name? Amber. I don't know her surname. She does a bit of modelling for the art school. You know, life drawing, that sort of thing. I suppose that's how Gabriel met her. He was such a talented artist. He could paint or draw anything. Have you seen any of his work? Yes, I have, said Bridget. You're right, he was very talented. And he was starting to make a name for himself, I understand. Harriet nodded. Not that he wanted to be famous. Gabriel wasn't like that. He was dedicated to his art. You never met anyone with so much talent who was so modest. And he wasn't a bit materialistic either. Well, you can't be, if you live on a narrow boat. Bridget guessed that was true. And on a day like today, with the sunlight dappling the water and the narrow boat bobbing lazily up and down, she could easily see herself fitting into the lifestyle of a boater, free of the clutter that weighed down most people's lives. Vic, the head of the Socco team, emerged from the interior of La Belle Dame, and Bridget took the opportunity to finish her conversation with Harriet. Here's my card. If you think of anything that might be relevant, please do give me a ring. Harriet tucked the card inside the top front pocket of her dungarees. Of course, Inspector. Bridget could feel Harriet's eyes following her as she walked the short distance along the bank to La Belle Dame. The narrow boat shifted gently under her weight as she boarded it. Vic was on deck, removing the white gloves from his hands. All done here, he said. Feel free to take a look inside. We've swept the place for fingerprints and DNA. Find anything interesting? Bridget asked. She was glad his team had finished their work. She always looked ridiculous if she had to don a white plastic socko suit. Well, I would say so, he said wryly. The guy who lived here was clearly a bit on the weird side, if you ask me. In what way? Go and see for yourself, he grinned, and Bridget descended the steps into the dimly lit cabin of the boat, closely followed by Fion. What on earth? Whatever Bridget had expected to find inside the boat, it wasn't this. She had never been inside a canal boat before, but now she saw why they were called narrow boats. The cabin space was extremely cramped, with barely enough room for her to pass the other members of the Socco team, who were filing out one by one. Even for Bridget, who normally didn't mind small spaces and never had a problem with legroom and flying economy, the interior of the boat made her feel slightly claustrophobic. But that wasn't what had surprised her. Every available inch of wall space, and some of the window glass too, was stuck with pieces of paper covered in numbers, symbols, equations and diagrams, all in tiny handwriting. No wonder Amber hadn't wanted to move in. It looks as if our murder victim had something of a mania for maths, said Fionn examining the strange collage of paper sheets. Bridget peered closely at some of the crazy scribblings, but she could barely decipher any of them. Fionn, on the other hand, seemed to be able to make some sense of Gabriel's writing. She pointed at some sheets pinned up in the narrow galley kitchen. Look at this. He's written down the Fibonacci sequence and drawn a spiral to show how it works in geometry. I once saw something like this superimposed on the Mona Lisa indicating how Leonardo da Vinci used geometric principles to plan his portraits. Remind me what the Fibonacci sequence is, said Bridget. It's a sequence of numbers where each number is the sum of the two preceding ones. So you get zero, one, 
one, two, three, five, eight, and so on. Thanks, I think. Fionn really was a fount of interesting facts, and Bridget was very glad she'd brought the DC with her. Talking of paintings, there aren't any here. Gabriel must have done all his art somewhere else. The canvases she'd seen in Jonathan's gallery that morning would have filled the tiny living space in the boat with no room to spare. There is this, said Fionn, indicating a postcard fixed above the table in the main seating area. Bridget leaned in to examine it. The image was nothing like the brightly coloured canvases from the gallery. Instead, the postcard showed a black-and-white drawing of a disgruntled-looking female figure, surrounded by an assortment of seemingly random objects. With gloved hands, Fionn unpinned the postcard from the wall and turned it over. Melancholia One, by Albrecht Dürer, she read from the back. Does that mean anything to you? Bridget asked her. He was a German artist from the Renaissance period, but that's all I know about him. Apart from the papers covering every surface, there was little else to see. Gabriel seemed to have owned very few material possessions. The tiny kitchen cupboards contained only a few rudimentary cooking utensils, a couple of chipped plates, mugs, and a handful of mismatched cutlery. The sleeping quarters were pokey, to say the least, and the sitting area was upholstered in an old tartan fabric that gave the place a dismal air. Bridget was quickly coming to the conclusion that life on a canal boat might not be so romantic after all. A fold-out table was stacked with a pile of books. Bridget sifted through them, glancing at the titles. They all appeared to be about art and mathematics. A strange combination, her view. Yet, judging from the number of books in the pile, not everyone shared her opinion. You studied mathematics at university, didn't you? she said to Fionn. Computer science. But there's a lot of overlap between the two subjects. Everything that happens inside a computer is just binary arithmetic and logic. It was remarks like that, mused Bridget, that turned her off the subject. The language of mathematics had always felt dry and cold to her, not to mention largely incomprehensible, whereas the arts were all about feeling and emotion. Deep down she craved the passion of opera, the highs and lows of human experience. She moved aside the last book in the collection to reveal a small poster advertising a public lecture at the Maths Institute in Oxford. Numbers in Art and Nature with Professor Michael Henderson. The date and time of the talk had been circled in red ink. Today at five o'clock. Presumably Gabriel had been planning to attend. Bridget knew there and then that she wasn't going to make La Boheme. There would be no passion for her tonight, of either the operatic or the romantic kind. She would be going to a maths lecture instead. 7. Life was good. Detective Sergeant Jake Derwent drove his Subaru Impreza around the Oxford Ring Road, munching on a Snickers bar, the latest album from the killers blasting from the car's souped-up speakers. When he'd taken this job six months back, he'd been reeling after the breakup with his long-term girlfriend, who he'd followed south when she got a job in Oxford. He'd been in half a mind to return north to his native Leeds in West Yorkshire. He wasn't sure he belonged in Oxford, with its medieval colleges, dusty libraries and black-gowned academics, some of whom seemed to speak Latin as a first language. But something had held him here, and made him stick at the job. Pride, probably, if he was honest. Not wanting to return home, admitting defeat. And Oxford hadn't beaten him yet. His mates up north could tease him all they liked about becoming a soft southerner, but Jake knew differently. Even with his detective sergeant's salary, he could only afford to rent a one-bed flat above a laundrette on the Cowley Road, sandwiched between an Indian restaurant and a Chinese takeaway. Some of his former schoolmates had actually managed to get themselves on the housing ladder, buying Victorian terraced houses in Leeds, which would cost three to four times as much in Oxford. But he wasn't complaining. At least his flat was convenient for getting his washing done, and he didn't have to go far for a tasty meal. Right now he was riding high on the success of the last case, a high-profile murder which had hit the national headlines. 
Chief Superintendent Grayson had personally commended his bravery in what had been a hair-raising situation. Even the sharp-tongued Fionn Hughes, not known for her words of praise, had said he'd done all right. He'd seen a real hint of admiration in those stunning green eyes of hers, and it had sent a shiver down his spine. If he could impress Fionn, he could impress anyone. And D.I. Hart was a good boss, always giving credit where it was due and never afraid to get stuck in herself. Yes, on the whole, Jake thought he'd made the right decision to stay in Oxford. He turned off the eastern bypass and drove into a bland industrial estate comprising warehouses, builders' merchants, and self-storage units. Yeah, Oxford wasn't all dreaming spires, by any means. He located the anonymous-looking car hire company situated next to a fencing and decking specialist. A high-end global brand this company wasn't. He parked on the forecourt and went into the single-story building where a girl on the reception desk was flicking through a magazine with a bored expression on her face. She glanced up when Jake appeared and hid the magazine under the counter. Can I help you? She gave him a bright smile which showed the braces on her teeth. She didn't look much older than sixteen. Detective Sergeant Jake Derwent from Thames Valley Police. Jake held out his warrant card. I'm looking for some information about one of your customers. At the sight of the warrant card, the smile slid off the girl's face, and her heavily mascarad eyes opened so wide they made Jake think of spiders. What do you want to know? she asked. I'd like you to tell me who hired this car. He produced a piece of paper with the Toyota's number plate and slid it across the counter. She stared at it glumly without touching it. I'm not sure. We're not supposed to give out customer information. Data protection, you know. This is a police matter. I'll have to ask my manager, she said, sliding off her seat. Can you wait here? She vanished into a room at the back of the office and reappeared a minute later, half hidden behind a man in rolled-up shirt sleeves and a loose tie. Thank you, Millie, said the new arrival. He strode over and placed his hands on the counter. Now, what's this all about, then? I'm Jason Spooner. I'm the managing director here. Jake introduced himself and showed his warrant card again. Mr. Spooner, we'd like you to provide us with some information about one of your vehicles. He indicated the sheet of paper on the counter. It appears that the vehicle in question was used to carry out a serious crime, and we need to trace the driver urgently. Spooner frowned. What sort of crime? I'm afraid I can't tell you that, sir. However, we have video footage of the car in question being driven away at high speed from the scene. The manager digested the news with obvious scepticism, but instructed the receptionist to find the details on the computer. Millie did as she was told. The car was hired yesterday, she said, looking up from her computer screen. It hasn't been returned yet. Do you have the driver's details? asked Jake. Yes, said Millie. Shall I print them off? She looked for confirmation to her manager, who nodded, his hairy arms folded across his chest. I've got a copy of his driving license, too, she said, volunteering some assistance for the first time. Thanks. Jake gave her a quick smile and took the printouts from her. The manager walked Jake to the door as if determined to make sure he left the premises. Listen, mate, he said as Jake was leaving. We run a legit business here, and we don't want any trouble. Whatever this guy's gone and done with one of our cars, it's got nothing to do with us. Understand? Jake nodded politely. He wondered if it would be worth tipping off the local trading standards office to take a close look at the company's operations. They would be sure to find something dodgy. But that wasn't really Jake's concern. Thank you for your assistance, Mr. Spooner. I'm sure you have nothing to hide. Back outside, he studied the information Millie had printed for him. The car had been hired by a Mr. Edward Davis, with an address in Headington in East Oxford. Jake couldn't believe it had been so easy to track down the driver. Now he just had to get back to the station and report his news. It looked like he was going to be the hero of this case, too. Luck was with him today. He wondered if he might push it a little further and ask Fionn if she was doing anything this evening. They could go for a drink or catch a film. Who knew how far things might go? He jumped back in the Subaru, 
pushed the start button and grinned as the car flashed eagerly to life. 8. I'm really sorry, said Bridget, calling Jonathan to explain that the investigation had ruled out all possibility of going to the opera that evening. Jonathan was always very understanding, but even he must be starting to have doubts about the wisdom of dating a police detective. That word again. Dating. Fat chance of the two of them ever going out on a proper date. All she'd managed today was to interview him as part of a police investigation. She could imagine how horrified Chloe would be at the news, and what her sister Vanessa would say. You'll never get a man if you don't make the effort. But how much effort was Bridget willing to make to get a man, even one as sweet as Jonathan? It took all her energy just being a single mum with a demanding career, and after the way Ben had let her down, she still wasn't sure that she would ever truly be able to trust another man. But then Jonathan's calm voice came over the line, interrupting her thoughts. Just make sure you catch the person responsible for Gabriel's death. He was such a lovely young man, and a very talented artist. Vicky and I are very upset about what's happened. I'll do my best, she said. The lecture was in the Mathematical Institute, a new building on the Woodstock Road next to the 18th-century Radcliffe Observatory. The huge foyer, empty apart from an abstract sculpture in the middle of the floor, resembled an airport lounge without the seats or perfume counters. The woman on reception directed Bridget down the stairs, where the feeling of being in an airport was only enhanced by the open-plan café, tables and chairs, and expanses of glass and steel. The doors to the lecture theatre were just closing as Bridget rushed to take her place in the auditorium. She found one of the last remaining seats at the back of the large, semi-circular lecture theatre, surprised at how full it was. She herself had studied history at Oxford and hadn't done maths since she was sixteen. She doubted she'd be able to solve a quadratic equation any more. In fact, she could barely remember what they were. No doubt Chloe would be able to tell her. Or Fionn. She dropped Fionn back at the office before coming to the lecture, but maybe she ought to have brought her along. Too late now. The lecture was about to start. The title of the lecture was Numbers in Art and Nature. Professor Michael Henderson, tutorial fellow in pure mathematics at St. John's College, took to the stage to a polite smattering of applause. A greying man in his mid-fifties, Professor Henderson had the unmistakable air of an Oxford academic— wearing the obligatory tweed jacket with leather patches on the elbows, so beloved by his kind. He crept onto the stage and stood behind the lectern with the dusty air of someone who had spent too much time in libraries. Yet, despite his unprepossessing appearance, the professor proved to be an enthusiastic speaker who communicated his subject with passion. An opening slide appeared on the large screen, bearing a single question— what do numbers have to do with art and nature? At first glance, the answer to this question may not be obvious, began the professor. You might think these subjects have little in common, or perhaps nothing. You read my mind, thought Bridget, intrigued. By the end of this lecture, I hope to convince you that the answer is everything, or at least that they are strongly connected. For what is art? other than the exploration of space, form, volume, and pattern. And what is my own subject, mathematics, except precisely that? Henderson paused, giving the audience a moment to reflect on his words. Does anyone here know what the golden ratio is? A few hands in the audience went up. Professor Henderson nodded appreciatively. The golden ratio was first discovered by Pythagoras in the 6th century BC, and has inspired great thinkers from the astronomer Kepler to the artist Leonardo da Vinci to the architect Le Corbusier. It has been called the golden section and the divine proportion. It is a number that appears naturally in geometric studies of two-dimensional shapes and platonic solids, and is regarded by many artists and architects as the most pleasing proportion to the human eye. Images of various ancient buildings appeared on the screen, 
including the Great Pyramid of Giza, and finishing with the Parthenon of Athens. A rectangle was superimposed on the outline of the Greek temple. No prizes for guessing that the ratio of the breadth to the height of many classical buildings is the golden ratio, remarked the professor. Bridget found her interest piqued. The professor's enthusiasm was quite infectious. The next image to appear was Leonardo's famous drawing of the Vitruvian man, his arms outstretched and legs apart, so that his fingers and toes just touched an inscribed circle and square. Here we see that the golden ratio is also linked to the ideal human form. Images from nature followed on screen, including a sunflower and leaves growing on a plant stem. Look here, and here, intoned Henderson, pointing at various parts of the images. In each case, nature itself is conforming to the rule of the golden ratio. The professor went on to talk about the Fibonacci sequence, which Fionn had found a reference to in Gabriel's boat. Bridget soon began to lose track of the details, but even she joined in the laughter at the discussion of Fibonacci's rabbits and their out-of-control procreation, illustrated by an animated slide showing one pair of rabbits joined by successively more offspring until rabbits filled the entire screen. Now, let's look at an example of how a Renaissance artist incorporated mathematical concepts into a work of art, said the professor. After what Fionn had said about the Mona Lisa, Bridget was expecting the next slide to be a painting by Leonardo da Vinci. Instead, she was surprised to see the same image that she had found on the postcard in Gabriel's canal boat. The curious picture seemed to defy any simple interpretation. The main figure in the scene was a gloomy, winged woman who sat with her head leaning on her fist, glowering darkly into the distance. The rest of the image was cluttered with a bizarre assortment of creatures and objects, including a cherub busily writing, an emaciated dog asleep at the woman's feet, a ladder, a rainbow, an hourglass, a lethal-looking knife with a serrated edge, and what looked like a block of marble cut into an odd three-dimensional shape with the hint of a ghostly image on its front face. The professor smiled mischievously, as if he knew the reaction the strange image would evoke in his audience. Here we have Melancholia I, by the German artist Albrecht Dürer. Dürer was a painter and printmaker from Nuremberg in the late 15th and early 16th centuries with connections to Raphael, Bellini, and Leonardo. He was famous for his exceptionally detailed woodcut prints and engravings. He was also very interested in mathematics, and wrote a book on geometry and another on human proportions. Melancholia is his most widely studied and debated work. Bridget felt a sense of awe at the skill and craftsmanship that had produced this engraving. But the message it was intended to convey was a mystery to her. Let's look at some of the references to maths and geometry that Dura incorporated into this work, said the professor, his enthusiasm reaching new heights. As you can see, the figure personifying melancholy is holding a pair of compasses in her right hand. And this sphere? He pointed his laser at a sphere positioned in front of the sleeping dog. Has a radius equal to the distance marked by the compass. He paused a moment while the audience digested what he was saying. Now, look at the top right of the image. Does anyone know what that is? He pointed his laser at a grid of numbers that Bridget hadn't noticed at first. So cluttered was the image. It's a magic square, called a voice from the audience. Correct, said the professor. Full marks. This is a four-by-four four magic square where every row, column, and diagonal adds up to thirty-four. Bridget did a couple of quick calculations in her head and found it to be true. The numbers, which appeared at first glance to be random, did indeed add up to thirty-four, whichever column or row you looked at. And not only that, continued the professor, but the corners of each quadrant total thirty-four, and any number added to its symmetric opposite equals seventeen. Fascinating, thought Bridget. But what does it all mean? And now we come to the most hotly contested part of the image, said the professor, 
aiming his laser at the three-dimensional geometric shape that looked strangely out of place next to the cherub, hourglass, and old-fashioned weighing scales, like a twenty-first-century sculptor that had intruded on a sixteenth-century work of art. This is a truncated rhombohedron, which has become known as Dura's solid. Some of the greatest minds in mathematics have tried to determine its geometric properties— but no one seems to be able to agree on the ratio between the long and short diagonals of the rhombi, which just goes to show that sometimes even mathematics can be controversial. A titter of laughter passed through the hall. Bridget glanced at her watch. She was definitely starting to lose the thread of the lecture now. But how are we to interpret this image? asked the professor. Jura himself said that the keys and purse hanging from the belt of the figure's dress represent power and wealth, so I think we can say that he was an artist who understood business and the need to put food on the table. But there seems to be more to it than that. Some argue that the personification of melancholy represents the muse who is fearful that inspiration will not return. All around her are the tools needed to craft a work of art— but instead of applying herself, she sits slumped in a slough of despond. But, on the other hand, maybe Jura is telling us that melancholy is a normal, even necessary, part of the creative process. Jura was influenced by the humanist thinkers Agrippa and Ficino, who associated melancholy with genius. And whatever interpretation we may put on this enigmatic image, I think we can all agree that it is, indeed, a work. Of genius. Thank you. The audience broke into appreciative applause, which Professor Henderson acknowledged with a slight bow. After it had subsided, Bridget made her way down to the front of the lecture theatre, battling against the tide of people heading towards the exits in the opposite direction. It had been an interesting talk, but she was really here to see what the Professor knew, if anything about Gabriel Quinn. She waited while a trio of bespectacled teenagers quizzed the professor on the more esoteric parts of his lecture. When everyone had finally left, Bridget approached the professor, holding out her warrant card. Detective Inspector Bridget Hart, I wonder if I could have a word, Professor. Professor Henderson appeared startled by the sight of her ID, as if he half expected her to arrest him and drag him off in handcuffs. His confident manner quickly drained away, and he once again became a shy, retiring academic. He tugged nervously at the sleeves of his tweed jacket. Up close, Bridget noticed that one of the sleeves was badly frayed. She hastily put her card away. Nothing to be alarmed about. I just wanted to ask you a few questions. Henderson didn't look very reassured. I am not used to police officers asking me questions after my talks. I don't suppose you're here to ask about the golden ratio? She guessed he was trying to make a joke. No, I'm afraid not. Some of the mathematics was a bit beyond me, I have to admit. Oh. The professor seemed disappointed by her response. It's not always easy to pitch these public lectures at the right level. Some members of the audience are quite knowledgeable, others less so. A certain disdain had crept into the professor's voice. It was obvious which category he thought Bridget fell into. He stuffed his notes into an old briefcase. So, what did you want to talk to me about? Do you know a young artist by the name of Gabriel Quinn? A look of concern crept across the professor's face. I do, as a matter of fact. Why? What about him? I'm sorry to have to tell you that he was killed this morning in Oxford. We believe that he was killed deliberately. Killed? You mean murdered? The professor's face blanched and his shoulders slumped. I wondered what had happened to him. I was expecting him to be here this evening. Gabriel usually attends all my lectures without exception. I'm sorry to bring you such bad news. Is there somewhere we can talk? Yes, of course. Come up to my office. We can talk there. 
She followed him through the public parts of the building, through a maze of corridors to a tiny room on the second floor. The desk in the office was piled high with books and papers, but Bridget's attention was caught by a canvas hanging on the wall behind. It was smaller than the one she'd seen in Jonathan's gallery, but was unmistakably one of Gabriel's works. Colourful, mysterious, and mesmerising. Please have a seat, Inspector. Professor Henderson removed a stack of books from a chair, taking the seat behind the desk himself. Gabriel killed, you say? Can you tell me how it happened? Bridget didn't see any harm in telling the professor the bare facts of the case. They would be in the public domain very soon, anyway. He was shot while cycling along the high street. Shot? By a gun? Sorry, that's a stupid thing to say. Obviously with a gun. And yet, this is Oxford. Gabriel was a painter. Why would anyone shoot him? Henderson stopped. That's what you're investigating, of course. Sorry, I'm talking too much. It's just the shock of hearing the news. Please, go ahead and ask your questions. Bridget nodded at the painting on the wall. I see you're a fan of Gabriel's. How did you know him? The professor leaned back in his chair. Now that he was behind his desk, he seemed to be recovering some of the ease and self-confidence he had displayed while giving his lecture. You might say that Gabriel was a fan of mine. An admirer, perhaps. That painting was a gift from him. Gabriel was very interested in mathematics, you see. His paintings often have hidden meanings based on numbers. This one is called In Search of the Missing Numbers. If you look closely, you'll see that the painting contains the integers from one to a thousand, but with a handful of them missing. As well as posing a challenge to the viewer to identify which numbers are missing, one is encouraged to speculate on what might have happened to them. He smiled awkwardly. That's what Gabriel told me, anyway. It rather brightens the place up, don't you think? Bridget agreed that it did. So tell me, Professor, how did you and Gabriel first meet? Henderson steepled his fingertips under his chin. Let me see, it must have been around eighteen months ago. Yes, that was it. He came to a public lecture I gave, and afterwards he came up to speak to me. He wasn't a mathematician, but it was immediately apparent that he had an affinity with numbers, an instinctive gift for mathematical language, if you like. And he was bursting with questions. He intrigued me, and so I invited him to join me for a coffee. He told me about his paintings and about the principles underlying his quest to express beauty. One does sometimes meet such characters. People with no formal schooling in the subject, but who study by themselves— they can be quite exhilarating to talk to, but also very obsessive, with peculiar ideas. Gabriel struck me as odd, certainly, but also as an exciting young man with so much natural talent. I have to say he made a refreshing change from some of my own students. Formal education can sometimes dampen intellectual curiosity, unfortunately. The professor fell into a quiet, pensive mood. Gabriel, dead, he muttered. I really can't take it in. Did you meet him again? prompted Bridget. Yes, uh, several times. We would go out for coffee, and sometimes he would email me, at all times of the night, with questions about numbers and whatever theory he was currently working on. I was always happy to help. That painting you showed during the lecture— the one with the strange woman surrounded by all the objects. You mean Dura's Melancholia One? It's technically an engraving, of course, not a painting. Right. Gabriel had a copy of it on the wall in his boat. Ah, yes, said Henderson. That doesn't surprise me at all. In fact, it was Gabriel who first introduced me to Melancholia One. He was a big fan of Dura, for obvious reasons. Because of Jura's interest in numbers? Not so much an interest, more like an obsession. Bridget retrieved the mysterious number from her bag. In the moments before his death, Gabriel was very concerned to communicate a number. Does this mean anything to you? 
She read out the number. L79468235. And Professor Henderson wrote it down on a piece of graph paper he had to hand. Hmm, he said jiggling his pen between the first and second fingers of his right hand while frowning at the number. Well, technically, this is a numeral, not a number. Meaning? Sorry, said Henderson, just a pedantic point. There's a difference between a string of digits and the number they represent. For example, a one and a zero would be interpreted by most people as ten. But in binary, those two digits have the value of two. So this is a numeral, denoting a number. Right, said Bridget, feeling lost. And is it significant in any way? Every number is significant in some way, continued Henderson. He began to jot down scribbles on his paper. I can tell you straight off that this isn't a prime number, and it isn't part of the Fibonacci sequence. However, all eight of the digits are unique. That is, they occur only once in the sequence. Is that important? It could be, said Henderson, and then again it could be a complete red herring. I see. And, of course, there's the letter at the start. That might indicate that this isn't really a number at all, but some kind of code or reference. Do you have any idea what it might be? Not immediately. I'll tell you what, why don't you leave it with me and I'll have a think about it. If I come up with any ideas, I'll let you know. Bridget gave him her card. One last thing. Can you think of any reason why someone would want to kill Gabriel Quinn? Henderson spread his hands across his desk. No idea at all. Human behaviour is an unpredictable mystery. Give me the certainty of mathematics any day. Thank you for your time, Professor. She rose to her feet. I'll leave you in peace now. Far from it, Inspector Hart. You've just set me a mathematical challenge to solve. I assure you that I shall be thinking about your mysterious number all evening. Back at Kidlington, Detective Constable Fionn Hughes was busy running searches on her computer, Bank accounts, payment card numbers, company registration numbers, all kinds of numbers with eight digits. She would have liked to accompany Bridget to the maths lecture, but hadn't been asked. Never mind, she already had plenty of work to do, and was in her comfort zone investigating Gabriel's mysterious number, and pondering his notes from the canal boat. Fibonacci's sequence, the golden ratio, theories of linear perspective, and Euclidean geometry— not the usual sort of thing you encountered in police work, and a refreshing change for someone with an interest in the subject, like Fion. The guys in the office were engaged in their usual adolescent behaviour, with Ryan Hooper in particular trying to attract her attention. She took no notice. She'd already given Ryan a brutal put-down when he'd asked her out on a date a week or two ago, but some guys just didn't seem to get the message. If he asked her again, she might simply tell him he wasn't her type. On the other hand, maybe she wouldn't. With men like Ryan, there was no point giving them a reason. You simply had to say no. The door to the incident room crashed open and she looked up. Jake Derwent rushed in, brandishing a sheet of paper like it was a winning lottery ticket. He bounded over to her desk, holding the paper out for her to see. Found something? she asked casually suppressing a smile and dropping her eyes back to her computer screen, her fingers flying over the keyboard at breakneck speed. Look. He slapped his trophy down on her desk. She couldn't help but like Jake Derwent. Unlike Ryan, who was always adopting a pose and doing his best to look cool, Jake was quite charmingly guileless. He was like his car, eager, unsophisticated, and straight-talking. He reminded her of her first and only boyfriend— who she dated at school for a short while before deciding she liked girls, too. She glanced back up at him and was rewarded with an ear-to-ear -ear grin. "'I just got back from the car hire company,' he announced breathlessly. "'These are the driver's details. I managed to get a copy of his driving license, complete with his address.' On the other side of the office, Ryan's face turned to thunder. "'Nice work,' she told Jake. 
She tapped in the details from the ID and executed a search with a few deft clicks of the mouse. Okay, Sherlock, she said. Do you want the good news or the bad? Good news first, said Jake, starting to look less sure of himself. Well, the good news is that the driver's license checks out. Mr. Edward Davies is registered on the system with an address in Headington. And? And the bad news is that he died in 2002. 2002? Oh, I guess it wasn't him driving the car, then. No, probably not. The sound of Ryan sniggering was loud enough to carry across the office. So perhaps Mr. Davis isn't our shooter after all. Fionn thrust the photocopied license back at Jake. Nice try, though. Never mind, mate, said Ryan, standing up. Harry and I were just about to head out for a beer. We're meeting some of the lads at the King's Head to watch the match. Want to join us? Jake sighed, his eyes no longer able to meet Fionn's. Yeah, go on, then. I think it's time to call it a day. Fionn watched them go. Beer and football. It was no less than she had expected from them. She pulled on her green leather motorcycle jacket and headed for home. By the time Bridget returned to the station after the maths lecture, it was already getting late. What had she achieved today? She'd spoken to an eccentric woman who lived on a canal boat surrounded by her pot plants, and a helpful, if annoyingly erudite, professor of mathematics. Jake had called her from a noisy pub to say that the driver had used a fake ID, effectively shutting down their best lead. And Fionn had sent her an email reporting no progress on the mysterious eight-digit number. A talented young artist was dead. But nobody seemed to have the faintest idea why anyone would want to kill him. She entered her notes for the day into the home's database and left work feeling downbeat. Even listening to La Bohème and her car on the way home did little to raise her mood. It just reminded her that she'd missed her date at the opera with Jonathan. Her first real date in years. Since she'd divorced Ben, in fact. It hadn't been the opera she'd been looking forward to so much as Jonathan's company. She'd let him down twice now. Maybe he wouldn't bother asking her again. Returning home to Wolvercote along the Godstow Road, she drove over the Oxford Canal. It was still just light enough to make out the colourful shapes of narrowboats moored along the canal bank for the night. She carried on to the village green and parked the mini outside her little terraced cottage, turning off the opera and the car's headlights. Twilight settled silently around her, and with it came a sense of peace. She liked living here. Tucked inside the northwest corner of the Oxford Ring Road, Wolvercote still had the feel of a village, set apart from the bustle of the city centre. The children's swings in the centre of the green were quiet at this time of night, but sounds of weekend revelry drifted through the open doors of the pub opposite. A man walking a dog ambled past, probably on his way back from Port Meadow. Bridget let herself into the house and shut the door. It was way too quiet without Chloe at home, and the house felt strangely empty. There had been no more text or call, so Bridget assumed Chloe was too busy enjoying herself to bother getting in touch with her mum. A red light blinking on the home phone indicated that someone had left a message for her. She pressed play and listened as her sister's voice addressed her. Bridget? Hi, it's Vanessa here. I don't want to interrupt your visit to the opera with Jonathan this evening— Vanessa could barely suppress her breathless excitement. But I just wanted to check that you're on for lunch at our place tomorrow. Such a shame Chloe can't come, but I expect she's having a super time in London. The message ended with a long beep that echoed around the empty house. Bridget dropped her bag in the hallway and went through to the kitchen where the unwashed breakfast things still waited for her in the sink. She'd intended to see to them after her trip to the hairdresser's, something else that she had failed to achieve today. Turning her back on the washing up, she pulled open the fridge door and started hunting for something that wasn't too far past its use-by date. She found some leftover takeaway chicken tikka masala that didn't smell off, and shoved it in the microwave to reheat. She was always meaning to cook homemade food with fresh, wholesome ingredients, and had even asked for, and received from Vanessa, 
an Italian cookery book for Christmas. Even you'll be able to manage these recipes, Vanessa had said. So far she hadn't got past reading about calorie-laden pasta sauces and dreaming of sun-drenched Tuscan hillsides. The book was starting to gather dust on the top shelf in the kitchen. The microwave pinged, and Bridget retrieved her reheated meal. She poured herself a large glass of Pinot Noir from a bottle she'd started the night before, and took her supper for one into the lounge, where she put on a CD of Pavarotti singing popular Italian arias, a birthday present from Chloe. Comfort music to go with the comfort food. She turned it up to full volume and let the tenor's rich tones embrace her. At midnight, with the bottle of wine empty and the soaring cry of Vincero, 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 finally lifting her spirits, she climbed into her freshly laundered bed alone. I will win, she thought to herself. I will win. 9. Bridget woke early on Sunday morning, unable to sleep with the summer sun streaming through the curtains and the tweeting of birds right outside her window. Her head thumped, reminding her of the bottle of wine she had rashly finished off, and her stomach growled, raising doubts about whether the chicken tikka masala had been a wise choice after all. But mostly it was the new case on her mind that had given her such a restless night and then woken her at the crack of dawn. Standing in the shower, she tried to work out what was bothering her the most. She decided it was the cold-blooded ruthlessness with which the killing had been carried out. It couldn't simply be a random attack or a case of road rage. The murder showed every sign of being meticulously planned. There had to be a good reason why someone had targeted a young and, from what she'd seen of his lifestyle on the canal, impoverished artist. Who and what had Gabriel become entangled with? Over breakfast, a quick slice of toast with a low-calorie spread that really didn't compare with the acacia honey she craved. She thought about calling Chloe to see how she was getting on, but then realised it was far too early for her teenage daughter to be up and about. Anyway, she'd be collecting her this evening from the station, assuming Ben got her to Paddington on time. She'd find out all about the trip then. She considered texting Jonathan instead, but what would she say? Hope you enjoyed the opera last night? No, he deserved better than that. She'd give it more thought later. Right now, she needed to concentrate on the case. She drove to the office, hoping that one of her team would have come up with an idea overnight. She could use some fresh inspiration. Morning, Mum, said the desk sergeant as she entered the building. I was told to pass this on to you. He handed her a report. What's this? That car involved in the shooting yesterday morning. It's been found torched in a farmer's field near Abingdon. Terrific, said Bridget, pulling her face. There goes all our forensic data up in flames. I don't suppose the farmer saw anything useful? It happened overnight, early hours of the morning. No one was around. Of course. She hoped this wasn't a sign of how the rest of the day was going to go, Arriving at her desk, she swallowed a couple of paracetamol to quench her mounting headache. When everyone was in, she called the team together for a briefing. Jake sat slumped in his chair, breakfasting on a chocolate bar. Ryan and Andy were rubbing at bloodshot eyes, looking just as hungover as Bridget felt. Only Fionn seemed to be wide awake and alert, drinking a herbal concoction from her mug with the Welsh dragon on it. Right, said Bridget, let's go over what we've got. She stood in front of the incident room notice board, which so far was looking decidedly sparse. Gabriel Quinn, age 26, an artist, was shot from a passing car yesterday morning at approximately 10.15. He had just come from Wright's Art Gallery on the High Street, where a number of his paintings are up for sale with a group of artists, all former students of the Ruskin School of Art. We don't know where he was going when he left the gallery, but witnesses say it looked as if he was about to turn right into Turl Street just before he was shot. Fionn raised a hand. There's an art supply shop on Broad Street, near the other end of Turl Street. They sell paints, brushes, canvases, that sort of thing. He might have been going there. That's a possibility, acknowledged Bridget. 
grateful that at least one member of her team was alert and coming up with ideas. Now, the vehicle used by the killer was a black Toyota hire car, but we've established that the driver used a false ID. Jake squirmed in his seat and his ears turned pink. And I've just received a report that the car has been found torched in a farmer's field. It's looking more and more like a professional hit job, said Ryan. Organised crime, if you ask me. Maybe, said Bridget. The idea of the streets of Oxford being overrun by gangs of organised criminals was a terrifying prospect. The only clue we have so far is the number that Gabriel uttered before he died. Have we made any progress on that? Again, it was Fion who spoke up. I've been working on it. There are several types of registration numbers or ID numbers that have eight digits, but the letter L at the start rules most of them out. It might be a bank account with the letter L referring to the name of the bank. I can only think of one bank beginning with L, said Jake, cramming the last of the chocolate into his mouth. Lloyd's. That's the most obvious one, of course, said Fion, her green eyes twinkling. But there's also the Bank of London and the Middle East, and if you include building societies, there's Leeds, Leek, Loughborough, Leicester, London, and Lambeth. She ticked the names off on her long fingers. Jake seemed to shrink with each name she listed. Yeah, everyone knew that, said Ryan drolly. Apart from Jake. I've already submitted disclosure requests to all the banks on my list, said Fionn, ignoring Ryan's witticism. Excellent, said Bridget, who couldn't fault Fionn for her efficiency. While you're waiting to hear back from the banks, maybe you can go through Gabriel's phone and laptop. Will do, said Fionn brightly. Bridget turned to Ryan and Andy. Can you two try and find out the identity of this mysterious driver? Ryan, check out traffic cameras along the roads between Oxford and Abingdon. Andy, I'd like you to liaise with other police forces and look for recent cases that follow a similar pattern. Yes, ma'am, said Ryan without much enthusiasm. He probably knew it was a job unlikely to yield results. But still they had to try. And Jake, said Bridget, turning to her sergeant, come with me to the Ruskin School of Art. I've arranged to go and see Dr. Melissa Price, Gabriel's former tutor. I'm hoping she can shed some light on his character and who he had dealings with. Jake jumped to his feet, scrunching up his chocolate bar wrapper. He looked pleased to be getting out of the office. The Ruskin School of Art was a small stone building on the high street finished in the neo-Gothic 19th century style. It stood next to the university's examination schools, where Bridget had sat her history finals more years ago now than she cared to remember. She could never walk past the grandiose building without recalling that frantic, stressful time, the culmination of three years' hard work. Her entire degree had rested on her performance in those gruelling examinations. None of the exams she'd sat in the police force compared in any way to Oxford finals. Dr. Melissa Price met them in the entrance hall. In her early fifties and with almond-shaped eyes, Gabriel's former art tutor cut a striking figure, due in large part to the colourful caftan dress which billowed as she walked, the chunky bead necklace that hung around her long neck, and the African-style wooden bracelets that adorned her arms. She wore her long, silvery-grey hair loose. Going grey gracefully was supposed to be liberating and on trend, according to an article Bridget had read in a women's magazine the last time she'd visited the hairdressers. Bridget remained unconvinced. Why go grey when you could pursue a comforting lie with a little help from your stylist? Still, she had to admit, the fashion suited Melissa Price well enough. Thank you for agreeing to meet us, Dr. Price. Bridget held out her hand. Not at all and please call me Melissa. She took Bridget's hand in her long, slim fingers with a studied casualness, and Bridget had the sense that the art tutor's bohemianism was carefully crafted, as if she knew the precise image she wanted to create. A living work of art. Shall we go up to my office? That would be good. Thanks. I've just come from modern art Oxford, said Melissa as they walked along the corridor, do you know it? The gallery on Pembroke Street? Yes, my recent crop of students have an exhibition there over the summer. 
It's well worth a visit. Such an impressive array of work. So much talent. Bridget got the impression that Melissa wanted to take credit for the exhibition herself. Maybe when we've completed the investigation, she said. They followed her up the stairs, past walls adorned with students' paintings and drawings, quite a lot of it challenging or disturbing in a dystopian kind of way. The work seemed notably at odds with the Victorian architecture of the building itself. The school was founded by John Ruskin, remarked Melissa. When Jake looked blank, she explained further, a Victorian art critic, and, like so many of his male contemporaries, a professional ball. He was very influential, though, in his time. He was a driving force behind the pre-Raphaelite movement. At the top of the staircase, several pieces of junk had apparently been dumped in the corridor. Be careful with that, warned Melissa, it's one of my final year student's examination pieces. Bridget was no great fan of conceptual art, and she regarded the random assortment of objects with a degree of bafflement. Jake, it seemed, was also not an admirer of the work. He struggled to suppress a snigger, and Melissa rounded on him angrily. Do you have something to say, Sergeant? She didn't wait to find out if he did. I expect you think you know what art is. Nice pictures of pretty landscapes. Well, real art should be difficult and challenging. It should open us up to new ways of thinking about ourselves and the world. Otherwise, what's the point? Bridget could see the confusion on Jake's face. As far as the pieces of junk in the corridor were concerned, she had to agree with him. What, indeed, was the point? Melissa opened a door at the end of the corridor and ushered them inside. They were greeted by a huge canvas of a female nude, dominating the centre of the room. The naked woman in the painting lay on a chaise long, one arm draped over the armrest, the other resting languidly on her hips, the direction of the fingers guiding the viewer's eyes inexorably towards the patch of hair between her legs. The doleful eyes that stared out of an alabaster face and the mane of wavy red hair that tumbled over her shoulders, revealing rounded breasts and pink nipples, reminded Bridget of Lizzie Siddle, the pre-Raphaelite model who had lain for hours in a bath of water, so that Millet could paint her as a drowned Ophelia. Lizzie had died young from an overdose of laudanum, if Bridget remembered correctly. But this painting was no pre-Raphaelite masterpiece. The paint was daubed on clumsily in dollops, and the woman's proportions all seemed wrong. Maybe that was deliberate. Or maybe not. Quite a stunner, don't you think? said Melissa. Bridget was unsure whether she was referring to the woman in the painting or to the artwork itself. Jake coughed and busied himself with taking out his notebook. What's the matter, Sergeant? asked Melissa sharply. Does the female body cause you embarrassment or disgust? You wouldn't be the first. John Ruskin himself was a pompous oaf where women were concerned. He failed to consummate his marriage because his beautiful young wife, Effie, wasn't as smooth down there. She pointed to her own crotch, as the marble statues he was familiar with. She twisted a lock of her long grey hair around a finger and studied Jake, waiting for his reaction. Jake cleared his throat and looked away his ears turning red. "'Maybe we can make a start with some questions about Gabriel,' said Bridget, rescuing Jake before his ears could turn an even brighter shade. "'Of course,' said Melissa. "'Please, take a seat.' She sat down on a stool in front of the canvas, inviting Bridget and Jake to take the sofa opposite. From here it was impossible to look at Melissa without looking at the painting behind her. Bridget wondered if she'd positioned it there deliberately to distract her audience. "'I simply can't believe what happened to Gabriel,' said Melissa. "'And in broad daylight in the middle of Oxford, too.' "'Quite,' said Bridget. "'I understand you were Gabriel's tutor here at Oxford.' "'I was indeed,' said Melissa, tossing her hair over her shoulder and crossing one leg over the other. Turquoise-painted toenails peeped out from beneath the embroidered hem of her caftan. 
The intake that year was particularly good. But even so, Gabriel caught my attention from the start. In what way? asked Bridget. Oh, you know, Melissa waved a hand in the air. He had an eye, she said enigmatically. For anything in particular? For detail. Art is all about seeing and then conveying what you see through your chosen medium. And Gabriel's medium was oil painting? Yes, but he also did drawing and engraving. He was quite old-fashioned in that respect. He wasn't interested in installation art or experimental media like video. He admired the old masters, particularly artists of the Renaissance, and wanted to learn all he could from them. If he'd been born five hundred years ago, he'd have been apprenticed to someone like Michelangelo. So he was talented? Very talented in some ways, said Melissa, crossing her legs the other way. But not particularly astute. His works were too obscure to attract a wide audience. He was too shy to promote himself effectively. I used to tell him that he needed to woo the buyers to cultivate his own image— but he was too naive to take my advice. The idea of the artist eking out an existence in a garret is a very romantic one, Inspector. But even artists have to eat and pay the bills. You didn't like him much, suggested Bridget. I was his tutor, not his friend. My job was not to like him, but to develop his potential. And yet he seemed to be making a career for himself, despite your reservations. Melissa shrugged. What about his interest in numbers? asked Bridget. Ah, yes, that was one of Gabriel's particularly unusual traits. Melissa's almond eyes narrowed with disdain. He was obsessed by concepts such as the golden ratio and the Fibonacci sequence. I assume you know what they are? Bridget acknowledged her familiarity, and felt relieved that she'd attended the lecture yesterday. Not that any of her newly acquired mathematical knowledge was helping her to crack the case. If only there were an equation for solving murders. I told him to forget all that, said Melissa. No one cares. To succeed in art, you have to be original, not revisit ideas that were explored hundreds of years ago. There was one number that was apparently very important to Gabriel, said Bridget, because he repeated it a couple of times before he died. Jake read out the mysterious eight-digit number from his notebook. Melissa shook her head. I've no idea what that could refer to. Gabriel was displaying some of his paintings at Wright's Art Gallery on the High Street, said Bridget. Do you know anything about that? "'Ah, yes, Jonathan Wright is a great supporter of our students,' said Melissa. "'Although I always tell them that they really need to be exhibiting their work in London, not Oxford.' She smiled at Bridget in a patronising way. "'Mind you, I expect that the value of Gabriel's work will soar now that he's dead. No doubt Jonathan is secretly delighted.' Bridget was about to jump to Jonathan's defence when Jake interrupted. Are you suggesting that Gabriel's death may have been motivated by financial gain? Melissa brushed her silver hair with her long fingernails. Well, who can say? That's your job to find out, isn't it? Bridget decided to change the subject. I met Gabriel's neighbour on the canal yesterday, and she mentioned a girlfriend called Amber. Do you know her by any chance? Well, yes, I do. A slow, lascivious smile spread across Melissa's face. You're looking at her, in fact. She swivelled on her stool to admire the canvas behind her. Amber Morgan is something of a muse to our artists. Bridget looked more closely at the girl depicted on the canvas. She really was quite beautiful. A stunner, as Melissa had said. Emerald eyes, huge pouting lips, and a sultry expression— but there was also something fragile about her, as if she might shatter at any moment. Did she mind taking her clothes off for classes of students? Presumably not. But what about Gabriel? How had he felt about it all? Where can we find Amber now? asked Jake. 
On a Sunday? I'm not sure, said Melissa. When she's not modelling for our life drawing classes, she sometimes works at the art supply shop on Broad Street. Do you have a contact number for her? asked Jake. Yes, I do. Melissa scrolled through the contacts on her iPhone. Here it is. She passed the phone to Jake to make a note of the number. The other artists on display at the art gallery, they were all students of yours? asked Bridget. Yes, said Melissa. A very gifted group. So much talent, you know. Do they all live in Oxford? Yes, mostly, or hereabouts. And did Gabriel have a particularly close connection to any of them? Oh, said Melissa, a faintly mocking smile playing on her lips. Gabriel didn't find it easy to make friends. He was something of a recluse. But now you mention it, Amber did have a relationship with one of the other artists in that group, Hunter Reed. The love life of these young artists and their muses really can be rather complicated. Complicated in what way? asked Bridget. I'll say no more, Inspector. Just speak to Hunter. I'm sure you'll find him interesting. It was already almost lunchtime when Bridget and Jake emerged from the Ruskin School of Art back onto the high street. Bridget wasn't sure they were any further forward, but at least they had the girlfriend's name and phone number, and knew where she worked. Bridget asked Jake to give Amber a call and see if he could interview her. Meanwhile, Bridget had family matters to attend to. There was an unwritten rule that she would always go to her sister's for Sunday lunch— but her recent workload had made her an unreliable guest. She didn't think it would hurt if she took a couple of hours off and made an appearance now, and so, ten minutes later, her tyres were crunching on the gravel driveway in front of Vanessa's house on Childbury Road in leafy North Oxford. The large Edwardian detached house behind its perfectly clipped hedges always felt reassuringly solid and permanent, especially at times like this when Bridget was conscious of how fragile human life could be. She would have loved to have Chloe here with her, and wondered again what her daughter was doing right now. It was James, her brother-in-law, who opened the door to her. He was dressed for the summer in a pair of baggy khaki shorts and a short-sleeved linen shirt. Bridget, he said, kissing her on the cheek, how lovely to see you. We hoped you'd make it this weekend. Rufus, the family's golden Labrador, bounded down the hallway to greet her, his tail wagging. Chloe, not with you? She's in London, visiting Ben, said Bridget, unable to stop herself from grimacing. Ah, I see, said James with a smile. Well, I'm sure she'll be fine. Come through to the lounge. Vanessa's just making the gravy. The house was filled with the aroma of roast lamb and rosemary. It smells lovely, said Bridget, envying her sister's culinary abilities. Vanessa prided herself on making every meal from scratch with fresh ingredients. Not for her a two-day-old takeaway, reheated in the microwave in a desperate attempt to resuscitate it. Vanessa would have been appalled if she knew the truth of what went on in Bridget's kitchen. "'Hello, Auntie Bridget,' chimed her niece and nephew as she entered the lounge, which to Bridget's eye always resembled a show home, despite the presence of two young children and a dog. Eight-year-old Florence and six-year-old Toby were sitting in front of the hearth, playing a game of guess who. Rufus flopped down beside them and rested his head on his front paws. It was a scene of domestic bliss such that Bridget herself had never known in her life with Ben and Chloe. How did Vanessa manage to achieve it? But Bridget knew the answer to that question. Hard work, relentless planning, and obsessive attention to detail— behavioural patterns that could be traced directly back to the murder of their sister, Abigail. Beneath the surface perfection of Vanessa's life lurked ugly coping mechanisms that would keep a psychiatrist occupied for a long time. "'Lunch is ready,' called Vanessa, walking into the room. "'Bridget, I'm so glad you could come.' Vanessa took her hand and drew her into an embrace. "'After dessert you'll have to tell me all about your visit to the opera.' she whispered loudly into Bridget's ear. Bridget's heart sank. Vanessa had been the one to introduce her to Jonathan, going to considerable lengths to bring them together. 
She'd be furious when she learned that Bridget had cried off because of work. Toby, Florence, go and wash your hands, then come and sit down. The children trotted off to the bathroom obediently while Bridget took her place at the dining table. The French windows of the back garden were open, letting in a heady scent of honeysuckle. James carved the joint while Vanessa passed around tureens of steamed vegetables and roast potatoes. Bridget poured a generous portion of gravy over her meat and tucked in. She wished she could eat this sort of food every day, but her job just didn't allow it, and nor would her waistline. Regretfully, she declined the offer of wine, knowing that she'd have to get back to the office just as soon as she could politely leave. "'Isn't Chloe coming?' asked Florence, looking expectantly at Bridget. The two young children doted on their older cousin. "'Not today,' said Bridget. "'She's in London visiting her dad.' "'And his girlfriend?' asked Vanessa in a hushed voice. She never missed an opportunity to dig for gossip about the fabled Tamsin. "'I expect so,' said Bridget curtly. "'And you said she's what? Ten years younger than you?' Vanessa couldn't hide the incredulity in her voice. "'More potatoes, anyone?' asked James, jumping to his feet and picking up the tureen of perfectly roasted spuds. "'Me! Me!' chimed the children. Bridget gave her brother-in-law a grateful smile for changing the conversation. Over dessert of homemade apple crumble and custard, the conversation turned to the children's achievements in school. Toby had won an award for writing a story about an anteater, and Florence had just passed her grade one piano with distinction. And James's business, which, according to Vanessa, was on the brink of closing a big deal with another Oxford-based company. It's about to go through any day now she said, her voice brimming with pride. It will be a big step up for James. Bridget congratulated him, wondering privately just how much further up the ladder James needed to climb. He already seemed very rich and successful to her. Don't get too excited, said James, taking a sip of his wine. The deal's not done until it's signed. And which company is the deal with? asked Bridget politely. Sorry, can't say anything more just yet said James, tapping his nose and giving her a wink. Confidentiality. You know how it is. After the meal, when the children had been excused to go and play in the garden and James was in the kitchen making coffee, Vanessa leaned across the table. So, tell me all about your date. How was it? I want to know everything. Did you invite him back to your place afterwards? Bridget groaned inwardly, but it was impossible to avoid the inevitable. I had to cancel at the last minute. I'm working on a new case. Vanessa's face fell. Oh, Bridget, what are we going to do with you? I know, I'm hopeless. Chloe keeps telling me the same thing. But you'll never find a man if you keep letting work get in the way. I do try, but something urgent came up. Did you hear about the shooting on the high street? Don't tell me you're involved in that said Vanessa, wrinkling her nose in distaste, as if Bridget were responsible for committing the crime, rather than investigating it. "'Involved in what?' asked James, reappearing with three coffees on a tray. "'The high street shooting,' said Bridget. "'And yes, I am involved. I'm in charge of the investigation.' "'Congratulations,' said James, passing round the coffee cups. "'So any leads yet?' Not many, admitted Bridget. All we really know so far is that the victim was an artist. Some of his paintings are for sale in Jonathan's gallery at the moment, as it happens. Jonathan? asked Vanessa, her eyes wide. You don't think this has anything to do with him, do you? No, of course not, said Bridget. And yet Vanessa was the second person that day to mention Jonathan in relation to Gabriel's murder. Dr. Melissa Price had implied that Jonathan stood to gain financially from the artist's death. The thought made her distinctly uncomfortable. She was glad when the conversation turned again to safer topics. When her sister wasn't lecturing her about her love life, she could be very good company, and Bridget would happily have whiled away the rest of the afternoon chatting to Vanessa and James and watching the children play. After consuming such a large lunch, she would have been glad to catch up with a little sleep in the dappled shade of the huge magnolia tree in the garden, too. But she couldn't abandon her team any longer. 
she made her excuses. But you can't go already, scolded Vanessa. Sorry, work, said Bridget. On a Sunday? Well, just promise me that you'll get back in touch with Jonathan. Tantor Audio, a division of recorded books, presents Do No Evil, an Oxford murder mystery, by M. S. Morris. Narrated by Esther Wayne. 1. Her footsteps rang sharply against the flagstone floor of the antechapel. As Alexia Petrakis crossed the south transept, she felt the chill that emanated from the old stone building, even though August had only just passed. The daughter of a Greek father and an Italian mother, Mediterranean blood ran hot in Alexia's veins, and she favoured sunny climates over the typical British fare of damp summers, drizzly autumns, and cold, wet winters. The chapel air was cool and musty, and she pulled her cashmere cardigan tight across her chest and hugged her upper arms. Pausing in the centre of the antechapel, she tilted her head up to gaze at the empty space above her. The Belfry Tower. Whatever Oxford might lack in decent weather, it more than made up for with its buildings. Towers, spires, battlements, domes, quadrangles, gargoyles. The architectural flights of fancy made the university an inspiring place to live and study. Walking around the city yesterday, she'd noticed some new buildings that had appeared since her undergraduate days. The Mathematical Institute, the Blavatnik School of Government, the Jesus College Development on Corn Market. But here at Merton College, one of the university's oldest colleges, little, if anything, had changed in the twenty years since she'd matriculated, seventeen since she'd graduated. For a college that had stood for over seven hundred and fifty years, twenty years was merely the blink of an eye. But for Alexia it had been a long time. Armed with a degree in English language and literature, first class, from Oxford, she'd completed a postgraduate course in journalism at Goldsmiths University in London, coming top of her class. She'd quickly got her foot on the first rung of the ladder as a reporter on the London Evening Standard— but she'd always aspired to loftier goals. By dint of long working hours and a tenacious grip on every story that came her way, she was soon freelancing for national papers, uncovering stories of corruption in the corporate world, miscarriages of justice in the legal profession, and scandals in political life. She quickly gained a reputation as a crusader, a defender of the truth, someone who would stand up for the public good. But now she had a story to tell that would rock the centuries-old foundations of the institution in which she was currently standing. That was why she had taken the unusual step, for her, of seeking advice before she went ahead with publication. By nature she was impulsive and even reckless, not given to self-doubt. But for once in her life she was filled with uncertainty. Could she do it? And if so, why would she? to assuage her own guilt, of course, to do now what she should have done so many years ago, and yet the repercussions would be like an earthquake for everyone involved, including herself. It was at times like these that she mourned the loss of her own Catholic upbringing and the comfort given by the rite of confession. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. To be absolved by the priest and to leave the confessional free of the burden of sin was a luxury too good to be true. She didn't believe in it any more. Alexia knew that there was only one way to put right past wrongs, and that was through action. And for a journalist, action meant exposing the truth for the world to see. The pen is mightier than the sword. But before she wielded her pen once more in the service of truth, she deemed it prudent to consult. The college chaplain had agreed to meet her at half-past three in the chapel. She had arrived early, still unsure what she was going to say to him. She needed more time to collect her thoughts and to work through her feelings. She turned pensively into the choir and walked up to the altar alongside images of apostles and evangelists. The choir was the oldest part of the chapel, dating back seven centuries, and stood on the foundations of an even older church. 
Alexia was soothed by the deep sense of connection with the past. It helped to put her own problems in perspective. Autumnal light filtered through the stained glass of the huge Gothic window that filled the eastern wall. Muted in comparison to the elaborate gilt churches of her Greek and Italian heritage, the chapel was still breathtaking in its quiet beauty. The door to the sacristy was closed, so she supposed that the chaplain hadn't yet arrived. She turned and headed back down the aisle towards the gleaming pipes of the Dobson organ, which sat in silent contemplation. No doubt those pipes would be brought to thunderous life later in the day as part of the evening's celebrations. As she browsed the plaques and statuary in the north transept of the antechapel, the door in the south transept opened and closed. She turned and saw a figure enter and advance towards her across the flagstone floor. Once again the great chamber echoed with the sound of footsteps. "'It's been a long time,' she said to the new arrival. But her visitor did not speak in reply. Instead, strong hands gripped her shoulders and a cold wire looped about her neck. Caught off guard by the swiftness of the attack, Alexia had no time to struggle before the wire was drawn tight and she was gasping for breath. She sank to her knees and her vision began to blur. Just before she finally blacked out, a familiar voice whispered in her ear, See no evil. 2. The wheels of the suitcase bounced wildly over the cobbles of Merton Street, as Detective Inspector Bridget Hart hurried on her way. Having left her bright red mini-convertible parked at home in Wolvercote, and caught the bus into central Oxford, she was now running late for registration to the college Gordy. A Gordy what? Her teenage daughter Chloe had asked when informed that Bridget would be spending Saturday night at her old Oxford college. Are you going to wear something outrageous? Chloe's eyes glinted with good-natured mischief. Not gaudy as in showy or tasteless, Bridget explained to her. It's a noun, from the Latin gaudere, meaning to rejoice. It's a reunion dinner for everyone who joined the college twenty years ago. You mean it's a piss-up for middle-aged people? Language? In truth, Chloe wasn't far wrong. Formal dinners at Oxford colleges invariably involved copious amounts of wine, followed by more drinking down the college bar. The evening would probably end up being gaudy in both senses of the word. The wheels of the suitcase finally jammed to a halt in a gap between two particularly troublesome cobblestones, almost causing Bridget's arm to be yanked off. In frustration, she picked the case up by the handle and lugged it the final twenty yards to the college gate. The case, though small, was surprisingly heavy. Rather like Bridget herself, in fact, despite her desperate attempts to shed a few pounds in preparation for the dinner. Unsure of what to wear for the occasion, she'd lost her nerve at the last minute and bundled in several extra outfits, which was one of the reasons she'd been late catching the bus. That, and the fact that she'd spent the morning writing up a report for her ever-demanding boss, Chief Superintendent Alex Grayson. But now she was taking the rest of the weekend off, and Thames Valley Police would have to manage without her. Detective Sergeant Jake Derwent and Detective Constable Fionn Hughes were more than capable of dealing with anything that came in. As for Chloe, she was only too happy to spend the night in London with her dad, Ben, and his girlfriend, Tamsin. Perhaps the youthful and gorgeous Tamsin would give Chloe some more of her cool fashion advice, something which Bridget was incapable of providing. A feeling of irrational jealousy always crept up on her whenever she thought of Chloe spending time with Ben and Tamsin. Although, wait, there was nothing irrational about it. Any reasonable middle-aged divorcee would feel exactly the same as she did about her ex-husband's latest girlfriend, especially when her own daughter had taken so quickly to Bridget's newer and younger replacement. Meanwhile, her own love life had barely got off the ground. Her sister Vanessa had recently introduced her to Jonathan Wright, the owner of a contemporary art gallery in Oxford, but her police work had repeatedly thrown up roadblocks in their budding relationship. They had at last managed to go out to dinner together on a proper date, but now any hopes of romance were on ice, after a serious injury that had required Jonathan to have abdominal surgery at the Royal Brompton Hospital in London, followed by time spent convalescing at home. 
Bridget felt terrible about the incident, which had been partly her fault. She'd offered to spend the weekend looking after him, but he wouldn't hear of it. Instead, Jonathan had given her strict instructions to go to the Gordy and enjoy herself. Have some fun, he told her. Just try not to discover any skeletons hiding in the closets. So here she was, back at Merton College, where she'd spent three years studying for her degree in history. It was twenty years since she'd first joined the college, and it was hard to believe so much time had passed. Her undergraduate years had been a blissful time, cruelly marred by the family tragedy that had occurred straight after her final examinations, and which still cast a long shadow. Was that the reason she'd never been back, until now? Stepping into the lodge, she was instantly transported back to the first time she'd arrived for her interview as a naive seventeen-year-old. She remembered the eagerness of wanting